there's been any updated um, estimations on the cost of the, the capital improvement project? We'll go to the county administrator. So with respect to the convention center, some of the projects that you saw had uh, more recent uh, uh, estimates. With respect to the convention center, uh, we uh, have not uh, done a definitive uh, estimate on the cost. Uh, that would certainly, uh, we can be prepared to, uh, with that at the time the board begins to have their discussions as well. Uh, we, we have some uh, idea based upon um, cost from cost estimators, uh, what that may be, looking at various um, uh, materials and escalators and so forth, and we can apply that, will apply that at the uh, appropriate time. But we did not include that. We did not take that extra step as part of this process. We wanted to simply stay with the concept to see uh, what the uh, uh, interest may be. Okay. I guess that, but my, I think my difficulty and what I'm trying to grapple with is that there was, as part of the evaluation, a requirement to look at return on investment. And I think to know what a return on investment is, we would have to know what the <laughs> cost does. So how did, how are they able to even, with any confidence, make that a, a priority project? Well, we have an order of magnitude. We know what the cost. We actually had, had documents in, in place. So we had an estimate, that, not an estimate. We actually had work that had proceeded prior to the pandemic, and in fact, the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, but I think what the uh, emphasis was in that presentation uh, was also on uh, what the expected economic benefit would be, what the, uh, the, uh, the attendance, what that, what that generates, what that means to have delegates that come. Uh, and so we have, there's an order of magnitude that we are, are dealing with at this level. And there, there was, thank you, there was a lot of um, discussion about having an independent financial audit, an independent financial analysis of that return of investment. And I know that we spoke, we, had, we heard from somebody from UCF and hospitality, and we also heard from some of the members of the task force about the possibility. And I, I would say that, and I know that we're looking at a report right now, and that there's been sort of this idea, well, we're talking about the report, but I think we need to know sort of the contents a little better of the recommendation to advance the report. And, you know, whether or not there has been any discussion about getting an independent, um, <clears throat> an independent financial analysis of that return on investment specifically for the convention center, knowing that it it seems to be the one that feels the, to me with the most questions still unanswered. I think there was a lot of information that we were able to get about um, some of the other projects that I didn't feel like we were able to wrap our, our hands around for the convention center. So I was wondering if there was some possibility of doing that independent financial analysis. Okay, uh, so let me just kind of speak to it. In, in terms of process, the goal was to get citizen input. Uh, through uh, citizen volunteers from the Tourist Development Task Force. They uh, have provided the input. They had uh, hours of meetings and presentations, and I believe that the process worked uh, in terms of getting uh, a feel from our community about what some of the priorities were. That group was a very diverse group of individuals. Uh, some of them uh, represented labor, and uh, from the AFL-CIO to others that really represent uh, tens of thousands of workers here within uh, our community. And so while you didn't have 10,000 workers from uh, labor here, you had uh, their elected representative uh, that sat. In fact, you had a couple of them uh, on that participated in the process. And sometimes there was, the, I think, the duality of uh, arguments that was made about low-wage workers. We heard from one of the uh, representatives from the AFL-CIO that said that, listen, it sounded to me like he was supporting uh, the expansion of the convention center because he said the quality of the jobs uh, that uh, his uh, union membership represents uh, provided uh, uh, high wages, if you will, and benefits yeah. yes. and all of that. And so I think that we're not trying to put the cart before the horse. Uh, the process involved the Tourist Development Task Force presenting, doing their research, and then presenting something to the Board of County Commission. Ultimately, it is us who has to make the final decision. And on August the 22nd, uh, th this process today is simply uh, to uh, affirm that we heard, we opened the process up for our citizens, they made some recommendations, and we are receiving 
those recommendations. It is not to make any decisions today about uh, how we're going to expend the dollars, uh, what we will change in terms of any types of forms or processes. That will come, uh, I believe, on the 22nd, given the, what we hear to, today through this process. We will come back with much more detail in a workshop, and it is important that if there are any budgetary implications uh, for the upcoming fiscal year, we, we don't have a whole lot of time, Commissioner, uh, in order to uh, make budgetary decisions and, uh, and the like. So consequently, uh, we, have to, we have a definitive period of time that we have to move forward with, with uh, the best information that we have. So let's continue the conversation. Let's continue the dialogue. You're not going to have all of your answers at this meeting. But if there are questions that you might have where you need more information by which to make the decisions, make that known today. Right. And then the staff will work uh, to get the, the granular information. That's what we're trying to do today. Well, and I, I would say that in that nails sort of that, you know, that, that exactly is what I'm looking for is maybe some opportunity for that concern that I have, right, about that return on investment in particular. Because I think some of the other options in that top tier did have very clear evidence of return on investments. But I, okay, so then moving on to like another part of the um, question I had was because this was part of the task force was seeing their comments and I really appreciated the, the level of time and, and attention they took giving their comments was that the rubric itself didn't feel appropriate for what they were working on because they were told this isn't a grant, this isn't a grant, but it really looked like a grant application and that when the discussion pivoted to something that wasn't really narrowly part of that rubric, they were redirected back. So now we did get to see those comments and I think they're really important. But I guess my question is now moving forward, will we have an opportunity to address some of the things that came forward in the process? In the process where they said we, you know, we didn't have the opportunity to score this or to, to evaluate this the way we felt like was, was appropriate? The short answer is yes. Okay. That's within the wheelhouse of the Board of County Commission to make those kind of decisions. That wasn't within the wheelhouse of the task force to make those decisions. Uh, mm -hmm. They are providing the information to us. We, uh, collectively as a board, now have to make decisions about how we, if we redefine some things, uh, what have you, that's up to us to make. And that I believe that when we get to August 22nd, uh, that's where uh, between now and then, uh, those things that are important to you about modifying what we have done within the past, et cetera, that's where we have the opportunity to modify any things or clarify. And sometimes it's just a matter of interpretation uh, where we don't really have to modify our ordinances or what have you. We, it's just a, an interpretation that uh, we have to modify consistent with the current law. Uh, we have significant dollars that are sitting uh, in reserves and that makes us very, very vulnerable. Of course, the last uh, legislative session, uh, the legislature took up uh, a debate on the floor regarding the potential for uh, low taking uh, money from uh, large urban counties, i.e. Orange County, and redistributing those dollars to other rural counties. So keep that in mind that uh, as much as anything, we have a timing issue. There's an upcoming legislative session. It's, it's going to be upon us in January, uh, so it's ahead of schedule from, from last year. So we need to make certain that we maintain the control that we can control at a local level for how we're going to expend things. I think that uh, yes, it's a great conversation about expanding the tourist uh, impact uh, tax uh, and all of that, but as it relates to the tourist development tax, uh, we have to make certain that not only do we look to the future, but we protect what we already have. And that is a strategy that I think that our board needs to understand, okay, and not indirectly make ourselves more vulnerable because if we uh, see um, uh, from the leadership in Tallahassee a desire to redistribute a, a portion of the funds that we already are receiving, then that means that's less money available to do those things that you talked about. 
Uh, today, this um, press conference that we had outside, in which um, the NFL Pro Bowl is coming here in just a few months, uh, if you look at Camping World Stadium, while part of the narrative would be about do we uh, invest in expanding uh, Camp, Camping World Stadium or doing other investments, Camping World Stadium has served as an anchor for that entire community over there uh, and uh, from just poor people. I, I know because I lived there, okay, and I'm, I'm able to sit where I am today because of all of those investments from youth sports and other things that happen there. But if you go and you look in terms of the community benefits, sometimes what we invest in with the tourist development tax dollars uh, does result in other community benefits. Uh, the transformation of quality affordable housing, uh, a boys and girls club being built there within that community, and uh, other job opportunities that have been created uh, I believe that had it not been for Camping World Stadium being located where it was, you likely would not see what has uh, happened in that particular community. So when we have the conversation about the investment in uh, various things, I think it has to be a full conversation about what are the community benefits, uh, even with the investment in the Amway, the new Amway Center. Uh, there was conversation uh, back then about uh, what were the billionaire investors going to be doing uh, to help uh, improve our community and the quality of life here. Well, through a negotiated process, we ended up with uh, the magic gyms that are around the county, which, of course, we are programming. They became, uh, you know, our county assets. So it's those types of, I think, broader conversations that you have to have when you're talking about the investment of these dollars. And quite frankly, I don't think we've done a good job of capturing uh, all of those types of benefits as a community, but that's what you're speaking to. I think you we're saying the sure. same thing. Y yeah, I know we are. And that's <laughs> why I'm just speaking out loud yeah. to you so you understand yeah. and the I process. And I think also, Mayor, I want to say that I think um, – it's important that we distinguish for people who are watching this, and I think about the people who spoke today at the, at the podium about their jobs at the convention center. Their operating budget was already passed. We, we're, we've, already, we've already approved. It's going into the regular budget season. We, we, we will continue to invest in that convention center. So I think that there's not the, you know, we have to make sure that's a very distinct conversation from breaking ground on a new building project because I think that there was definitely an interpretation from the public well, we're, we're about not there. Their... We're not okay. there yet, okay. Commissioner. Uh, the, the, this, this is about <clears throat> simply having them present the recommendations. But, it, but I think we are accept. if we heard from people that are interpreting this decision making as potentially well, being the beginning or end I'm of a job. Well, that's I'm talking to that now so okay. everyone understands the process. Okay. Uh, that, that's why I'm taking, going through great lengths to respond to your question. So uh, I'm not just talking to uh, the board, but I'm talking to our entire community. Today isn't the decision-making day about how we're going to spend dollars or not spend dollars. That comes uh, in the future. This is about receiving the report and saying thank you to those people who took uh, their time to, to work on it on our behalf and give us the input. It may not be perfect. It may not be perfect what, what we resulted with, but uh, I still believe that it is relevant. Oh, I agree. I think it's been a tremendous effort, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. What I'm saying is my concern is if we're asked um, to accept the report, is that then interpreted as an acceptance and endorsement of the recommendations? Because if that happens, that's, that's, that's a very different doing. thinking. Accepting a report, I've, I read things all the time that I, I think are fundamentally flawed, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to hold them on my desk and analyze them and use them as a, as a they're, primary resource. They're only recommendations. It's like reading a book. You don't have to commit to say, well, I believe it. Whenever you read a book in academia, you don't agree with everything that's in it. You no, just, but I'm not being asked to vote we're, for that. We're just, we're, just at, we're just receiving the report. That's all we're trying to do today. No, no, I... I Okay. It's not complicated. <laughs> I, I understand. Don't, let's not complicate it. I think, I think you're complicating what we're trying to do today. I think you're minimizing being asked to I, vote on something I, that will go on the record as being an endorsement of an evaluation that has been scored and graded. We didn't say that. There's no language that says we endorse 
uh, anything. Okay, we're then just this is just a discussion and we're not having to vote at the end. Is that correct? We're going to have to vote to accept the report. We're, unless you want to say, if you don't want to vote for it, then you don't have to vote for it. I, I appreciate that. Uh, but the goal is to say we're just receiving the this is information. It's only recommendations. That's all you're saying that you're, you're voting to do is receive information. No, and I appreciate that. I think I want to make sure that we, uh, understanding <laughs> the outcome of a public vote, though. So is, don't complicate it, Commissioner. Okay. I, you, you're complicating it. Okay. I, thank you for allowing me to ask those questions. I appreciate the time of the task force and the co-chairs and all the staff that worked on it. Okay. All right. Commissioner gomez Cadero. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I have three questions. I'm going to ask them all, and then whoever, you know, I'm very simple, straight to the point, okay? Okay. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to go um, by what Commissioner Wilson also asked, um, how will we know what the return investment will be? And this is only, you know, in order to know how much we, we have on the funds to, to spend. That's one question. The second one, there was an organization this morning that came, and they were requesting funds. I don't see them in the, in the list of the 52, but it brought my attention because it's veteran and they're gonna be, um, you know, the services that they provide is for mental health, for PTSD, for suicidal, depression, and all of that. And, you know, so maybe if they don't receive it here, can maybe they receive it with other funds that we have that are coming, you know, to mental health. So if they have a chance or not, I just want to know, and then um, we we will be having a workshop in August 22. Is the workshop only limited to the four recommendations, or that's you know we're going to discuss that? But we can discuss other topics. Those are my three questions. So, Commissioner, I can address the organization that showed up this morning. If you choose to put money into ARC application <coughs> review committee grants, they could apply for that grant. But right now there's no funding in that program because it relies on excess revenues and it has to be funded by the Board of County Commissioners. It's not funded automatically. Um, depending on how much they're requesting, if they're under 500,000, they would go to arts and cultural fair grants. If they're over 2 million, they would go to ARC. So they will have an opportunity to apply for funding. Okay. Thank you, Rosanne. And what about the workshop? It's not limited to the recommendation only? Oh, and then the purpose of the work session, the mayor wanted to now begin to provide for this board the financial. So a good portion of this will be talking about capacity. Uh, we'll be working very closely with the comptroller's office on this uh, because that's really, um, get down to it, it's about how much money do you have uh, as part of this discussion. And so... Uh, a lot of that next meeting will, uh, quite frankly, uh, give you all, the board, the opportunity to see uh, what's the capacity, how much, uh, based upon, and we'll, we'll uh, be working from a model, uh, based upon some of the decisions. So as you move more into ARC, if you move more into arts and cultural affairs, uh, we look at the, the, uh, the projections, uh, the estimates uh, or projection uh, of revenue going forward. Uh, we'll, uh, Fred Wintercamp will talk some about uh, from our financial advisor, uh, what are some assumptions you can make, and then you begin to understand the capacity. Uh, as the mayor said, it then becomes up, it's really the board's decision on how far you want to stress those dollars uh, in terms of projects. So it's going to be a, a bit focused more so on the financial side of the equation, uh, since that was the purview or is the purview of the board. Thank you, Byron. I want to say thank you to all the the staff, the volunteers, and, you know, all of you that, that worked through all this um, term for to bring this information. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Commissioner Bonilla. All right. So I do have some handouts. While she's doing that, can I just thank Commissioner Cordero real quick for asking about that, that group? Thank you for bringing that up. It was on my list, and I think I just got flustered about my time. Thank you.
All right, so I kind of feel like we're being rushed through this, so I will make this quick. I'm not going to read this entire, these entire handouts here. Um, I'm just going to go through some of the highlights. So I did ask what was the process for us county commissioners to ask for, for a project or some funding, and I was told that this was the time. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, but I do have some comments on some of the stuff that was already done. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to all the volunteers as well. Um, I, I mean, some of you had pushed and pushed and worked so hard to get the conversation moving forward and discussing other options. So I definitely want to thank all of you for doing that. I, I could tell you I've been in that place. It's not really easy to do. So being able to get uncomfortable and say the things that not a lot of people are willing to say is commendable. So thank you for all the work that you did. Um, so on the visit Orlando is the first thing I want to talk about. The deadline for a renewal of the contract for another year is coming up soon. So I think this is a conversation we really should have and look at. So if you haven't looked at that contract with Visit Orlando, I highly suggest that you do. Um, so the TDC revenues for Visit Orlando, you know, it raises awareness and drives tourism. And I recognize that significance of investing that those funds. But we also need to look at how the well-being of our local economies beyond the theme park corridors. And I don't want to say that they haven't looked at that. I know um, we've definitely in the last couple of years has pushed Visit Orlando to market some of our ecotourism, for example, and different things in our local communities. So I, I do want to make sure I um, present that as well and not say that they don't do it. However, more can be done. Um, you look at some of the advertising, um, unbelievably real. It's, you know, the majority of it is, you know, still at the theme parks and Disney and stuff. Um, so Visit Orlando currently gets 30% of the TDT revenues. Um, and while paying the percentage has increased our contribution in alignment with revenue growth, we must be mindful of the concept of market saturation. Market saturation refers to a point where despite increasing investments, we may not witness a proportional increase in returns on our investment. Therefore, it is prudent to consider a cap on our contributions based on the point of market saturation, where additional funds might not yield the desired outcomes. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say if we look at some of our TDT revenues, that could be a sign that we perhaps have met some market saturation. Um, I could provide more information on that to the board if they have any questions what that really means. But basically, you know, we could spend money on advertising and spend and spend and spend, but there's going to be a point where we're not going to get the same amount of return on investment because you can only market so much and get the you're just going to keep getting the same return, and then you'll see things start leveling off. Um, so it's very, it's very dangerous that we're giving funds based on percentage rather than a dollar amount because the percentage can go up and up and up, but a dollar amount is really indicative <coughs> of what that market saturation number really is and that break-even number. Um, so, again, that contract is coming up, so I really feel that we should look at that soon before that deadline happens. Um, sports. So, look, I, I, I don't really watch sports, but I'm still a fan of it, which is a really weird place to be. Um, and, you know, I really like the, the sports coming to Orange County. Um, I'm going to just put this out here. We have these facilities. So I really think like what well, having the Pro Bowl come, I think it's a good idea. Let's use the facilities that we have. Now I was at the National Association of Counties this week and I'm part of the large urban county caucus and they had someone who was going to speak on a presentation on public funding for sports arenas and stadiums. And I thought this person was going to say all these great things about how we should invest in this. It went in the opposite direction, which I was completely unprepared for. Um, so he's an economist, Andrew Zimbalist, and he provided many downfalls of public funding allocations to sports teams bigger, for bigger arenas and stadiums. Um, he said the proposals brought on by the, you know, that's, there's drawbacks to allocating <coughs> even TDT funds to these bigger arenas and stadiums. Some of the drawbacks, um, he didn't mention gentrification, um, limited economic impact, limited employment opportunities, um, diversion of spending. So they're spending higher, there's high 
ticket pricing and costly concessions at the stadiums. And we all know how much it costs for like a, just a, a drink at one of these stadiums, um, never mind the ticket prices. But families, you know, they don't have a lot of money. They're spending a lot of money. And if they do go, they're spending a lot of money there. And they're not really putting that money into the local businesses around the stadium that they say, you know, it attracts. So that's happening. Um, the distri distribution of spending. So a lot of this money is going to the players and executives and who they're high earning individuals subject to higher tax rates. So what this means is that a considerable portion of the funds circulates back out to the federal government. It may not have a substantial direct <coughs> impact on the local economy. Um, so, you know, we have money that's leaving the area rather than staying here, the majority of it. Um, player residences, and, you know, so also the players, you know, they have homes outside of the, lo the host cities. So that's another thing. So the money is leaving the area, you know, because they don't live here. Um, so, you know, consider considering these points, um, that we definitely have to look at the risk of putting our dollars into, you know, making bigger and bigger stadiums and um, arenas. Now, the convention center. So, you know, when this first came up, um, or like under the previous board, um, you know, I wasn't really supportive of the expansion, but I went ahead with it anyway. Um, it looked really nice. <laughs> but, you know, when I started digging deeper, di deeper and deeper into it, and I mean, the surveys were amazing because I got to see some of these comments that were, that were placed in there. And there was someone who was very insightful, ha asked great questions about the convention center. So I, I dug more into that. Um, so I did ask a lot of questions of staff. Um, unfortunately, you know, the data provided falls short on various crucial points, which raises concerns about its status as a primary economic driver for Orange County. Um, we, you know, there's, it's always saying that we're competing against the other convention centers nationwide. However, that's not the only competitors we have. Across Orange County, there are lots of hotel convention spaces that are, they're beautiful, they're large, they're attracting a lot of um, conventions and events. And so they're bringing a lot of tourism to Orange County. Um, the convention center wasn't always there. So it's, you know, I, I always want to laugh when they say, you know, that the, our tourism industry is dependent on the convention center because the convention center came after, not before. Um, so I would say actually the convention center is dependent on Disney, not the other way around. Um, and, you know, the iDrive corridor, I mean, it's, it's suffered for a very long time and the convention center was there. Um, what actually turned around iDrive was the businesses there, not the convention center. It was the local businesses there who brought in great restaurants and entertainment and reasons for people to want to go to our convention center. Because people don't want to go to a convention center if there isn't something around there that they're also going to be attracted <clears throat> to. They have to have good transit systems. Um, they have to have good restaurants. And, I mean, quite frankly, be, you know, and... Back in the day, I mean, the, the restaurants did not have good food. <laughs> now we have better restaurants there with better food. Um, Orange County, I think that's one of the good directions we're going in when it comes to tourism is the foodie <clears throat> tourism. You know, making sure we have better restaurants. And I think that's really putting us on the map and getting us more tourism, which is a great idea. Um, but, you know, the Orange County Convention Center, I think, depends more on outside so sources than the outside source is really depending on the convention center. Um, so, you know, that's some of my comments on that and something that I feel that we really need to look at. Um, I've asked questions, asked for data. Um, Mark Tester was, you know, gave me the data he could give me. Visit Orlando was supposed to give me the other data. Have not heard from them. Um, so I am looking forward to getting a lot of those questions answered. So your next um, stapled packet is Arts and Economic Prosperity 5 and the Creative Industries in Orange County, Florida Study for American for the Arts. Um, you can see in here, and this one's very um, interesting. If you look at this one right here with the, the picture of Orange <coughs> County, you can see the concentration of where all of the, the businesses are. And you can see there's a lack of 
businesses outside that corridor there. Um, and I will say, yes, a lot of this is in District 5. Um, and we know that a lot, a lot of the, the funding goes to District 5, which I'm thankful for. However, District 5 is really wide and large, and a lot of it does not get um, attention. And so I know a lot of your districts also do not get a lot of attention. So one of, I'm going to the, the request, my proposals for some of this funding for the commissioners. So my first one is to create community theaters. And so you got some of this research here and studies that show the benefit of it. Um, you have the proposal here. And, you know, one of the things that it shows is that you really do get, um, and I think, I think a lot of the people who are here speaking spoke to how important it is for, for arts and culture to be in our communities. Um, but that is lacking in a lot of the outskirts away from this corridor here. And so I would like to see a lot of the commissioner's districts having in these, these areas outside, away from the corridor, some community theaters. Um, so there were some questions that during a sunshine meeting that was asked, so some of those questions are answered here. Um, one of the things I would say is for the locations of these community theaters, it should be around areas where we already have hotels. So it would make it easier. We already know that tourists are going to those areas and make it easier to attract more tourism to those community theaters. And community theaters do attract um, a minimum of 20% of tourists to their shows. And I believe our, if you look at some of the data from Orange County, it goes up to like 60% of the attendants are from tourists or people from outside of the region. Um, my other proposal is for the commissioners to have <coughs> community festivals and funding for community festivals. And festivals, I mean, we, we have them here in Orange County. We have a lot of them in downtown, right? And we see that does bring a lot of tourism to the area and creates a lot of jobs. And we have saw support for that as well. But how about we have some of these festivals more on the outskirts? Um, and I feel that each district commissioner getting some of this funding for festivals and working with the cultural and arts groups can really bring some more tourism to the outskirts of Orange County and benefit the communities with some... You know, festivals are, they're not pricey to attend. They're very affordable. And sometimes we have these families who, they don't have the money to really do something with their kids. And they have to travel far. They don't have the, the money for, to, tr to, um, to get there. So having these community festivals and events in the outskirts closer to people who may not be able to afford to go to downtown Orlando um, I feel will be bene very beneficial to each of our districts. Um, so that is, you know, I also, one thing that's really bothering me um, with, the, with this process and the applications is that we're not the federal government. We don't have unlimited funding. And so I feel really uncomfortable about committing money we don't have and which is volatile to economic ebb, ebb and flows because we know that you know, we have a recession, those dollars go down, tourism is the first thing that gets hit when the economy goes bad. And so the process, what we're being asked to do is to put hundreds of millions of dollars um, committed to projects that we really don't have all the information for to see what that return on investment is. Um, we don't know what the, the impact on our communities are going to be because, you know, not, not all, it's not all um, rainbows and unicorns. You know, this, the tourism industry has created some, some harmful impacts to our economy as well. So what are those impacts when we have a project coming to us? And I feel that we should not hold also the hands of future boards from being able to use the, this funding. That's another concern I have. So, I mean, I don't, I, I'm a little confused in all the details, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, we're looking at maybe 10 years, 10 year projects or something like that, but it's like multiple years of excess money that we're looking to commit. And if we do that, future boards will not be able to access that funding. And so I don't think we should go more than 24 well, more, I'll say I don't think we should go more than a year out on 
funding something. It's like what, what money we have now, not what <coughs> money we're expecting to come in the future to be able to give to any projects that apply. Um, and I definitely agree with you know, the, the suggestion that we, the recommendation that we go to Tallahassee and ask for the tourism impact. And I also agree with the recommendation of looking at our rubric and, and how those projects impact our community with wages and cost of social services. Um, one of the things I've asked from Visit Orlando is you, they keep telling us what, how much money is coming in, but what we don't get is how much money is the government paying in social services because those employees who work for them aren't getting paid enough and we have to give them food stamps, welfare, or Section 8, or housing, whatever it is, because they're not getting a livable wage. So we need to know what that number is. How much is it really costing the government and social services if we fund this? Um, I think that should be part of the return on investment calculation. All right. Um, oh, and another thing. So, you know, that board also, you know, I heard we have labor representatives on there that was appointed by the commissioners, um, I believe. And <clears throat> these representatives represent thousands of people. However, us county commissioners here, we meet with our constituents, we hear from them, we, we meet with them, and we represent hundreds of thousands of constituents, not just thousands, hundreds of thousands. So no one knows our communities better than we do because we talk with you all. And I'm talking through the camera to the residents out there because you know, they're the ones who can't be here because they're working, but we're representing them. And we listen to them, we meet with them, we have our listening sessions, our town halls. So I don't want to minimize how much our commissioners know about our communities and what their needs are and how they're suffering. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Moore. You know, it, it's like, a, I shouldn't say gambling, but you never know when you're up next. <laughs> Drawing <laughs> straws, pulling straws to see where you, where you hit. <laughs> anyway, so thank you, thank you for the project. Um, I, I'm here to accept the Orange County Tourist Development Tax uh, report. And from my understanding, what you want us to do is just to maybe to give a few little things that we might need so we can have a more robust conversation in a workshop. And so a couple have said it, but I just want to reiterate so staff knows it's important. Um, we need to know how much money excess additional we have to spend. And I really do want to know what the updated cost of the convention center, if we have any time to get with the, um, the cost estimating company. Um, uh, Visit Orlando said something very interesting in one of my briefings that 50% of our tourists that come here are, are attending something other than the major three tourist uh, locations, you know, Disney, Universal, and SeaWorld. And so um, they were going to get me some data to show me what that was because I do think um, we've all mentioned it, there might be some nexus back to some funding to beef up our local communities, whether it's an amphitheater, a museum, or whatever. Because I, when I take a vacation, I want an authentic vacation. So yes, I'll go to a convention, and then I want to do something that's in that local area. And I told them to stop advertising the springs, because I'm sorry, they're, they're lined up out front of my neighborhood. So no more springs. No, I'm, I'm just teasing. But, but we do have to be conscious <coughs> of if we're going to recommend, you know, our sending people to Eatonville or Winter Garden Farmers Market, we have to be somewhat conscious of how many people we send because it still is for our local people. But it's important that this agency that we, this, this board of county commissioners that we think about are unincorporated areas. We have sent a lot of money to Lock Haven Park. I'm, I'm happy for it. But I just came back from a Main Street conference in, in Ocala and everything that they're doing to revitalize their city. Now, trust me, we got a lot more going on in Orange County, and I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, so I'm not comparing and saying they're better. But the one thing that they have been figuring out was how to bring people to their little tiny downtown, and, and that's a city of 66,000 people. Well, we have plenty of little cities in Orange County that could use a little economic development and some tourists coming by. So I want us to never lose... Uh, track of that, that we're always sending it to Orlando, to here, to there, and we're not always sending it 
to our unincorporated areas and helping some of our, our more blighted communities. So um, if that could work through Roseanne through the arts and cultural affairs, I would love to hear about that. I'd like some more information. Um, very in favor of if we have enough in excess to, to fund our other obligations. Um, can we help out? Of course, I'm always a big fan of Zora Neale Hurston and, and, and Eaton Bell. <laughs> and why sitting over there? Um, of course I am. You know, so I want to understand a little bit more because we keep saying, oh, we can fund them through ARC and through the Arts and Cultural Affairs, but I want you a little more detail to be sure that we're not just saying that there'll be enough money there to fund our other organizations. So um, I think that's all I had, Mayor, in terms of, uh, but I, I do accept the report and I look forward to that additional information and a ro more robust conversation. All right. Commissioner, you read that. Yeah, I actually have a question for staff, so if you don't mind coming back up. Um, because I, I kind of feel like we've got deviated from where this started, which is our TDT funding and accepting the report. First and foremost, um, I think the, the biggest question that we kept hearing over and over through all the, all the meetings was, how much are we able to bond? You know, and I think at the end of the day, it's gonna, we're gonna need Comptroller Diamond at the table. We're gonna have to know what the, what the bonding rate is at that time, what the fees are, and what we're actually capable of bonding. Because when you do the math and you get almost $3.7 billion of requests, there's no way we can afford that. Um, I know I mentioned it before, it's like everyone put in their wish list for everything they could imagine for Christmas and said, let's see what happens. And I think that when we have our work session, we're gonna have to have a realistic meeting and that includes the convention center. What are the real hard costs now? Because I know that Mark Tester could only present what he had. He didn't have the authority to say, I know that this has gone up 20%, so we really need 713 million. And um, in order for us, as, uh, as commissioners to be able to consider that project and what it will cost in funding, we have to get a realistic number. And then Comptroller Diamond has to be at the table to say this is what realistically and where our bond rate is. Because I think at the end of the day, um, TDT was created so that we didn't take general fund money to support the convention center. And, and this worries me when we talk about the arm because We've had this conversation every year when it comes in front of us, and they say, unfortunately, they didn't qualify for TDT funding, arts projects or community projects, and even though this veterans project sounds fantastic, but do they actually qualify for TDT funding? And it's like setting that rule right ahead of us is so important because we could say everything we want to fund with it, but are we legally able allowed to fund with it? And, um, and I think that's super important. Um, I have a follow-up question is, what is our timeline on bonding? Because Mayor and many of us have talked about, the legislature already tried to come after our funding at the county. And it's interesting when people say, well, we want to use our funding, but when you hear the state wants to take our funding, so monies that are collected in Orange County, they want to use in the state of Florida. And the only way we can try to prevent that is to basically put us in debt. So <laughs> what is our bonding timeline where we really have to have a hard decision on what we're going to do? I think I'm going to let uh, Administrator Brooks answer that call question. We'll be better prepared to uh, answer that at the August 22nd uh, work session. That's what we actually uh, have. But understand, that's going to be based upon the decisions you make in terms of the projects. Uh, without a doubt, we will have the information that will give you an understanding or a range of the capacity. It won't be $3.7 billion. No. That I can tell you. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so that means the hard decisions of how you want to allocate what is available and then where those projects are. And then we can go through. Quite frankly, the, the easiest part about this will be issuing the debt. That's, that's really, right. uh, it's really about making the decisions and then how we proceed to fund those projects, uh, quite frankly, is not a, a very complicated So um, is process. the banker in the building? He's, you <laughs> referred to yourself as the banker in the building, okay. Does, when does he come into this conversation to say, commissioners, here's the scope at our reserves, at our prediction of growth, and all those things. This is what, because for us to make a decision, I mean, we could say take all five, 
And we can't fund it. So at what point does Comptroller Diamond come uh, in and say? Well, we'd we'll be working with the Comptroller. And we've had a very preliminary discussion, which I've said as we prepare for the work session, that we'll be sitting down. They're always a part also. Well, I'll let the Comptroller answer. But they, they are they at the table. They are part of the uh, financing teams. Whenever we issue debt, they're part of that. But so we, we really don't have a timeline on that bonding yet. We don't have a project. We don't know the project yet. Okay. I mean, well, I mean, but, we're having but, a work session, and yeah. you're asking us to make decisions. It, so, at what it, point? It's the, it, he can. I think uh, <clears throat> we need to make sure that at the work session we provide information to the board about the process, how we have funded projects in the past. The comptroller is part of that. In fact, he entered into this equation. You remember the memorandum that he issued that said that his recommendation was that we not expand the uses until we uh, reach two pinnacles. One, we had more than $300 million in reserves, and two, until we reach the point uh, where our, our total tax receipts exceeded $300 million. We reached both of those, and he did that based upon his wisdom as a CPA, uh, his experience uh, with working here within the county. He just happens to be an attorney also. <laughs> and so uh, because of all of that, I think we owe it to the board uh, as part of the presentation to talk to you about bonding and how that works and, and what that looks like if we make any decisions. You're correct, Commissioner. Uh, the wish list that we received is uh, we cannot financially do. To Commissioner Bonilla's point, uh, we have built all of these uh, major facilities that we have from the courthouse to, to, to other facilities, including the convention center, uh, where we have used a bonding mechanism. It's kind of equivalent to uh, most of us who purchase a home. We, we, we don't pay cash for it for the most part. You get a mortgage Correct. and based upon your projected revenue streams. One thing that we do have the benefit of, we are the government. And because we have an overwhelming majority of uh, the taxpayers pay ab valorem taxes if they own property. So we have some, um, some risk factors that a, a, an individual or a business might not have because we have some guaranteed types of revenue streams. But we, these are always going to be calculated risk that we take about investing the people's money. And uh, I am, in my, uh, it is my belief that when we do the presentation uh, on the 22nd, you need to understand the risk versus reward associated with that. So we have to work very closely with the comptroller uh, to be part of that presentation. But that is the information that you have to have before, you, before we're going to ask you to make any decisions about spending anything or doing anything differently. Yes. We do have to work and live within our means. Now, I will say that the TDT has been a wonderful opportunity that we've had as a community to have the tourists pay significantly for community amenities that benefit all of us, okay? Uh, we have that benefit, and by having this funding stream, it does relieve pressure on the other buckets of revenues that we have, because when you talk about, uh, I think part of the conversation has to be about preservation of the jobs that we do have. Earlier today, we had individuals come in from who work uh, at the convention center, who work around it, who work on the International Drive. Why did they come in? I asked the young lady a specific question. Did we direct you to come in here and, and talk today? And she said no. You know why? Because she's concerned about her job. Mm -hmm. If she's those jobs that are dependent upon the ecosystem around the convention center and our tourism industry, those people are very concerned. So when we have this conversation 
about the balancing of the community benefits, uh, there are people who may not make what some of us make, who are low wage earners, who may be housekeepers, who may be dishwashers, who may be landscapers. Don't diminish the impact that this tourist development tax has on all of those people by preserving their jobs. I'm passionate about it because I wouldn't be sitting here today if I hadn't washed dishes at Howard Johnson's or Sweden House on uh, International Drive or if I hadn't worked at Disney uh, as a teenager, as a young man. I needed that job. Just like all those people who came in here today, they need those jobs. As a Board of County Commission, we have a responsibility to all of them to make sure that their jobs don't disappear in the process. So uh, let's have a fair balanced conversation about it because sometimes when I hear someone say who was presenting today, I'm representing the people. How do you define the people? We're all the people. We're all the people. Whether you're a high wage earner, low wage, middle wage earner, we all are the people. This board has the responsibility to balance out that conversation across the entire uh, spectrum, but also create the opportunities for the least of those to move up. I know what I'm talking about in this regard because I did it. I wouldn't be sitting here as mayor and there are people who work with me at Walt Disney, like John Morgan, the attorney. We worked in, as characters at Walt Disney World. He wasn't always John Morgan, <laughs> uh, Morgan and Morgan. He, he, he was wearing those hot costumes out there at Walt Disney with me. So you, you might not be able to see them where they are sitting today. But I just ask you, don't look down your nose at them because they're housekeepers, okay? Oh, those jobs, they're housekeepers. They don't make anything. Doggone it, my mother cleaned enough houses as a maid to allow me to sit here today. So don't look down your nose at them. They need those jobs. There are many of them, 90% of them or so are uh, new immigrants who are coming in here. They're moving in here from other places, pursuing the American dream. They need those jobs. We better preserve those jobs and take care of making certain that they can move up into high wage jobs too. That's what we get to wrestle with here. It's not a us against them or all against none. We're all in it. They are all in it. All those people that work at our convention center out there, they are concerned. I, Commissioner Bonilla, I was in Texas in Austin. I, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, the gentleman you talked about. I found his comments very interesting. I looked. I had the opportunity to go and out to their tiny home community and tour it while I was there. I looked at downtown and guess what? Every day on television in Austin they were talking about homelessness. I saw them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I saw if that convention that we were at was not there, there wouldn't have been a lot going on in downtown Austin. Um, I tried to evaluate what was going on we're in much better shape than what I saw there. That's right. So, can I, anyway. Can I go? Commissioner Uribe, <laughs> back to you. <laughs> and by the way, for the record, I wasn't devaluing anything. On the contrary. No, no, my comments um, aren't I think uh, Ella focused Wood, on anybody here. I'm just saying I think publicly. Ella, Ella Wood is left, but they just negotiated one heck of a contract at the convention center for their workers and for their benefits. And I think that that conversation came up with the Development Task Force 
which talked about what kind of jobs offer medical, offer retirement, offer all that, and guess one who hit all across the board, the convention center. And I have talked to hospitality workers who are part-time, and they'd rather wait to see if convention center is available because it pays more. So um, I think we have to give credit to Mark and his team. And, and yes. I do want to talk about the Visit Orlando um, comment that Commissioner Bonilla made. I have uh, been inquiring about this because I do semi-agree that that percentage rate is really high. They're going to get over $130 million this year. And when you look at their tax returns, they're not spending that, you know. And uh, But at the same time, when it comes to business and sales, how do you motivate people is how much they can sell, what they're doing. And I, I think that we need to reevaluate that contract because they were never gaining that much in the first place. And when you think of $130 plus million dollars, what we could actually do to work on the TDT, even if we freed up 10, 15, 20 million a year, could be a significant difference, especially when they're not spending those funds. But I don't agree that it should be a flat rate. I think it should be a percentage because during the good and the bad, when things went down, their money went down. And they clearly had to struggle with that and do what they had to do. And had we had them, let's just say 75 million a year, that would have put us in a compromising position when it came to our TDT reserves. When And, and it's like COVID isn't just one thing that happened. 9-11 happened. Um, the recession happened, which has now put us in this complicated position with the convention center. Because we technically pieced together north-south during that recession, and now we're dealing with that at this point. People seem to think that that was built to par and we're just adding on. No, we dealt with the recession and not being able to do everything that we wanted, that was planned to do at that time. But I do believe we should evaluate their returns and their expenditures and their income because I think there's an opportunity to, well, I still believe there should be a percentage because, like I said, I don't want us held. I do believe that there could be um, a little bit less that would free, us, free up a significant amount. Something that I'm really concerned about, this is where I'm going to ask staff, is... ARC, Arts, and Go Sports. These, everybody here is asking for 200% increase. This is going to affect how many projects we can get done because we're going to have to bond it too. And when you look at penny changes, we have a very set program on how many pennies go for everything. And when you look at the arts asking for more penny, when you look at ARC, which I have concerns about when we start doing arts through that because again if they don't qualify they're not getting that money anyways but yet it bothers me and i said this recently we're using our general fund art money to support organizations that get arc that get tdt and we need to really evaluate that because i just did an interview during the break where someone says what about the small art organizations they don't get any of this money they don't qualify so i really would like that to look at but the economic impact of ARC asking for $12 million a year, for ARTS asking from $8 million to $16 million a year. That's got to come from somewhere. And Go Sports, which when I look at their per year number and you evaluate and look at what other counties are paying compared to us when you look at our population, we are very much underpaying on that. I don't necessarily agree with $10 million, but if we're going to stay competitive – and I want to talk about sports. Sports are a huge generator economically in our communities. Um, when you looked at the Chelsea Arsenal game, for every dollar that was committed, we got $340 return. And that isn't just hotels, and that just isn't the theme parks. That's Uber. That's restaurants. That's shopping. That's people coming here. And when you look at the percentage amount of people who visited Central Florida, just for that game and the Real Madrid game coming up in August, is enormous. And I am going to testify here as someone who just got back from going to five states and seven concerts, no name of the concert because it will age me terribly. But I just got back from seven concerts, and it's so funny because my daughter made a sign on the last show. She said, this faith has had her seven shows, and she's going home. But we went to Nashville. We went to Atlanta. We went to Raleigh. We went to Charlotte. We went to Atlanta. Um, we spent 
money, not only in hotels, in restaurants, shopping. There's a Walmart across America in every city, by the way, and a Target. <laughs> but, yeah, I had to buy the kid toys. But the whole point is, is um, there is an economic impact. And what was interesting, again, and I'm dating myself on this, is we weren't the only ones. Every time we went to a new city, hey, didn't I see you in Nashville? Yes, I did. Oh, my gosh. Are you going to Raleigh, too? Yeah, I'm going to Raleigh. You know, it is how people do things. There is a reason why Harry Styles did 15 days in New York, and I went two days to see him in New York because he didn't come to Florida. You know, this is the new norm. There is a reason why Monster Jams, when I was in Nashville, are having the championship, which we've had here in Orlando before, is in Nashville, and people were going to Nashville for that. And they're not just going to Monster Jams. They're going to everything in that city. Because when you travel, there's no kitchen to cook at home. Every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, unless you stay at Embassy Suites, and I'm not plugging them, they offer a hot breakfast. But outside of that, you are spending those funds. And we have to recognize that everyone is making money off of those funds. So it's, I, I think it's bad to say that only one person. But more than that, the Pro Bowl announcement this morning was not a, hey, we're the NFL, let's go to Orlando. Steve Hogan and his team worked very hard to get the NFL to come back to Orlando. That is a job in itself. He has a team. Um, Jason Siegel has a team. We're not getting AAU volleyball just because. We're not getting the Madrid game just because, or the Cheez-It, or the Pop-Tart, or anything that's going on because... They just said, why not go to Orlando? And Mayor and I and a lot of the team here worked very hard to try to get FIFA to come to Orlando, which we failed at. But that didn't just happen. That was a huge, huge effort, and it does bring revenue. And I also want to say on the convention center, while we do bring jobs, filling that, that center, Mark gave his testament of how much revenue, rate of return, is being put into that. So these investments that we're doing um, do have a rate of return. And I really, really do want to analyze, and I think um, Comptroller Diamond, I think it's important that when we look at ARC, Arts, and Go Sports, how much it's going to affect the ability for us to bond anything else. And I also think that we have to, when we have that workshop here, be very, very specific and clear on who can actually qualify for that funding because we've heard great organizations and I don't know if that's a general fund idea, but are they really eligible for TDT funds? Because all those organizations that came in front of this task force um, came with like that dream in their eyes. You know, I mean, this gentleman said, hey, you give us a million dollars and we can do this. While we probably could, but does he qualify for TDT funding? And I think that's that's the major question. Um, so I'm going to just... I have just one last thing. One o'clock. After one o'clock, we still have presentation about housing authority. Uh, so if we can try to get through it before we roll into two o'clock, try to get through it. Yes, but I mean, in all honesty, we had 42 comments that took us two hours. So this is our moment to kind of give our, our comment. Um, on the arts... I really do think we need to find a way to individualize that to our districts. Um, I know that Mark Tester, thank you for being open to try to take Fusion Fest to Orange County Convention Center so that all people can enjoy that and not have to pay parking and all that to go there. But I think it's, I think it's super, super important. But for me and I think for this board, and I can understand where Commissioner Wilson was a little uncomfortable, I appreciate the work that has been contributed by this um, organization. and. It's very interesting that they all agreed, but I think that the realistic thing for us to be effective is to know how much we can bond, how much are we capable of spending, how much is the ARC, Arts, and Go Sports going to affect the ability to bond, and, and I also think we have to have hard conversations like we have with our kids. You may want $12 million a year, and you may want now $16 million a year, but here's really what you're going to get, um, because I don't think it's, it's fair to say, you, you, and you get everything you want, and everyone else doesn't get anything. If there's a capability of being able to take care of certain projects, look at contributing. But I do think that when we look at the arts, we really need to look at how we can make this more community-based and not so much 
one person in United Arts makes a decision for everybody and sorry, you're not a nonprofit, you don't have a governing board, so you are out of the scope. Those days need to kind of come to an end. But I do think that we have to get the realistic number, what we can bond and what that timeline is to bond. But I am concerned and I'm glad that you brought that up before you brought the recommendation list about ARC, Arts and Go Sports because that's gonna be a big, big impact on what else is capable to done, be done and maybe we need to play with that number and look at alternatives for them, but we can't really have that conversation right now. And um, and again, appreciate all the work from the task force, from the staff, but I feel like I have more questions than answers at this point, and hopefully we get that before we have the work session so that we can have a real practical conversation at the work session. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Commissioner Scott since he hadn't spoken yet. I uh, see Commissioner Wilson and Commissioner Bonilla Press that button, but Commissioner Scott, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Co-Chair Henley, thank you for your service on uh, the committee. Um, can you just briefly explain to me, um, you guys talked about to aggressively go to Tallahassee and, 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 and lobby that they change uh, the tourist development uh, taxes uses, give us a little bit more flexibility. Um, from your perspective, how do we accomplish that given the current climate? Well, first of all, uh, we're not, what we're suggesting is the tourist impact tax, right. which does not compete with all this other stuff. No, what I'm saying is but I'm it, saying anything we, out of Tallahassee. Okay, that, that you all, I think for the first time ever, as Orange County Commission, recommend to your legislative delegation to go to Tallahassee and on your lobbyists and lobby for this tax that very little is known about, and there really aren't any good arguments against it, would give you a ton of money for affordable housing, $30 million a year. And it's, I, I think it's doable in the legislature, I do, because I think every county in the, in the state wants a local option refer, with a referendum so they can have money for affordable housing. It allows affordable housing now. The only thing needed is to cut out of that law that says it can only be done in areas of critical concern. You take that out, then it's a statewide law local option with referendum, with one cent in the hotel tax. Use a half a penny for affordable housing, the other half penny goes in your coffers to make up for the loss of, you know, taking the land off the rolls. But you can, that would be, still leave you more money for affordable housing or transit in your general fund. So to me, it's a, it's, it's a tax that, again, hardly anybody knows about, because it's only used in Monroe County, and it was apparently designed for them in 1985 in the Growth Management Act so they could buy conservation land, but it also said you could do affordable housing. So it's the only hotel tax that says you can use it for affordable housing. So that's why I think it's perfect for Orange County that has an affordable housing problem. And also this, this would piggybacks on the law that was passed this year, uh, Live Local for affordable housing, which is, allows you to increase densities and stuff, but only gave 150 million a year statewide, which is gonna be nothing. This would be 30 million a year just in Orange County. And there's, there's land places to do it, International Drive, you know, where you're not gonna get a NIMBY thing. You could redevelop things, you could use it all over the county and just create a land authority, that's all you have to do, which is easy. So I think it, I think it could be a, a winner in the legislature, if you all try. If you all don't try, it's not gonna be a winner in the legislature. If nobody's lobbying for it, there's not gonna, there's not gonna be any incentive to do it. And if you don't, I think, it's, I think the task force thinks this is a real missed opportunity for you to have this at your disposal right now to push for it and uh, get other counties, you know, do a coalition. That's what lobbyists are paid for. Get a coalition of counties to go forward and try to push it through. All right. And Commissioner Scott, um, you know, we are all part of um, the local delegation and, but also part of the Florida Association of Counties. So there's a lot of work that has to be done. Uh, <laughs> you know, we'll have to have some conversations uh, with other uh, county uh, counties in Florida and our own association about uh, how we proceed. Uh, each year legislatively, uh, there's a Florida Association of Counties uh, Legislative uh, Committee and uh, they kind of vet the things that the association supports or doesn't support. And so we will have to understand where we are with, within our own association. So there's, there's some work to be done. Uh, it's, we know that based on the current law and some of the definitions, there's some things that will have to change. And uh, 
quite frankly, at this point, we don't know the tolerance of the other counties to even changing it or not because of, you know, the current <laughs> legislative no, conditions. I, I, I agree with so, you. So I, with you. <laughs> I hear what you're saying. Just, just understand that it, it won't be easy. Oh, so, no, I, I think, that, you know, um, I think we should work with what we have. Uh, but certainly look at other options. I was just curious from your perspective, working with the individuals over the course of, of this time, just your perspective on that. You know, for me, we have to work in the confines of what we have and then be fiscally prudent with that. Um, to what Commissioner uh, Wilson and, and Chris and B was, uh, not Benny, I'm sorry, uh, Uribe was saying, um, uh, Roseanne, as you guys start to craft what this is going to look like, the work session, how it comes shape, I would just request that whatever uh, thoughts in terms of a timeline, that we get stuff sooner. Um, allow us more time to be able to review the information prior to the work session. Um, the briefings are great, but sometimes we want to be able to, uh, you know, dig a little deeper. And so I, I would like to make that request or suggestion. Um, but um, the overwhelming thing I've heard from the community um, that we all have is, is, is housing. We all know that's an issue. We know it's important. Um, and, and I feel confident in speaking on behalf of my fellow commissioners and the mayor that it, isn't, it is as important to us as it is to the community. But, you know, we, we, have, we can only work in the confines of what we have. Um, when it comes to these other organizations, and I'm just thinking of them, uh, you know, Florida Citrus Sports, Visit Orlando, uh, UCF, the, the city of Orlando, Amway Center, Magic, all these organizations, they do things in the community. And I think that if, if, if the things aren't the right things or, or not enough, then that's where the conversation happens, not just with us as elected officials, but within the community itself and a continuous dialogue. You know, um, we talked about, um, Commissioner Mayor kind of talked about substantial job and Mayor kind of commented on that. Like, what's substantial to one person may not be substantial to another. I think of the young men that I work with that are, you know, as young as 11 that are parking cars. And so that allows them to pay for a haircut that their parents can't afford or, or pay for, you know, clothes or things like that. Um, but I also think of the kids that make other choices that lead to crime and other things. And so when it comes to the engagement of you as individuals and organizations that you represent, know that at least from my vantage point, it is a, a continuous conversation, not just with us as elected officials, but with the members of the community on how you expand your footprint and the things that you do beyond your, your regular scope of business, because ultimately this, this is the people's dollar, we're representative of the people's voice, and you wanna make sure that you're engaged with the people as well, not just their representatives. And so for me, um, I think we should work on what we have uh, the convention center certainly has provided jobs. You know, um, maybe Mayor may commission a survey or a study to figure out if he or I had more jobs in Orlando. Because <laughs> I, I remember opening up uh, Universal Orlando. That was my first job at 16. Not my, my second job, really, but my first job that paid me better than bagging groceries at Winn-Dixie. And then I, I got an opportunity to work at the Hilton Orlando and open that in security. And so those jobs kind of shaped my perspective on what our economy is like for me and, and how I was able to buy a pager, you know, and do different things that I probably wouldn't have been, been able to do with my mom on some of the things that Commissioner Reed talked about, you know, food stamps and, and public assistance. But um, I challenge you, each one of your organizations, to look at your footprint as it relates to the, the dollar, the time, and the resources, the programs that you have, and how can you expand that over the next year, two, three, four, five, or 10? How can you do better? Who are you not engaging when it comes to the community service? Housing is a big issue, and I think housing should be at the forefront of that because mental health, uh, grades, school, job, nothing matters if you do not have a stable, secure environment to call home. And so um, that, that's all my comments, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, let me, uh, just for time management, let, let me just ask a question. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Bryant, how, how long is your presentation, approximately? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, we, we've had robust discussion at this point regarding the report. Is, is there a motion, uh, because we really gotta try to- So move, Scott. Second, 
Okay, we have a motion for approval of the report. Of the acceptance. Of the acceptance. acceptance of the report. Uh, uh, acceptance. Uh, the re I, I point, look at the requested action. That's what we're asking you to, to vote on. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Scott, a second by Commissioner Gomez. Um, if there's any unreadiness, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, any unreadiness for the vote? Otherwise, I'm going to call the vote. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're clear that this is just accepting the report. It's not agreeing to any of the... Well, that's all we're doing, just, just accepting just the report. Yeah, just, that's what it says, acceptance. Okay. Will there be an opportunity to analyze the way that the report was actually made? Because that rubric is a problem. If we go back to it again and again, because we were a unanimous vote on this. Uh, the rubric regarding the scoring, okay. we can take all that up, you know, when we get to the, the August 22nd, if you, <laughs> okay. Ro Roseanne, if you could, just for clarification for us as a board and, and the folks that are listening and watching, um, it, the recommendations, how the recommendations came to fruition, none of that is binding on us by accepting these. So we could deviate from that in any form. Am I correct? Commissioner, you're absolutely right. These are just recommendations for the board. The task force has no authority to implement anything. They're just making recommendations to you, and you're just accepting the report, and then it does not commit you to implement or agree with what was in the report. And we do not have to utilize the rubric that was created to come to whatever decision that is ultimately decided by the board. Correct. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, I just have one more question, too, because I know in the past, you know, when we've had um, some projects come up, then we were like, well, you all agreed with it because you accepted this report, and this is based on that report that you all accepted. You know, so that's where I'm kind of hesitant to uh, vote yes. I mean, why can't we just have this submitted? Why do we even have to make a motion to accept it? Oh. I mean, you're giving us the report. I mean, okay, I understand why there has to be a motion. Mayor, I'd like to amend my motion, and I will, I would like to amend my, so I would like to do away with the requested action. I would like to make a motion to accept the recommendations from the Tourist Development Tax Force uh, for filing just for the benefit of the public record. Is, is, this, is that sufficient for you, Commissioner? No, uh, we're all, <laughs> it's, that's the same thing, Commissioner. I know, but uh, uh, Commissioner Reedy uh, seems to have a point, so I'm trying to. Yeah, I mean, thing is, it's been like, you know, brought up as a way to, you know, then tie our hands in the we're, future. So. We're not tying your hands. We're not, we're not asking you to do that today. I don't think, I'm not asking you to do that. None of us. I don't feel that. like I'm so voting to. Yeah. Yeah. Why can't it just be passed in then? I don't understand why we need a motion. Listen, we. Commissioner Scott, you, your original motion and then the amended motion are really the same thing. Okay, so I don't... Understood. Let's, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I'm going to call a question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Okay. Commissioner Bonilla and Commissioner Wilson vote, voted no. Okay, the motion passes. All right. So, uh, I'm so sorry... Ms. Bryant, that, you know, we couldn't, uh, we had some things unforeseen that happened today uh, with the, the volume of people that came forward. So I'm going to ask, uh, thank you, Ms. Healy, for being here. Uh, we will continue the, the conversation You're about our tourist it. development tax. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, and uh, Ms. Bryant, we're going to ask you to come on up and present the second item the commissioner's and mayor's uh, market uh, compensation analysis. We're going to move that to this afternoon at, at the end uh, of uh, the meeting this afternoon uh, so that, uh, you know, maybe we can uh, get a time to, to refresh. Uh, with that, uh, Ms. Bryant, thank you so much for uh, indulging us today. Actually, this is a, a, a very good segue into um, what we're doing in affordable housing that um, blends into a lot of the discussion that you all have had. And I want to thank uh, Mayor Demings uh, for inviting us to make this
presentation to update you on what the Orlando Housing Authority is doing. And I, I won't dwell, let me see if I know how to use this. Okay. The uh, mission of the Orlando Housing Authority is to provide safe and affordable housing options and opportunities for economic independence for residents of Orlando and Orange County. Now, Orlando Housing Authority uh, serves both Orlando, the same boundaries as Orange County, and we operate in the county. In fact, we operate uh, our Section 8 program within the same boundaries as the Orange County Housing Agencies um, operates in the Section 8 program. Our programs are a little different because we have public housing. And the difference between public housing and the Section 8 program is who actually owns the units. In public housing, the Orlando Housing Authority owns the units. And we have um, 1,315 public housing units. We have 207 tax credit units. And we own some uh, non public housing units that are affordable, and we have 4,474 uh, uh, Section 8 vouchers. Now, Orlando also operates, oh, I keep trying to do that, operates um, in the, the Sanford area. In 2010, we were asked to go in and to assist the Sanford Housing Authority to, um, to, uh, to improve their operations. Um, in terms of who we serve, 70% of our households are at 30% of the median income, and, uh, and you have the information regarding how many in, are in public housing and how many are in Section 8. And then we have 50% uh, of our households, 23% um, are, are below 50% of the median income, and 7% and are at um, low income, which is 80% of the median. Uh, Orlando Housing Authority closed this waiting list in November of 2019, but we still have 11,000 households on our public housing waiting list and 14,643 on our Section 8 waiting list. We have some special purpose programs that we operate we have the Emergency Housing Voucher Program where we receive referrals from the Homeless Services Network. And we have the Veterans, uh, what we call VASH, is the Veteran Affairs and Supportive Housing Program. And then we have 154 of those vouchers and those referrals come from the VA. We also have the Family Unification Program where our households have been separated by the courts and we're able to bring them back together and we have a non-elderly disabled vouchers that we provide for, uh, how, for what we call the young disabled. And then we have mainstream vouchers that we provide for households that are disabled and we get those um, referrals from different community-based organizations. Um, this chart shows you how many VASH vouchers we have. We have 619. Um, that we uh, get from the, the uh, VA. We have 154 emergency housing vouchers that we implement. We own um, West Oaks property, which is at Hiawassee and Colonial, and we have a transitional housing program there. West Oaks is 281 units. We have 35 um, what we call project-based uh, vouchers there for households that are transitioning out of homelessness. And then we have a single room occupancy um, program that we administer through Maxwell Terrace, and that's at the corner of, um, of John Young and Colonial, and that's 100 vouchers. Orlando Housing Authority is a moving to work agency, and that is a special designation that is a, a, um, an honor and is, is earned by being a high performer. Of the 3,400 housing authorities across the United States, there are only 39 that are moving to work um, legacy agencies, and we are one of them. It allows us to change HUD rules to make housing more affordable and to t take away a lot of the 
um, barriers that other housing authorities may have in order to achieve our goals. We have been moving work since 2010, and it does offer us other opportunities. Um, as indicated before, we also manage the Sanford Housing Authority. Uh, in terms of how we have been able to transform neighborhoods, the, the uh, picture that you have is of the um, former Orange Villa public housing property that, is at the that was at the corner of Livingston and Bumby. This is what is there now. That is our Hampton Park uh, Hope 6 development. We were able to develop 65 home ownership units. 18 of them are affordable. We finished that property in about 2006. It is 2004. It's still uh, an example of a successful mixed income um, development where 65 units are in the property, 18 of them are affordable, and we were able to use some of the funds that we were uh, able to leverage from the, the cities and from um, the um, selling the market rate homes to support the affordable. We also have, um, let me see if that occurs. We also have our administration building there. I keep not doing this thing. Now this is our second uh, transformation where we um, worked with the Carver Park. It was an old Carver Court public housing site. And uh, we were able to demolish the property and um, we received $18.2 million. We, we built um, 56 tax credit um, units we called the landings at Carver Park. 30 of them are public housing, 26 are, are tax credits, and we were also able to build the, um, an elderly property, uh, 60, 64 units of housing for the elderly, and that is located at the corner of Gore and Westmoreland it's approximately 17 acres, and we were able to transfer, transform that neighborhood. Now, HUD has a concept they call repositioning, and that's where they, um, have, they contacted all housing authorities across the United States and said that they did not have the money to finance the maintenance costs for um, public housing and, and they asked us to take our properties and put them on a different platform. Now, putting them on a, a different platform means that they would not provide the maintenance that we would either use the Section 8 program or some of the other programs to be able to, um, to maintain those properties. We evaluated our housing stock and, and decided that some of our oldest properties were the ones that we wanted to reposition. So we looked at um, and the ones we have up there, and they're, they're in the, basically, I think, in the, the districts of um, Commissioner, um, Commissioner Scott and I think Commissioner Bonilla, Bonilla um, where we have those, where we would like to take those properties and put them on a different platform because we just don't have the monies to be able to um, maintain them, and they are, um, there's obsolescence. Now, we were able to get permission to demolish Griffin Park, and Griffin Park is located um, in downtown Orlando. Uh, uh, it's west of Division Avenue, uh, and it's um, at, at Gore Street, and Griffin Park was built in 1941. Um, I-4 has encroached on Griffin Park so much that it is um, not a, a good place for housing. You can see that a part of Griffin Park is under the expressway. Right now, all of the residents have been relocated from Griffin Park. Um, we're staging the, um, planning the demolition now and um, working with the city to rebuild and, and these are the kind of activities we'd like for you all to consider for some of the, the tourist development uh, tax dollars to, to help us bring more affordable back and bring back quality affordable housing. And I can say um, the staff 
and, and the board of, of Orlando Housing Authority do want to provide quality affordable housing. We do not do junk. <laughs> and uh, we're very proud of what we've been able to do. That's another site plan for Griffin Park. The, uh, the Orlando Housing Authority and Lift Orlando have joined a partnership and we have submitted an application to HUD for a Choice Neighborhoods um, planning grant. And in that planning grant, we would look at, um, at two of the housing authorities' um, public housing properties, Lorna Doom properties, which is right across from Camping World Stadium, and, and Lake Man, which is um, the third oldest public housing property that we have, and, and one that is, um, uh, is, is very distressed. Um, we have submitted two demolition applications for Lake Man, and for various reasons, HUD did not um, approve them, but we're hoping that with this uh, partnership, we'll be able to use some of the momentum that Westlakes has, has started and be able to um, transform that, that neighborhood. And that's a picture of Lorna Dune and um, Lake Man. Now, what we have for the future, and these are twinkles in our eye. These are, these are not things that we can do right away. And one of the things that we have, have looked at is making sure that we don't gentrify the neighborhood either economically or racially. Uh, we want to make sure that when we do development that the households that we serve, that low-income people can still live there, and, and that's very important, especially with what's going on in downtown Orlando. So we're looking um, to complete the Carver Park redevelopment. We finished the rental portion of it, but, and if we wanted to, to um, finish the home ownership part of it, we could have done it if we wanted to build at market rate, but that's not what our, our mission is. We wanted to make it affordable. We have the same goal for, for Carver Park, uh, uh, which, which is the, the um, we call the, the grandchild of Carver Court. Um, we'd like to make it look like Hampton Park and have some of the same features. Now, Carver Park is located at Gore, um, on the south, on the north is Conley, on the east is um, Short Avenue, and on the west is Woods Avenue. It's, it's 17 acres. Most of it is rebuilt. We just need to do the home ownership part, and in order to do the home ownership and make it affordable, we need grants or we need some kind of monies that would, and I don't want to say um, free money, low-cost money, that would support doing affordable housing. Our next uh, redevelopment that there's a twinkle in our eye is Lake Man Homes. And we have uh, developed a concept for what we would like to see Lake Man Homes look uh, like. The Lake Man on the east is bounded by, um, by Goldwyn, uh, and further east is John Young Parkway. On the west is Gilbert McQueen. Uh, park, and on the south is Eccleston, and there's uh, Lake Man Estates that's on the north, and that's a part of the Lift Orlando Choice Neighborhood Partnership that the Orlando Housing Authority has. We have some vacant land. Our next twinkle is at right next to our office building, which is at the Bumby and Robinson, and we have a vacant parcel there that's next to the public housing in our, our residential um, community that we would like to develop. And then um, we have the Jackson Court uh, Division Oaks site, which is right across from the arena. And uh, Jackson Court is 75 units. Um, it's uh, Jackson Court is um, 58 units of elderly housing and then 17 units of, of family housing. Uh, it's right behind the Wells Built Museum. We would like to redevelop that. However, we would like to, to phase it so that we, it's in keeping with what's going on in the rest of the neighborhood. 
Um, another property that we would like to um, to to build on in and uh, make a have affordable housing is Ann York Manor. That's at W D Judge Road between John Young Parkway and Mercy Drive. Right now there are 102 units of uh, housing for the elderly. We do have some vacant land there that we would like to build affordable housing. And then we have um, property up in Martin Meadows that is um, right at the 414 in Apopka. And there are 45 units of public housing there. And we have um, nine acres there that we would like to, to build on. So that is the, uh, I've run through the, the presentation pretty quickly. I, I apologize for not spending more time to go over it with you, um, commissioners. I would like to um, make time to come back and sit and talk with you to talk more about what we're doing and, and how we can work together. Yes, I think we get a thumbs up. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Bryant. Uh, go way back <laughs> uh, working in the public housing complexes. So uh, uh, kudos to you and your team. You have moved the needle in these 35 years or so now. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Commissioner Uribe. Um, Ms. Bryan, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I did make a request with Byron. I would love to sit with you because... I feel like we're a little disconnected because everyone thinks because it's the Orlando Housing Authority, you don't have Section 8 vouchers out in unincorporated Orange County. And you do a lot. And I learned the hard way during hurricane that if they had a Section 8 voucher, HUD was helping them get temporary housing if they lost, if their place was totaled. Yes. So we had lots of families, particularly in Cypress Grove, which is on Weingard, lots of families who had Section 8 vouchers, who lived in bad, deplorable, mold-infested areas for a couple of weeks until FEMA authorized that area. Once we found out, and um, it's Congressman Soto mm -hmm. who informed us, we were able to get them connected with HUD, and they got vouchers sooner than the regular people who were waiting for that FEMA designation. Also, it'd be great to know, um, to just have a little bit more of some of your friendlier complexes, because what we hear a lot, especially after Maria happened in Puerto Rico, people came here with their vouchers and something that we have with our tenants' offices, they weren't, they were like, sorry, we don't have any available, you know? So we saw a bit of discrimination, even though we lost a lot of our power, and I can put you in touch with organizations that were helping, and they were being turned down with their vouchers from Puerto Rico, and some expired because they went a year without finding a place. So to be able to know those rules and maybe friendlier complexes that you deal with right. can help us help our constituents. And we do have a um, we do have a list of properties where property owners contact us and say, I'd like to rent to a Section 8 household. So the, we have that list, but also we have um, a landlord outreach staff that actually um, go out and work with the uh, Institute of Real Estate Management to find properties for our households, especially those that are disabled who, who have special needs. So we do have a landlord outreach there. That. that would be fantastic. And maybe Amy Michaels can get that information sure. too because it has come, come up more, and that's why I told Byron, I said, I want to meet with you sure. because I would love to, one, have your contact so in your office so that we have this issue come up, we can contact you and know that we can contact you. But Amy Michaels with her office has been phenomenal in helping our residents um, also deviate because we're also getting a lot of people whose rents are going up so much mm -hmm. yes. and they work with nonprofits that assist temporarily. They also work with, they have listings of apartments that actually will say, hey, you wanna do 1500 or less? Here's where we can go. So I'm excited to, uh, get that relationship going with you. And look forward to we, talking to you soon because the mayor is telling me to stop talking. Yeah. Thank we you. Look, we look forward so, to it also. Uh, Ms. Bryan, how, how long is the list of people now? How many people on the list to move for public housing? 11,000. And it's been close for two Say that one, one more time. 11,000. Okay, 11, that's why it was difficult, right. yeah. uh, Commissioner Uribe, for people mm -hmm. who 
came from other places, there were already thousands waiting. And our here. households do not move. Right. You know, right. um, folks will say, well, when do you yeah. open up the waiting list and why haven't you called me yet? It's because the households are not moving and we can't offer the units to anybody else until we have a vacancy. So there you go. All right, Commissioner Bonilla. So what you just said, I have a question on that. Why are they not moving? Because like, are, are, like, are, I, I work, I mean, I work, I lived in affordable housing, you know, starting off and, you know, when our income got better, we were able to save up and buy a house and move out. Um, we were fortunate, but what is the situation? I think the cost of buying a house now is a little bit different mm -hmm. and it's not as easy to just get the money to, to save the money to um, to buy a house. And we have done some um, initiatives because we are moving to work to help our households um, save income. And one of them being that we don't do annual re-exams. We do them every three years so that if someone gets a raise on their job, we don't automatically come in and say, give us 30% of your income. But households are not moving because the rents are so high on the private market that if they're paying us $800 and they have to pay $1,500 on the private market, they'll, they'll stay with us. And we have done a lot to modernize our um, apartments. There are some that we're not, we would like to reposition, but um, they have central air, we have secu nighttime security. Um, you know, we do management and maintenance. So uh, I, I want to say that it, it's, a, it's a good deal. Okay, so, so their wages haven't kept up with the increase in housing costs? Well, we only take 30%. In public housing, you don't wage out of public housing. So if you're making $500,000, we just want 30%. So, okay. and, and if someone is, you know, earning that amount of money then, I mean, they would move, but my example is that they pay us 30% of their income, and that's a lot less than what they would have to pay on the private market. Okay. Uh, a a four-bedroom unit on the private market is probably about $2,600 a month. Okay. Well, I definitely would like to get with you um, to do a tour, actually, some of the properties. Sure. Thank All right, Ms. Ms. Bryant, okay. we're going to try to wrap it up so we can take about a 15-minute break before we start again. But yeah. Commissioner Gomez Cadero, I know she had a quick yes, question. Yes, very, very quick. Um, Ms. Vivian, thank you for the information. We're going to get later, you know, mm -hmm. together so we could do whatever. But um, there is no term limit. Like, you know, if somebody live in your home and it could be the, the 10 years, 20 years or forever. No, there's no term limit oh. on uh, public housing there. In Section 8, there's no term limit, but there's an income limit, so to speak. Oh, okay. I, and it's complicated. Okay, but, yeah. so we're going to discuss that later. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Ms. Bryant, for being here uh, and waiting so long to, to get to you. Um, uh, we appreciate your presence. And with that, uh, we're going to go into recess until 2 o'clock, and so we don't have a lot of time. Thank okay. you.
All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the July 25th, 2023 afternoon session of the Orange County Board of County Commission meeting. Uh, we're going to begin uh, with section four under the recommendations of, we're gonna have Mr. Ted Kozak, our chief planner from the zoning division, who will be presenting the July the 6th, 2023 Board of Zoning Adjustment uh, recommendations and with that you're recognized thank you uh, good afternoon mayor and commissioners as you said on July 6 the Board of Zoning Adjustment had a hearing there were 14 cases on that docket four cases were recommended for approval two cases VA 2307042 Blanco and SE 2211 118 Temple and Hempel were recommended for denial five cases the uh, a SE 2306027 Vertical Bridge, VA 2307044, uh, Certified Auto Repair, and that should be ZM, sorry, ZM 2307044, and VA 2305013 Romero, VA 2307046 Haynes, and finally VA 2302154 Big Iron were continued. One case, with VA 2306035 Shirley, was withdrawn. And one case, VA 2307043 Barona, was recommended for denial of variances one and two, approval for three. And VA 2305013, one case, uh, Freeman, was recommended for approval, variance one, denial of variances two, three, and four. The BZA appeal deadline was Friday, July 21st, and two cases were appealed, which included SC 2211-118 Temple and Hempel and VA 2307-043 Barona. The zoning division will be requesting those two appeal cases to be scheduled for public hearings. So with the exception of the BZA cases that were appealed, we request the BCC accept the BZA recommended action and findings. So moved, Scott. Second, you read right. We have a motion by Commissioner Scott, second by Commissioner Uribe. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes uh, and it's unanimous of those present. Uh, let the record reflect Commissioner Bonilla, Commissioner Moore, and Wilson. Commissioner Wilson were not present on that vote. So with that, we're going to move forward on our agenda. We'll move to uh, item A1. And just for the record, in my understanding uh, that this item has been withdrawn. Is that correct, Mr. Blackenard? Yes, sir. You're correct. All right. So we will move then to item A2. We'll open the public hearing on this item, and we're going to ask uh, our Deputy Director of Public Works, Mr. Brett uh, Blackenard, to frame this item. And with that, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. This is petition to vacate. Uh, this petition to vacate is a portion of uh, Willis R. Munger's land plant from and Rebecca Wilson on behalf of WGML Investments Limited and PRN Real Estate Investments Limited. The petitioner requests that Orange County vacate lots 1 through 4, 31 through 33, a portion of lots 29, 30, and a portion of an unopened, unimproved right of way known as Lake Bryan Boulevard, all located in section 27, 24, 28, uh, as recorded in the plat of Willis R. Munger's land of the public records of Orange County, Florida, which contains a total of approximately 47.64 acres. The property lies south of Interstate 4 and east of State Road uh, 535 in District 1. The petitioner wishes to vacate this portion of the plat in order to clear the title to their property. Approval of this request will have no adverse effects in Orange County. Uh, and the Public Works Department has also reviewed this and has no objections. Uh, so our requested action today is approval of the vacation of a portion of Willis R. Munger's land plat. Uh, and I'm here to answer any questions anyone may have. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Blackadar. Is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? My name is Lauren Korn with the Lounge Law Firm, 215 North Eola Drive, Orlando, 32801. I'm here representing the applicant and the owner, uh, just if you have any questions. All right, it doesn't appear to any questions yet, but if you will stand by. Uh, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing at this time. We'll go to the District Commissioner. Commissioner Wilson, so would you like to offer a motion? Second, Gomez. We have a motion by Commissioner Wilson, second by Commissioner Gomez Cadero. <clears throat> All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 
The motion passes, and it is unanimous uh, with all members of the board uh, present for that vote. We'll move to item B3, and we'll open the public hearing on this item, and uh, Mr. Conkle will ask you to frame this item. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing B3 is the Wakiva Reserve Preliminary Subdivision Plan. The subject property, I'll wait for the um, screen. Okay, so. Uh, there we go. There we go. This up now. All right, the, um, the subject property is located north of Votaw Road and east of North Thompson Road. The request is to, get, is to subdivide 28.43 acres and construct 71 single family residential dwelling units. The property is designated low density residential on the future land use map and is zoned R1 single family dwelling district. The aerial shows the surrounding area developed with some similar single family residential subdivisions to the northwest and south. Here is the PSP showing the proposed lots and tracks. The recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the Wakiva Reserve PSP, subject to the conditions listed under the DRC recommendations in the staff report. Mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in District 2. Staff is available for questions. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, is the applicant on this item present? If so, uh, representative, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? Okay. Okay, he's indicating no comments, but uh, he's available. So stand by for a moment. Uh, do we have members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? I have no speaker cards for this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing and we'll go to the district commissioner. Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer a motion? Yeah, we had like 40 people at a community meeting, so this is quite an accomplishment. So I'll be happily make a motion to approve. Second you, Rebeam. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes, and it is unanimous. All right, and we're going to move forward then to the next item on our agenda, and this is uh, item C4, and it's my understanding there was a, a little bit of a problem with the advertisement, so that item is being canceled for today, and it'll be uh, re-advertised and rescheduled. Uh, what date is it, are we looking at potentially coming back? We're looking at, Mayor, either August 22nd, 2 p.m., August 22nd, or 2 p.m., September 12th. All right, so those details will have to be flushed out. Correct. But it's canceled for today. Uh, we'll uh, move to the next item, D5. Uh, at this time, we'll open the public hearing on this item. And we're going to have Ms. Elisa Barbara Torres, the Chief Planner from the Transportation Planning Division, She's coming forward and will present this item. And with that, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, as the Mayor mentioned, Alyssa Barbara Torres with the Transportation Planning Division uh, to present a, a Amendment 2023 to the ETRAN 1. This is a proposed amendment to Map 1 of Orange County's 2010 2030 Comprehensive Plan to reflect changes in project status, such as projects being constructed add the proposed Sunshine Corridor rail alignment and remove the alternative mobility area per the board's adoption of uh, the ordinance listed here last year, along with other updates I will highlight for you briefly. Um, the proposed amendment schedule is depicted here and the local planning agency uh, voted to transmit the proposed amendment uh, on June 15th unanimously. We anticipate state and regional agency comments in August and are bringing this back um, in September and October should the board uh, again choose to transmit the amendment. The adoption schedule is depicted there. So this is a countywide amendment and reflects a number of projects and updates uh, throughout the districts uh, for convenience in the staff report. These are generally highlighted by area and I'm happy to answer any questions about them at any time. So the amendment is an largely an administrative update to reflect prior BCC decisions and project completion. It's part of an ongoing county coordination effort for regional transit projects, of many of which the board is involved in and familiar with, uh, including the potential application to the Federal Transit Administration for federal funding for these uh, county and regional partnerships. 
And I'll note uh, for the board, of course, uh, your proposed Vision 2050 uh, amendment does include a LRTP map to the year 2050 uh, that would be separate from this update. And uh, there's some additional coordination that we will be doing uh, should the board choose to transmit um, between these two map products um, before the adoption stage. So what would the amendment do? It would update uh, for Sunshine Corridor and inner city rail projects, and the various segments are described here in more detail uh, for the board's consideration. It would also make other minor updates based on project status, and we uh, did update those map labels uh, since the LPA's public hearing, not trying to make too many changes from the version that they recommended to you, uh, but did want to note that uh, for the board's information. And we're also updating transportation projects to reflect their status, uh, those by the Florida Department of Transportation and the Central Florida Expressway Authority. We're also, for uh, clarity, consolidating various county project LRTP designations. So instead of having planned and program projects separated out, we would be identifying as planned or county partnership. And this allows more flexibility in terms of the timing of projects uh, when the funding is in place, uh, again, given some of the board's, um, of course, knowledge of the funding constraints under which the county operates. We'd also be updating county transportation projects um, to reflect their status, and this is the completion of projects, for example, like the Holden Extension or others that have come forward uh, since the last update of the LRTP. And again, it would remove the alternative mobility area boundary consistent with the board's prior decisions. So highlighted on the screen is the currently adopted uh, map one. Uh, again, just because of the magnitude of changes, wanted to make sure that the board and the public has access to both uh, to note those revisions. And here is the proposed map one before you today. So our staff recommendation is to um, make a finding that the proposed amendment has the potential to be found in compliance as defined under statutes and transmit amendment 2023-2 BTRAN1 to the state reviewing agencies. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions and I know we have other staff here as well uh, to support the board's consideration. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you uh, for the presentation at this point. Um, this is an administrative item, so it's not an applicant, but do we have any members of the public present who should be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, then we will. Okay. I don't have a. Okay. D5. D5. D is in Delta D5. Okay. State your name and address for the record, please. You'll have two minutes. All right. Eugene Staccato, uh, 331 Roswell Avenue. It's kind of a question. It says remove uh, the mobility area, add the rail. It seems like it's a more broad language when you say mobility area versus a rail. You, you have defined this to be a rail. So maybe it's informational. I'm not sure if there's a real difference, but just making sure. Okay, is there a technical difference there that needs to be noted? Oh, if, if, thank you for that comment. Again, I'm always happy to hear from the public on these important items. Um, in this sense, of course, the comprehensive plan for a number of years had a designated alternative mobility area under which the county promoted various mobility options um, through things like um, differential impact fee rates. Some of the board's regulatory updates since that time have um, made the AMA designation and its corresponding policies moot. So in 2022, 22, the board chose to revoke those policies, again, adopt impact fee updates, and make a more coordinated set of improvements to promote all the board's transportation goals. So it, we already have removed the AMA designation from a corresponding map in the comprehensive plan that was dedicated to that purpose, and not removing it from the LRTP as well is, in essence, an oversight. So, of course, in the, the 2030 comprehensive plan and in the proposed 2050 comprehensive plan, there are a number of policies that uh, would achieve similar goals and that reflect uh, the current approaches uh, from a policy perspective. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about those or point to specific policies that achieve those objectives. Okay. All right. So uh, what I'm hearing you say is not necessarily at this time to make a distinction. Yes. Okay. 
All right. Uh, with that, uh, then we'll close the public hearing portion at this time. Uh, do we have a motion for approval? So moved. Wilson. Second, Gomez. Uh, moved by Commissioner Wilson, self second by Commissioner Gomez Cadero. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes and it is unanimous. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move to the next item on our agenda, and this is item uh, F6, uh, A, B, and C. Uh, we'll open the public hearing on this item, and we're going to have Mr. Jason Sorensen, our chief planner from the plan planning division, come forward to frame this item. Mr. Sorensen, you're recognized. All right, thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, commissioners. This next item is a future land use amendment and rezoning. This is a small scale adoption hearing. The request is to go from low density residential to institutional and a rezoning from R1 to PD. And the proposal is a museum and associated uses. This is located on dis in District 5 on North Tanner Road. It's already an existing museum uh, for the Vietnam War Museum and they're uh, trying to be a become a conforming use. So they're going through this process. Again, the future land use is currently low density residential. The proposed future land use is institutional. The current zoning is R1, and the proposed zoning is PD. This is uh, an image of the land use plan, and it shows the uses as museum as well as associated uses. There are three waivers from Orange County Code uh, regarding boundary setbacks and a parking surface to allow unimproved, unimproved surface parking in lieu of improved surface. A community meeting was held on Wednesday, April 25th with 20 residents in attendance with general questions regarding the project and overall support for the request. 291 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 1,000 feet from the subject parcel. To date, we have received two responses in opposition and none in favor. At the local planning agency adoption hearing on June 15th, there was one speaker present to speak in favor of the request. The local planning agency is recommending adoption of the proposed future land use map amendment and associated ordinance and approval of the all veterans of Central Florida plan development subject to 12 conditions of approval, including three waivers from Orange County Code. Staff is available for any questions. All right, thank you. Is the applicant or representative of the applicant president, if so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? Good afternoon, Sarah Meyer with Dewberry, uh, 800 North Magnolia Avenue, Orlando, Florida, here on behalf of the Vietnam and All Veterans of Central Florida group. I'm just happy to answer any questions you might have. It's been a real pleasure working with staff um, and their guidance through this process. All right, uh, thank you. Then uh, stand by for few moments, if you don't mind. Uh, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? I have no speaker cards, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing and we'll go to the District Commissioner, Commissioner Bonilla, for a potential motion or comments. Yes, I'd just like to say that, you know, this is a museum not too many people know about, and even the people who live on that street don't even know that it's a museum right there on their same street. Um, so I'll go ahead and move to approve. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion uh, by Commissioner Bonilla, second by Commissioner Gomez Cordero. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, thank you uh, for your presence here today. We're going to move to the next item on our agenda this afternoon, and this is item uh, G7, A, B, C, and D. We'll open up this item for public uh, discussion or for the public hearing. And uh, Mr. Sorensen, we'll look to you to frame this item as well. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this next item is an adoption public hearing. The request is a future land use map amendment to go from village to growth center, plan development, commercial, medium density residential, as well as a rezoning request to go from A1 to PD. The development program proposed is 296 multifamily dwelling units and up to 87,120 square feet of C1 retail commercial district uses. Associated with this request is a text amendment to record the development program into future land use element policy flu 8.1.4. This is the fourth of four public hearings for this item, and we have not received any state or regional agency comments. Again, we're in District 1. 
The subject property is located just south of Grove Blossom Way on the west side of Avalon Road. The current future land use is Village. The proposed future land use is Grove Center, Plan Development, Commercial, Medium Density Residential. The current zoning is A1, and the proposed zoning is PD. This is the proposed land use plan showing the commercial uses located on the northeast portion of the subject property. There are five waivers associated with this request. Four waivers are associated to building height to allow five stories and 65 feet in lieu of three stories, 40 feet. And there is one waiver for parking to allow 1.43 spaces in lieu of 1.5 for efficiency in one bedroom units and 1.9 spaces in lieu of two spaces for two or three bedroom units. A virtual community meeting was held on May 12th, 2022 with one resident in attendance who raised no objections to the request. 703 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 1,500 feet from the subject parcel. To date, we have received no responses in favor or in opposition to the request. There is one condition of approval that is proposed to be added to the list of conditions. This condition would require a road agreement for the conveyance of 30 feet of right-of-way prior to or concurrently with the approval of the first preliminary subdivision plan or development plan. At the local planning agency adoption hearing, there were no members of the public present to speak on the request. The local agency plan, planning agency is recommending adoption of the proposed future land use map and text amendment and approval of the Village of Avalon plan development subject to 20 conditions of approval plus the one condition as presented, including five waivers from Orange County Code. And staff is available for any questions. All right. Um, is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to come forward? All right. See movement. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Rebecca Wilson, 215 North Eola Drive here on behalf of the owner. We agree with the staff report. Joel, I just had one question on the new condition. I guess the second sentence appears to be a restatement of the code. And I just didn't know if that's actually necessary. Obviously, we have to comply with, with the code. Uh, we would prefer to just keep it as it was proposed to the commissioners. Okay, but if the code section changes between now and the DP, we don't comply with the city code, I mean the county code, we comply well, with I think our condition? If the code section is changed, then I think it says as it may be amended. So okay. that that would take over from there. And, and we're fine. I mean, the way I read it, it's locking in the price that's paid today. We, well, it's, it's locking it in as outlined and in the road impact fee ordinance that's locking in the value. It, it's, it's con what's, what's set forth there in the condition um, basically aligns with what the code requires, what the, what the road impact fee ordinance requires. Right? I, yes, which I yeah. guess is why I'm understand. Yeah. I just don't understand why we're restating the code in our conditions of approval. But if well, that's what gets me out of here today with a favorable yeah, vote, think, Joel, I'm fine with yeah, it. I, I, just, I, think that I, I just don't think it's a... I mean, so does that mean I don't have to comply with the other codes because they're not stated in the condition of approval? That, that's just what I got nervous about. I, I understand it, but you know that that's what's been proposed by the staff, and, and I think we're that's what we're going to recommend to the board. Okay. All right. Um, Happy to answer any other questions. Okay. All right. Well, uh, stand by. Do we have members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? And no speaker cards for this item, Mayor. All right. And then we're going to close the public hearing at this time. And we'll go to the district commissioner, Commissioner Wilson. Any questions, comments, or do you have a potential uh, only, motion? Only quick one about the um, redundancy. You know, they mountain climbers. They talk about redundancy keeping us all safe. So maybe we'll just go with that. <laughs> I don't know. With the, um, but with that, I'll make a motion for the um, recommendation. Second, Gomez. All right, we have a motion and a second by Commissioner Gomez Cadero. All, um, <clears throat> all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes, and it is unanimous.
All right, with that, we're going to move to the next item. Um, this is item E8A, uh, and we'll open a public hearing on this item, and we'll ask Mr. Alberto Vargas, uh, Vargas, uh, to <laughs> Vargas. <laughs> Uh, uh. All right, so, Alberto, you're up. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, it is my honor to be here in front of you this afternoon to present 2023 1C CP1 Vision 2050 Compound Amendment. As you recall, this is a continuation of the April 4th um, uh, public hearing where um, you um, asked us to engage with the, with the residents of, of the county and we will detail that uh, incredible experience. Back, uh, the background information will be presented as part of the first item uh, of the outline of the presentation today. I will follow up with um, that experience of the public awareness uh, engagement uh, summary and um, I will follow with the notable changes. I will hi that will be the highlight of today's uh, public hearing. Uh, since it, this is a continuation, you have already received the, most of the changes in the comprehensive plan draft, and today's uh, public hearing will be about the highlight of those notable changes. I'll close with the timeline and the requested action. I'll, I'll start with, um, with the vision statement uh, Vision 2050 recognizes the diversity of people and places in planning for the future to ensure that growth and development occur in a resilient, sustainable, equitable, and inclusive manner that will preserve the natural resources, establish neighborhoods, and create vibrant communities that are attractive to residents, businesses, and visitors alike. We're going back six years, uh, back in January uh, 2017, when we started the policy cleanup, uh, started with the base data research about existing conditions throughout the county that created an analysis as the base for our planning, uh, the growth management planning effort here. Uh, we started um, also a robust um, inter-divisional coordination at that time. All the way to September 20. Um, through uh, July 2021, uh, we started the public outreach efforts uh, with surveys. We created the web page, which is the landing page uh, for Vision 2050, with specific surveys that were uh, responded by residents that engaged. And we also started, as you recall, the first round of town hall meetings that were vir uh, virtual in nature with, throughout the pandemic time frame. From June 2021, through July 2021, that, that month uh, was critical, uh, where you requested um, a specific focus group and coordination, and we also conducted some design charrettes. Um, these are um, small area studies, if you would, more specifically for the Boggy Creek uh, Corridor in District 4, uh, Pine Hills um, in uh, District 6, and Lockhart uh, in District 2. That took us to um, August um, 2021 through uh, a year later in July 2022 where we conducted special BCC meetings in this room um, outside the regular uh, Board of County Commissioners meetings. Uh, we had quite a bit of intercoordination, interdepartmental coordination of the draft as it developed. And we uh, also conducted many uh, advisory board engagements at that time. Between May and April, uh, May 2022 and April, a year later, uh, 2023, uh, we continued the ongoing research and, and outreach efforts. Um, we did um, briefings with you one-on-one -on -one, uh, per chapter. All 10 chapters of, of the comprehensive plan were presented with all subject matter experts and the stewards of each one of those chapters. Um, we did bring this to LPA um, in uh, March of 2023 uh, with a recommendation for approval. Uh, that took us to, um, um, that was in March of 2023 LPA up to April um, 11th, which is when the public hearing started and it was continued to today for transmittal purposes. 
So uh, the public awareness and engagement summary. Uh, this may be a familiar um, representation for all of you who uh, attended and were part of uh, many of these meetings. Um, this is uh, the best that we could do to be able to capture the, uh, the dynamics of each one of those meetings um, conducted in every uh, district uh, commission boundary uh, with focus areas to engage the residents to discuss the specifics of the comprehensive plan framework. We had a total of 22 town hall meetings. Um, <coughs> That was divided into uh, 12 weeks, which averaged just about two per week. Um, with the help of our communication uh, department, uh, we, we uh, engaged in digital uh, efforts to communicate to the public about what was going on. 97 postings, 132,000 impressions, which means that um, there were a number of times that users may be able to see what's posted online. Uh, we had over a thousand engagements, which is uh, when when residents and others that may be interested in what's going on in Orange County are able to give us some level of feedback. Uh, from the mayor's office, we uh, received three uh, newsletters, and with your help and your individual offices, commissioners, um, you did some e-blasts to uh, local residents, as we did as well. So that ended up uh, being a total of 10 from our office and, and 22 from yours for each one of those particular uh, town hall meetings. That ended up uh, in a total of just over 500, or you can see the specifics there, 479 uh, residents that participated in all, all, 12, all 22 town hall meetings. Uh, the type of comments that we received in person, just under 400, as you can see, displayed on the screen here. Um, 78 uh, of them were from the interactive mapping uh, effort uh, that residents were able to either do during the town hall meetings or at their own um, leisure after the meetings. And we also received several emails um, that were responded to. That leads to um, a total of 513 comments. That it, it is our responsibility to be able to respond to those and we needed to categorize those particular uh, comments. And this is the way that we categorize them. Um, we highlighted specific changes that were notable. Those are the ones that we will discuss today. Um, many of those changes or, or those um, comments were for clarification purposes. We either didn't provide the right uh, specific uh, details of what the intent of the policy or it was a misinterpretation by the reader or the resident that was asking about it. So we clarified those um, and the, uh, the last one our suggestions uh, that may uh, be well intended, but not necessarily um, part of Vision 2050. So we um, and, and and they just uh, this is these are just general examples under the change category. Here we heard loud and clear about hamlets and villages where they should happen and uh, where they should not happen, and uh, where perhaps uh, clusters should be considered. Uh, that was a notable change that we'll discuss today. Um, clarifications is how does the Orange County uh, Vision 2050 interacts with jurisdictions and we have we make quick reference about uh, JPAs um, and interlocal agreements and other um, quarterly meetings that we have with uh, other jurisdictions to continue to express the policies and the intent so that there are no drastic changes between um, you know corridors or uh, areas of uh, drastic um, Evolution or transformation, we we have been um, organizing some of some of those as we continue to coordinate with jurisdictions. And then suggestions. Uh, one example is I would I would like uh, Orange County to be the leader in um, reducing, composing, and, and um, increasing, I guess, in recycling. So those are the types of um, comments that we receive uh, here um, in in all all 22 town hall meetings. This is uh, a quick summary of, of um, uh, per, per each one of the districts um, what, what took place in District 1. Um, we had three town hall meetings, uh, 56 residents were in attendance on all three of them. We received 45 comments. Uh, District 2, um, two meetings uh, with different focus areas, however, um, it, it discussed in all, both of those meetings, uh, di almost four 
or five different focus areas within those, those, those uh, two meetings, so it was very intensive. Uh, 56 uh, comments were received, 41 residents were in attendance. Districts three, we had five town hall meetings, 78 uh, residents were in attendance. We received about 96 comments. Um, from those, district four, we had three town hall meetings in that district, um, 35 attendees and uh, 34 comments altogether. District five, we had six town hall meetings uh, altogether throughout the effort. 245 attendees and 118 comments were received from District 5. District 6, uh, we had two town hall meetings, 26 attendees and 36 comments altogether. So the top comments that were received were uh, in, the, in the topic of uh, land views were high uh, engagement about densities and about concerns of areas of transformation, evolution, and growth, um, so we had very good engagement with residents about that, uh, attempted to convey the framework of Vision 2050 and how it's addressing those particular sectors and place types. Changes to neighborhoods, if any uh, were existing, uh, neighborhoods are meant to be preserved. Uh, rural and agricultural land uses was extensively discussed and um, maintaining the character of existing neighborhoods uh, that were historic or mostly developed um, was also a very important point of uh, discussion with many of the residents, including in District 3, that was a common topic of discussion. Um, mobility, uh, all modes of, of transportation were discussed about the, the character of what needs to happen, not only, not only in the infrastructure to allow for walkability to take place, all components included. Um, the connections, interconnectivity within the different um, neighborhoods, uh, biking trails, and uh, safety was also very important, and Vision 2050 covers a lot of that in the transportation uh, chapter, including Vision Zero. Um, the transportation topic um, about capacity, technology, and traffic, uh, there was another very important topic discussed, infrastructure as it relates to stormwater. Uh, water, sewer, and utilities, um, as well as funding and implementation. If we're growing, how are things going to be balanced here? Um, sustainability, uh, good, good engagements uh, about uh, solid waste, composts, and, and trees um, as we continue to grow and uh, incorporate tree canopies along areas that are going to be experienced by pedestrians. And the last one, uh, it's about preservation, um, natural environment. Um, how are we going to be um, the balance between growth and the preservation of uh, the importance of um, the natural conditions, natural environment, uh, and environmental protection? And open space was a big one as well. Not only existing um, community parks, but also as we continue to grow, how are we... Uh, expecting other types of open spaces to be incorporated in the context of uh, neighborhoods and centers um, altogether. So th this is a, a summary of um, the, the number of uh, topics that were collected by the residents. Um, as you can see, most of the uh, comments in the notable uh, changes uh, land under the uh, land use um, topic and uh, most of the clarifications as well. So this gives you just a general snapshot, snapshot of the actual summary of um, the public engagement, the comments that we received and how we handled them. So what about the response methodology? We did a, I'll let you decide how um, well of a job um, staff uh, conducted in this, but we, our responsibility was really um, to, to be able to coordinate the meetings, um, receive the comments from the residents, as well as uh, listen to the residents and be able to prepare responses to some of the comments. So after the town, halls, town hall meetings were conducted, we diligently and as fast as we could on a two, two week per, uh, I'm sorry, two meetings per week basis in the 12 week time period, uh, uh, summarized what took place in each one of the town hall meetings, uh, general topics that were discussed, number of attendees for that particular meeting, as well as the number of comments that we received. And we just didn't collect the comments, but we 
also put together a response to each one of those comments. Uh, the response to the comments were also um, uh, available for uh, residents in the web page, um, and, um, and they were also emailed to those residents in attendance. That helped um, inform uh, one of the most content, constant requests, which is the, um, the user guide, and it is uh, basically the very first one notable change that I would like to highlight. Uh, the, the user guide is intended to, to serve as, a, as an addendum once we adopt Vision 2050, once you adopt Vision 2050 and, and, and highlight, it will be able to highlight all the key plan components and assist those, the reader, to be able to navigate through the comprehensive plan. So this is a quick reference, if you would, but more importantly, a user guide to the comprehensive plan as displayed on the screen right here. Um, number two of the notable changes um, has to do in, it really is focused in chapter one. And it is land use related, and it is the, the request to remove um, hamlets and rural villages concepts. Those are under the neighborhood place types. Um, th those particular changes are affected um, nine different policies within Chapter 1, um, including the correlation table. Um, one point of, of reference here is that the rural cluster um, is not going to be removed because it will only be applicable in the northwest market area as per the draft in front of you today. So that was the, the request um, that is in front of you for um, notable change number two. Notable change number three is uh, also in chapter one, policy element 157, and it refines uh, the density calculation description and removes the reference to specific wetland classification, and this is to be consistent to the pending changes that are currently taking place in Chapter 15 update um, of the Wetland Ordinance. We have, we have, we have also added uh, criteria for residential densities that fall uh, below the prescribed minimums. Uh, this is um, a constant um, message and, and concern that we heard um, from many residents in District 3 um, regarding um, how development will be compatible to existing abutting neighborhoods um, along the corridors and along centers that may be part of the long um, or, or, or of the future land use map. And um, we, we are focusing on the minimum densities because th these are certain place types or, or future land uses that require minimum densities. And sometimes minimum densities are, may not be met because they could adversely impact the character of the surrounding property, so we have uh, modified that to allow for an application to be reviewed at the staff level if they, are, if they do not meet the minimum density once the compatibility measure is applied so that um, uh, a certain re minim uh, the minimum reduction to that minimum is, um, is presented as part of their development program. The minimum density, uh, if the minimum density cannot be achieved due to the existing size of the parcel, for example, is another area where we um, are, are able to analyze the application and then allow it to move forward for review internally at the staff level. And then uh, when a minimum density cannot be achieved without an administrative or board waiver, we're trying to avoid as many waivers as uh, necessary once Orange Code is in place here. So, those are the, um, the, the specific um, changes to policy element 157. We discussed in, in great detail about maximum densities as well, and we have the opportunity to analyze and further evaluate uh, an application um, not, not having to reach the maximum density if there are compatibility um, concerns with the abo immediate abutting uh, residential neighborhoods that may be established. Another point that I'd like to highlight here, Mayor and Commissioners, is the fact that Orange Code plays a very critical role in, in addressing compatibility measures here. The transition between higher buildings and, and established neighborhoods, the residential neighborhoods at the scale that they are, there are compatibility standards that well, would have to be met when two transect zones are abutting each other. So it doesn't, there is no, not a drastic uh, impact in terms of building heights. 
Um, notable change number four is uh, also in chapter one, policy element 158, and it is the revision of existing alternative student housing density calculations due to the increased UCF regional center densities. This is one of uh, two uh, regional centers in uh, the framework of Vision 2050, the second highest dense um, and intense uh, regional center in the county, and therefore um, the, this particular requirement of to do a density analysis is no longer necessary due to the densities that this particular future land use offers. Um, the criteria for the required mobility plan um, has been retained, however, for, for uh, applications to go through. Uh, notable change number five, also in chapter one, as you recall during our April 11th meeting, uh, transmittal public hearing, many comments came to us regarding rural centers, uh, concerns that rural centers were created, uh, concerns about densities that were uh, inconsistent w w of rural centers within rural settlements, and we were able to clarify um, that concern via the engagement of um, the, the town hall meetings, actually. This is the result of, of one of them in Lake Avalon Rural Settlement, where we discussed that um, the previously uh, proposed maximum density of two dwelling units an acre within uh, rural centers are no longer um, allowed, this will be removed, and it would only allow for one dwelling unit that will be integrated in um, per every commercial building. So we will be watching very carefully um, the density uh, disruption here, but it will only be allowed for one. For example, you would be able to have a, a uh, an owner of a bakery uh, living above that particular uh, bakery, if that's, a, that's one of the opportunities there, or a coffee shop or something like that. So that's what came out of this particular amendment right here. Um, number six is uh, mixed use place type uh, changes to the uh, cut sheets is what we call them. This, uh, these are the sheets that are also in chapter one where we describe each one of the place types. It describes the intent. And it, it makes the reflection here that um, there may be some existing single-use um, operations or projects that are, that are limited to, to expand immediately. So we recognize that this will be uh, a change over time, and they will not be required to integrate any other uses within their single use. We made that as a, a consistent statement on all all of the mixed use uh, place types identified on the screen. Notable change number seven is the suburban mixed neighborhood place type that happens to be also in chapter one, um, and it is the removal of the commercial um, and office land use from the list of allowable uses within uh, the correlation table of, of this particular place type. This is a new future land use mixed, suburban mixed neighborhood and um, what it means is that it will only allow for a diversity of product types within the, the, the uh, neighborhoods where this would be allowed. It would not allow for a commercial or an office land use to be integrated. This would be uh, addressing the concern of local impacts within those established neighborhoods as well. Um, there, there were um, number eight is uh, some minor revisions to the mobility and transportation related policies. M most of this is a cleanup from what you what you have already received. Various goals and objectives and policies in chapter one. Uh, under specific goal number six in uh, chapter um, uh, one and, and chapter seven were modified in order to better align the ge general. Um, uh, perspective, if you would, of integrating mobility in, with land uses and neighborhoods. Um, so chapter seven is the transportation element, and this, this is lining up with some of the specific improvement provisions. You can see some um, highlighted on the screen here. I'm not going to go over all of those with you, but they're basically specific changes of deletions and, and corrections that uh, needs to happen in order to make um, all of those um, alignments between uh, mobility as a standalone incorporated uh, goal in, in chapter one and chapter seven as what would otherwise be the transportation element itself. These are all the changes highlighted on the screen here. Uh, number nine out of 10 
is the minor revision to uh, public schools and, and other related policies. Um, this is uh, an ongoing coordination with um, OCPS and um, staff and, um, and the county attorney's office of uh, cleanup to chapter eight public schools and three um, policies in chapter 10, implementation and property rights. Um, they have been coordinated, they're highlighted on the screen here, and they're part of your notable change uh, notebook. We also, number 10 is uh, updates to all the exhibits in the transportation map series. Um, these are edits that are consistent with the completed transportation chapter data and analysis uh, in draft form. Uh, we have been able to uh, use the, the TAC methodology to update and for the forecast of residential and non-residential travel demands to the year 2050 here, and uh, that led to the updates to the long-range transportation plan uh, by utilizing Vision 2050's framework in order to inform the update to uh, map number one, which is, which is um, 2050 long-range transportation plan. Um, as identified here, this is in draft form with other minor, ch minor changes that may come up between transmittal and adoption. Mayor and commissioners, this is our web page. It continues to be um, very active and continues to be updated um, on, a, on a weekly basis almost. Um, you have access to the interactive map here, which is very informational. We use it all the time. And we also have uh, access to the drafts that are in front of you, uh, including Orange Code, which um, will be our focus in the next um, several months. Next uh, steps and timeline, um, Transmittal um, it will benefit um, the, the review of the Department of uh, Commerce. This is the new DEO in uh, the state of Florida. And other uh, state reviewing agencies, they will give us comments once we transmit. Um, it will present the statutory requirements th that are being met per this particular draft. Uh, it will, transmittal will allow for time to refine any policy or maps and any other further uh, uh, changes that will incorporate, that will need to be incorporated as we receive board and residence input between transmittal and adoption. Um, we also uh, would allow for some time after transmittal to really focus on what we continue to hear is a, a very detailed area of, of um, interest, which is Orange Code. It would allow us to complete Orange Code and, and all the related uh, updated code chapters. With that, we can't wait to get there um, and allow for um, extended public engagement and outreach uh, mechanisms and technologies. We, you have received also some references to GRIDX, which is going to combine everything that we have right now in uh, the draft form of, um, of Orange Code to be able to be accessible um, via an electronic uh, format as well. This is the timeline um, where, where we're at today, um, July 25th. This is the transmittal public hearing. Uh, after transmittal, we send it um, to, the, to the state for their review, um, we come back for LPA and adoption uh, public hearing in uh, the August, uh, um, October, November timeframe. And uh, they would recommend um, either way for adoption to the Board of County Commissioners, which we anticipate happening in December of 2023, along with, um, with uh, Orange Code. Um, adoption as well during that time frame, which will be concurrent. I would like to add that there is a time uh, training period, so the effective date, even though it could be for 30 days, it could be expanded to 120 days after adoption for the purpose of, um, of training not only staff but any uh, entity that may be interested in, in the navigation of the framework. In summary, uh, Vision 2050 uses smart growth strategies to shape the planning framework and outlines a roadmap for a countywide sustainable future growth. Um, extensive coordination, as you know, has taken place. Uh, the comp plan prioritizes the diversity of the county, focuses on livability, resiliency, environmental protection, economic opportunity, housing needs, which you heard quite a bit this morning, uh, and uh, for safe transportation and mobility options. It is organic, and it will continue to change over time. 
um, every seven years, we are required to submit those um, am amendments or changes to policies that are not performing well to the state. The comp plan amendment is uh, consistent uh, with the current comprehensive plan you heard and received all of the specific references during our April um, 11th meeting, tr transmittal public hearing, uh, when it started. And um, with that, um, mayor and commissioners, the requested staff uh, recommends transmittal. Local planning agency recommendation is to transmit. The requested action is to make findings that are uh, proposed to the proposed amendment um, as further amended today is sufficient and complete and is consistent with the current Orange County Comprehensive Plan 2010-2030, Destination 30, and Transmit Amendment 2023-1C, CP1, to the state reviewing agencies. I'd be more than glad to answer any questions, and I have an army of staff <laughs> with me to help also address some of those questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And All right. Um, I brought it to, uh, to the team. Uh, you all have done Yoma's work just to uh, get it to this point. A lot of staff work has gone into this and input from our residents. And I know that we have made modifications over time uh, as we have listened uh, from those various town hall meetings and other meetings to get input from our citizens. So um, we'll see where it takes us at this point. Um, this is an administrative item that uh, the state requires, um, as has been indicated. Um, but what we will do is open it up at this time for additional public uh, comment or input. And so uh, do we have any members of the public present <laughs> who yes, wish Mayor. to be heard on this item? Mayor, I have 30 speaker cards. OK, so it's kind of like a repeat of this morning. I think we have 45 speakers this morning. So the only thing that we ask is if there's an opportunity for some of you, if uh, you have similar comments, um, try to consolidate it. I think that that helps, that helps the situation out. If you can consolidate some of your comments, uh, to, we, we get it. If you're going to say the same thing, it's not necessary for us to hear the same thing uh, over and over, but we do want to hear the input from our residents. And so... Uh, with that, we're going to open it up now, and uh, each speaker will be given a couple of minutes uh, to make your comments, and uh, we'll start. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, our first speaker is Kelly Samaran, and you have six uh, others that are dedicating one minute to you. So um, what I'll do is I'll call off those folks that are dedicating their time. So please just raise your hand if I call your name. Okay, well, we, we don't want to get into all of that. If she's not here, we're going to go to the next speaker. <laughs> all right. Um, so I'll just keep that cluster together. Okay. So is there another spokesperson for the, that group that yielded time? I just put her in the back of the line. I'll put her later. Okay. All right. Um, so let's move to the, to the next. All right. Okay. Next, Wait next. a minute. I see someone standing up here. Well, the next speaker. Okay. Well, I'll read off the rest of the cards. I have a whole bunch more. Okay. Uh, so the going in, in groups of uh, four: uh, Mike Bustelos, Matthew Verbka, David Martins, and uh, Laura Betts. If you can walk over to the other side, you'll have two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record. Please, you'll have two minutes. Uh, my name is David Martins. I live at 229 East Amelia Street in downtown Orlando. I'm here today representing Orange Preservation Trust, a nonprofit organization that provides leadership for preservation and revitalization of diverse historic resources in Orange County, Florida, and advocates for their appreciation, protection, and use. As a board member, I would like to read a letter from our president, Raymond Cox, to Mayor Demings and the commissioner. Commissioners, I am writing on behalf of Orange Preservation Trust. 
with regards to proposed elements in the Orange County Vision 2050 Comprehensive Plan. As a historic preservation advocacy group, <clears throat> we are very encouraged to see once again that there is recognition and recommendations that promote the inclusion of policy for the creation of a department to oversee historical cultural resources in Orange County. While the current comp plan includes language for preservation, it, it was never adopted into Orange County code. There has been a long-standing void for codified protection of historic resources in not only unincorporated Orange County, but also in non-CLG municipalities in the county. Statistics from the National Trust for Historic Preservation demonstrates that public economic investment in preservation can return a tenfold private investment Heritage tourism is also a huge economic engine in local economies nationwide and has been credited for the rebirth of once depressed areas. Historic preservation also creates a sense of community, pride, through unifying identity. Additionally, support of preservation rehabilitation creates specific skill sets among the building trade and also supports green sustainability. Initiatives by keeping demolition debris from being transported to and from sitting uh, landfills. In conclusion, Orange Preservation Trust's opinion is that your support, as well as the support from the county commissioners, to again include these historic preservation recommendations in the 2050 Vision Comp Plan will go a long way in continuing Orange County's stated goals that ensures sustainable land development and preserves the character of existing communities celebrates Orange County's diversity and creates vibrant places to live, Mr. work, Martins, and relax. You are out of time. 20 more okay. seconds, please. So, no, you're out of time. What OPT so would like have, to know is how Ms. these Martins, proposed policies you're will be out of, You're out of order. And will there be a defined timeline for each? Okay, so we, we are going to stick to the, to the two minutes. Okay, and we just ask that you be respectful of the time that's allotted uh, for everyone here. Thank you so much. And Mr. Martins, um, I think we do have the written uh, correspondence, so if, if it hasn't been sent to the entire uh, commission, we'll get it to them. So thank you very much for your presence. All right. All right, we're going to move to the next speaker. Um, Mike Bustillos. Afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Musios. I live out in Winter Garden, 34787. Hi. Uh, thoughts on Vision 2050. I really like it here in Orlando, in Orange County. I would like to stay here. I've been here almost 20 years now, 20 years in a month or so. Graduated from University of Central Florida. Go Knights. I genuinely really like it here. I know that you guys know it isn't perfect. Uh, I wish we had a little bit of better public transit options. Uh, I wish I could walk to a bookstore from my apartment. That would be pretty nice. Uh, I really wish that my rent was more affordable. Uh, I am in the fortunate position that I can actually afford $2,700 for a tutu, but I could be putting a lot of that money aside to save for a house. That'd be kind of nice. Uh, I'd rather be doing that than you know just enriching my corporate landlords. Uh, Orange County is expecting a sizable fraction of a million new people, like a non-zero fraction of a million people in the next generation. And uh, at the current rate, I am going to be priced out of my own neighborhood, like so many people that I know have been. And I would love to be able to invite all my friends and my family and the people that I love most to come live here in Orange County, to move out of the you know, out of the areas where they're at and like all of, have us all together in one spot and a lot of them genuinely can't afford it. Uh, I want to live in a condo that sits over local businesses. I don't want to have to drive my car every single day. Uh, I want like a lot of things and I know all of that is not in Vision 2050. I know Vision 2050 isn't everything but it feels like a good start. Uh, the more flexible zoning, the missing middle housing, pedestrian infrastructure, gentle density, these are all things that I really want for Orange County, and I think Vision 2050 is an important step in the right direction. I want to see Orange County grow to meet the demands of the 21st century. I know you do too. I encourage you to vote yes on transmitting Vision 2050. Thank you. 
All right, thank you for your comments. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Hi, um, Hi. hello, uh, commissioners and mayor. Uh, so I'm here today to tell you how much um, <clears throat> we appreciate the work that the planning ha staff has done in implementing a lot of the issues um, regarding climate change and um, systemic racism and things like that that were in the past code. We know that the frontline communities and disadvantaged communities are the ones that are going to feel the brunt of climate change, and so we cannot plan uh, for the future like we did in the past. Things have to happen. And so I've been meeting with them for a long time. Um, Lori, Carrie, um, they've addressed every one of our concerns now. And they've put many of our concerns in the document, and we're grateful for that. But the work is unfinished. At this point, we want to make sure that the work that's being done with the East uh, Central Planning Council and the work that there's lots of grants out there that's coming forward, that all of that work also gets codified and put into the code. And we're also asking that um, for the code, that specifically there's the same type of outreach, maybe not as much, but where um, community organizations that are uh, familiar with the flooding and familiar with some of the things that um, are most affecting the disadvantaged communities, and we make sure that all of this work that's been put into the comprehensive plan is followed through to code. We'll be watching, <laughs> for one thing. We'll make sure of that. And I still have a request for you to, to hire an equity officer. So... Oh, my name is Laura, I'm sorry, Laura Betts, and I'm with the Clio Institute. I get nervous when I have to come up here, but um, today I'm in a uh, positive mode because I feel like we're in a good place. We're maybe not where I would like to see us, but I know that it's work in progress, and I support it. All right. Thank you, Ms. Betts, Thank for you. your comments. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. All right, second call from Matthew Verp Verpka, V-R-B-K-A be followed by uh, Janet Brewer, uh, Vicki Vargo, and Shannon Lena. Please state your name and address for the record. Please, you'll have two minutes. Hello, my name is Matthew Verbka. I live on 2902 Roderick Circle, Orlando, Florida. And I have with me today a book that I would recommend everybody on the board and everybody here in the audience and viewing at home reads. It's called Arbitrary Lines. How Zoning Broke the American City and How to Fix It. It's by an uh, urban planner named M. Nolan Gray. And within it, uh, Gray lists out a couple different zoning reforms that he encourages local municipalities to adopt, uh, many of which are in the Vision 250 uh, summary. Um, a couple uh, highlights. Um, one thing he really stresses is to either in single family zoning or to increase the amount of missing middle housing, such as duplexes, fourplexes, uh, and apartment buildings. Um, he especially emphasizes uh, accessory dwelling units or ADUs, which if you skim over the draft for Vision 250, the letters ADU appear together quite frequently, which I think is a, a great uh, start for implementing uh, some of his zoning reforms that he suggests. Um, one of the other highlights uh, that he suggests is to abolish minimum parking requirements. Now, the minimum parking requirements, as we kind of all know, um, states that for every X units or X square feet, you must build Y number of off-street parking spaces. And this can uh, you know, pretty quickly increase housing costs because builders have to spend additional capital to make spots in which there might not even be some sort of latent demand uh, for those spots. Instead, he recommends pricing street parking dynamically, uh, and that developers will build as many spaces as needed. If they build too much, they waste money. If they don't build enough, uh, nobody will buy. Um, within Vision 250, uh, I believe uh, they have, I believe currently, for every about 1,000 square feet of office spaces, uh, requires about five parking spaces. But in Vision 250, that same 1,000 square footage of office spaces requires anywhere from two to four spaces. So we are making uh, improvements there. Um, so ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, while I don't think Vision 2050 is perfect, I do think it's a great step in the right direction and would strongly uh, encourage everybody to support the measure. Thank you so much. 
All right, uh, thank you very much for your comments. And we'll move to the next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Mayor, Good afternoon. Commissioners, and all that are involved in this. I want to thank you for all your time, your, your hard work, your concentration, and caring for what you're trying to do for our rural area in East Orlando. My name is Janet Brewer, and I live in East Orlando. And I am opposed to a few things that we have that are being offered or to us. Um, I oppose to the areas that are being called hamlets, clutters, villages. That's not what we, clusters. That's not what we want out in our area. That's not why we live out there. Um, we also, in the paperwork, that if there are any amendments to be made, any changes, amendments, that I would ask for it to be a majority of all commissioners before any change can be made and that the public is aware of what's going to happen. Uh, we all need to have our say of what's happening in our areas. And again, I'm just opposed to the type of growth that you are wanting to do out in our rural area. We want to stay the way it is. I've lived on my property for almost 50 years, and the changes, the subdivisions, the homes, the traffic, of course, you've heard it all before. Um, we need it. We need wilderness. We need our, our free land in our area. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker. Good afternoon. I'm Vicki Vargo. I live at 3800 Winged Foot Court, Orlando, 32808. That's District 2. Orange County does need more spaces for people to live. However, we also need more sp spaces for people to play. Live, work, and play. They go together. Barnett Park is the only public recreation facility for over 81,000 people, and it is in the far eastern edge of Pine Hills, neighborhood consisting of two zip codes. There are no neighborhood parks or park-up parks. The Vision 2050 plan is not a comprehensive plan if it does not include more green space in our established neighborhoods, especially our safe neighborhoods, where you are proposing density. If you value sustainable, strong neighborhoods, then you must plan for and create green space in established neighborhoods to accommodate both new and current residents. We need to see green everywhere on Vision 2050 map, not just more density. I urge you to implement a pilot program to plant streetscape trees in our safe neighborhoods. Any concerns about maintenance for sidewalks are overstated and the need for green space is too great to be ignored any longer. Mental health experts encourage people to go outside, exercise to help cope with anxiety, depression, and anger. That is impossible where there is no canopy trees. Instead, people sit in their homes, angry over a disgruntled situation, sometimes leading to devastating consequences. No one can go on a pleasant walk to blow off steam because there is no shade. Please send 20, uh, Vision 2050 back to add proposed green space for established communities and to implement a pilot program to plant streetscape canopy trees in our safe neighborhoods. We want to see more green, not just red. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Vargo, for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker. Hello, my name is Shannon Lina. I reside at 3651 Oriskany Drive in Orlando, uh, 32820, the uh, far east side of Orlando. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak on the new comprehensive plan. Um, I'm a resident of the rural East Market area. I'd like to thank the staff uh, for removing the rural ham hamlets and villages from the Vision 2050. The amount of time that staff 
uh, has, and district commissioners and the mayor uh, and the residents have dedicated towards the creation of the comprehensive land use plan. It's immense. I think that the vision represents good growth strategies. Uh, in an effort to preserve the vision, I'd like to request that the cha any changes to the new comprehensive land use plan require a supermajority vote from the commission. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker. Next up is Sharon Carter, to be followed by Jordan Theus, then Lonnie White, then Mark Lenta. Please state your name and address for the record, please. You'll have two minutes. Good afternoon, Mayor, Good afternoon. Commissioners, my fellow guests and Orange County residents. My name is Sharon Carter, and I've been an Orange County resident almost 50 years of my life. I've seen this community grow from when I had a part of a large family on the farm, just like Green Acres, to where we are now. I can't tell you how thankful I am to be a part of and standing in front of this board and my fellow uh, people who live here in Orange County for where we have come and what this planning department is trying to offer us as a beginning for our future. Thank you. The organization of the town meetings explaining Vision 2050 uh, I began calling, before that, I began calling the planning department because I had a lot of questions and things I needed answered. It was not easy because I had to come up to speed with what was going on. People don't like change. I'm a person. You know, I live here in Orange County and I had to figure out what's going on and what have they been working on for years. It took a bit of effort on my part. But I was willing to do that because I like living here and I am so thankful that I live here and I'm trying to face myself in the mirror and say, you know what, things are going to change. I better get with the program and do my work and my effort so that things can go perhaps a little better. So, you know, things were uh, answered at the meetings. There were lots of questions. Um, but I am thankful that we have a direction. It's not set in stone. It's not all the answers to what our future is going to be. But thank you to the planning department for what they have given us to start with. And I continue, for one, to try to work with them in the future and try to continue growing Orange County. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Carter, for the great optimism. All right, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Next speaker is Jordan Theus, followed by Lonnie White, if you can go over to the uh, wall, and then Mark Lenta. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jordan Theus, 3109 Rayford Road, Orlando, 32806. Um, I am in support of Vision 2050. Today is the day that I feel all y'all can make a difference in the county. We've all talked about it. You know, there's a lot of hand wringing and gnashing of teeth. We all know that rent is you know, on an unsustainable tra trajectory. We need more housing. This is the, the most comprehensive plan we have in front of us, path forward to, to rectify the situation. And uh, thank you for county staff for, for working hard and putting a proposal together that is about as amenable as, as we can have. And I think it's going to hopefully uh, try to answer some of the questions that we have for the, the future of this county. So thank you all for this time, and uh, please vote yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Theus. And we'll move to the next speaker. Lonnie White. Uh, my name is Lonnie White, 1037 Mill Run Circle. Um, 
I don't have much prepared for today. I just wanted to come and uh, show my support for Vision 2050. Um, I know that this has been a longstanding process, and we just want to say thank you to all of you guys for working diligently to try to at least introduce some new type of legislation that will benefit the growth of Orange County. Um, like I said, I'm in favor for it. I think we need additional housing, and uh, we all know that the growth is coming whether we like it or not. Um, I just want to say thank you for your hard work, and I'm in favor of Vision 2050. All right. Thank you, Mr. White. We'll move to the next speaker. Next speaker is Mark Lenta. He'll be followed by Peter Drake. Um, Mipson Matthew. Uh, hello and thank you. My name is Mirsa Matthew. I own three houses, three rental properties, and two in the area of Taft and one in the area of Lake Nona. Uh, I just want to share my experience that this year on May, one of the houses at Taft became available, and I could not believe the amount of people that apply on that day. Almost 12 people with families. A lot of them were senior veterans that they like to live in the Taft area because it's affordable housing rent and it's close to the VA hospital. So they told me that they are in need of housing in the Taft area and the Lake Nona because it's so close to the VA hospital. Um, Vision 2050 will allow to have duplex and townhouses and when you approve yes to this zoning, Think in mind that there is a lot of senior veterans that are living in motels with their families, and they're willing to pay rent and extra rent just to move out of the motel. So uh, allowing duplex and townhouses are also helpful to those seniors and their families, and I couldn't believe the amount of people that are in need right now in Orange County. And thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Good afternoon, commissioners, folks. My name is Peter Duke. I live at 1900 Curry Ford Road here in Orlando. Um, I know a lot of folks have good reasons and well-intentioned arguments on both sides of this issue. Um, limited housing and limited transportation to serve that housing has been a problem in, or in Orange County for some time. And uh, this, this plan that the commission and the staff has, has labored over for so long was not capriciously made. Like this thing has been considered and run through committees and had analysis done and public input and it is, it's not perfect. No plan ever is. There's a healthy discourse behind it. People have thoughts on both sides of the issue. But as I said in my last time up here, let's not let perfect be the end. Is not gonna be the path forward. You know, no city ever started at a booming metropolis, you know, by accident. They started at one story, and then they went up, and then density came, and then the transportation to serve that came. And this, this city and this county are growing in that direction, but it's not a painless process. And it's going to take things happening that not everyone thinks is the best path forward, but it is a path, and it is moving us forward. So as you can tell, I'm in favor of the Division 2050 plan. I think it's been well thought out. I hope that everyone sees the many, many merits to this plan that'll move our county forward and make housing more accessible. And hopefully the missing pieces that folks wish were included in this one will follow with, with subsequent action. You know, maybe the transportation tax will, will find footing in the future and our city can continue to grow, our county will prosper, and more people that come to join us here in Central Florida will find it a great place to live and raise their families. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Dukes. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker. Next speaker is Maddie Madeline Link. Lynch, uh, followed by Eugene Staccato, Cargo, and Felicia Hunter. My name is Maddie Lynch. I live in 1658 Celebration Boulevard. One thing that stands out to me as I stand here and as I stood here in April, um, hearing people for and against the plan is that a lot of us are saying the exact same thing. We don't know where the heck all these people are gonna go. In fact, some of us, to Mike's point, don't even know where we're going to live because of how much rents are increasing. 
We may have different reasons for our concern, but ultimately our positions are the same. We want growth to go where it makes sense. And where it makes sense is in dense areas of the county where it's currently the hardest to build housing. As a member of YIMBY, which stands for Yes in My Backyard, I'm not asking anyone to live in a city. I'm not asking anyone to bike to work. I'm not asking anyone to give up their single family home in favor of a missing middle housing type like a condo or a duplex. What I'm asking for is a county where people can choose those things. A county where people can find a home that they can afford. A county where the focus is people and not cars. This plan is not perfect at achieving those goals, but it's a great start. It's a start in a county where we're not in the top 10 deadliest regions for pedestrians, where we are not the sixth least affordable major metropolitan area when accounting for median income, because we build more homes and we build more infrastructure for pedestrians and for cyclists, where our main interstate is not rated the third worst in congestion because people have more transportation options and they can live closer to work where the population is not growing at one and a half times the number of housing units because we're build more housing units and we're building them where we need them. I think Orange County and Central Florida is an incredible place to live, work, and play. It's not a surprise that a bunch of people want to come and live here. We need a plan that supports current residents and is prepared to welcome more, and I think Vision 2050 is a great place to start. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you, Ms. Lynch. Uh, next speaker, please. Eugene Staccato. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Eugene Stokoro, 331 Roswell Avenue. I'm generally uh, okay with this plan. Uh, this is a surprise a lot of my developer friends who have always accused me over the decades of being anti-growth. I've always just said it has to be in the right spot. You know, to protect the rural countryside, we got to increase density. This plan is helping with that. I actually have submitted comments that I think the densities are too low. 60 units per unit should be the base for it in the urban area, be it in the regional or corridor area. It, let the developer economically make a decision on how high. I, I see a person I know well. And he's, you know, let them, let them decide that part. The urban suburban areas should be allowed to evolve as needs of our generations are happening. A single-family home I see ultimately becoming potentially a town home where we can take the, the parcels and actually put them together and actually, you know, radical things like that. Um, uh, eventually, uh, one concern here is the HOAs. We have tons of HOAs that have structural problems because they have hard land use types mixed in their deed restrictions. That's a serious problem that I think this board has to start addressing, that we have to add some flexibility in the future HOAs to allow the evolution of those units, because future generations might not want a single family unit out in the middle of some place. We might have to, 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 to solve this problem. We might have to densify, and we have to have that flexibility in those HOAs. Um, we actually, once we get the density, the cost drop per unit of the in, installing uh, all the needs, De uh, trans becomes a, a potential. Finally, after the final adoption, after you, everything's been smashed down and, and everyone's happy and kumbala and all that stuff, supermajority should be needed to change this plan. Because once a plan is established, you need to practice the plan for a long time to see if it works. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Staccato. We'll move to the next speaker. Next speaker is Felicia Hunter to be followed by Rosemary Deal, Luana Gelzer, and Sarah Elbardi. I'm gonna wave my time to Rosemary and Luanda. Okay. okay, all right. Okay, you can, uh, so you can only wave your time to one person. Okay, so let's see. So Ms. Deal, do you have time with, from someone else other than Yes, <laughs> that will be helpful. Right. Please you. state your name and address for the record, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners, and neighbors of Orange County. My name is Rosemary Deal. I am a licensed realtor. I am also the president of Robinswood Community Association. I am also the president of Pine Hill Safe Neighborhood Partnership. I am coming here wearing many hats today because I believe that all hats do 
have something to do with why we're here today. Um, I'm honored to be here, and I do appreciate everything that Orange County is doing and all the employees and to build a better future for us in the Vision 2050 plan. I favor it, however, I have a few caveats, and I like to share those. Green spaces was mentioned a little while ago, and I am also all for green spaces. We have lakes and ponds and some areas that actually dried up, they're no longer lakes. I am concerned, what are we gonna do about that? Are we gonna turn those into green spaces? I do a lot. I stay busy, I do a lot of driving. I go around Windermere, Bay Hill, Winter Garden, Lake Nona, you name it, I'm always driving. And what I see are a lot of green spaces. What I don't see in Pine Hills are those same green spaces. So as you build for it, I appreciate if you could look into adding some green spaces and talking to the community what the plans would be from that point on versus telling us this is what it is and how it's going to be. Um, the additional traffic is a concern as well if we build within the community. Uh, the strain on public school systems, I didn't really hear much about that, just a little bit. We do want a walkability community in Pine Hills. And within those lots and those plans, what we don't want will be buildings 12 feet stories up smack in the middle of our community. We do not want that. We're okay with growth, but we don't want to see a 12 level story building in the middle of our community where those dried up ponds are. So when it comes to discussing about changing the planet and the zoning, more than three stories, we would appreciate if we could hear something at a meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Dill. We'll move to the next speaker. Luana Gelzer, you'll have three minutes. Luana Gelzer, concerned citizen living in the city of Orlando. Greetings from a statewide um, climate justice conference. I just drove from UCF to get here. Um, what I see in the comprehensive plan when I did get the opportunity to review it was lack of equity. The first thing I asked was look at the projection of the population. There's no real uh, accurate data to account for the climate migration. 800,000 to a million people will be moving to Central Florida within the next three to five years because of the sea level rise down in Miami. I also have been funded by the EPA, the only community-based organization in the entire country to study the effects of transportation when it comes to our air quality. I did partner with you also on another grant. So I'm here to talk about lack of equity. I'm very concerned that we talk about density in housing and the need for housing. But for somebody, let's look at the data. The data reflects urban communities are hotter than rural areas because you have deforced the communities. There's no trees. And then when I asked the question about building on existing footprints, I still haven't received the answer. But the most concerning thing that I am worried about is true sustainable housing and accountability. You can say it, but who's going to check to make sure it's being done? Some of us do, and we're not, we're not happy in what we're seeing. So I go back to questioning how great the proposal is, but I feel like the projections of 2050 were wrong. We need to review this in three years with additional data. Noah just had a press conference talking about the um, Gulf in the Atlantic Ocean, way above the temperature. What do that mean, people? Stronger storms? What do that mean for urban communities? We're hit harder. We still got debris that has not been removed from in. So I'm saying it's not that I'm against the plan. I'm saying the plan is not making communities that have went without whole first before you go to something else. That's what equity is. I'm not saying empowerment. I'm not saying make us equal. I'm saying you need to put funds that have not been allocated to certain communities first. That should be your priority. So look back at the data. Make sure you do not do too much density in urban communities. We're suffering already. And look at the signs. It's not 2050 when we're talking about extreme heat. It's today. 
It's today, people. You missed the mark and were not prepared for what's coming. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Gelzer. We'll move to the next speaker. Next speaker is um, Sarah Elbardi. Hi, commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sarah Albadri, 617 North Magnolia Avenue. Hello, my name is Sarah Albadri. I have the privilege and pleasure to serve as the Deputy District Director for Congressman Maxwell Frost. It's good to see you guys again this afternoon. I'm proud to work for a pro-housing congressman who supports smart and sustainable growth. I'm here on behalf of the office to support your transmittal of Vision 2050. Before I begin, I want to applaud the work of the planning division in collaboration with departments and division across the county. Beyond the planning efforts to get this document together, their public outreach to engage the community has been immense, unprecedented, and set a new bar. Under your direction and your support from your offices, their efforts had over 12 weeks to host 22 town halls was felt across Orange County. Our office had the pleasure of attending several of these town halls. We've shared the congressman's priorities before, but they're worth reiterating preventing gun violence, supporting arts and culture, and addressing housing so that we, we may have an abundant and affordable supply. Through our, all of our work and partnerships, we want to encourage and support equity. I'm here this afternoon because tw Vision 2050 covers significant issues of equity, sustainability, and livability, from main streets to diversity of new housing options, to support for increased transit, bike, and ped connectivity. We look, for we look forward to this vision of Orange County. From a limited housing supply to limited transportation options to strained infrastructure, there was a serious call to reimagine the future of Orange County. This organization has taken that work seriously and has spent the last few years developing Vision 2050. We're especially encouraged by the new opportunities for housing and increased mobility in Vision 2050. We know housing and transportation are the top issues of Central Florida, and you can call on Congressman Frost as a partner to work on solutions to those challenges. However, today he wants to thank you for your work to ensure the future of the place that we call home. Thank you for supporting the transmittal of Vision 2050. We look forward to this new chapter in Orange County. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, uh, thank you. And for those who are clapping, that's not allowed. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, next speaker, please. The next speaker is Allison Yurko, and is uh, Chris Koenig here? Okay, so you'll have three minutes, Ms. Yurko. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Allison Yurko with Allison Yurko PA. I'm here today represent, representing Greenway Automotive Group. We have with us today the Corporate General Counsel, Chris Koenig. Um, we have had an opportunity to meet with your staff and attend the town hall meeting on June 22nd with the District Commissioner since our last appearance at the hearings. Um, we are hopeful that we are on a positive path here. Um, we, we are, and I, let's see, do we have a clicker here? Is this, okay, yes. So just to, just to re, uh, reiterate, this uh, company is the corporate headquarters um, of a $3 billion automotive group. It is a national, not a neighborhood business. It's a major employer with 1,000 employees locally, 2,600 nationally. It is the largest private locally based business in Central Florida. We had a 59-acre uh, PD approved in 2001. It is fully built out. It's a state-of-the-art facility at 417 and East Colonial. We believe it better fits in the urban center, not a neighborhood center, and we're having discussions with staff about that. Uh, we have no plans for that PD or need to re redevelop and would rather not be included at all. Um, this is what uh, the PD looks like. I worked on this in 2001. We're very proud of it. Um, it is the sort of thing that we're striving to do on adjacent parcels. Um, again, we're concerned about being in a neighborhood center. It says allowable uses include commercial office and institutional uses in mixed buildings. We're concerned about how the draft development regulations could affect us. We have very strict manufacturing requirements in this business. Things like building location criteria, setbacks to adjacent uses, architectural review standards, pedestrian and walkway standards. 
requirements relating to vibrations, odor glares. Those are the sort of things that are extremely disruptive to our business model. We're not near any neighborhoods. We're well buffered by the 417 to the east, colonial to the south, and a preservation area to the north. Um, and, and we have, in addition to our existing PD, we have been assembling uh, 17.24 acres over the years in reliance on the straight commercial zoning for an auto sales and repair campus. That, that is what it looks like there. Uh, you see the existing PD parcels one through three, the, the new PD four through nine. You can see the aerial photograph. The good news is that we have a new PD application that has just been submitted along with a vested rights application for the existing Greenway PD and other properties to ensure that we have no business um, disruption or devaluation. While Greenway reserves the right to opt out of Vision 20 prior to adoption, we are optimistic that we can work through the PD investing process with staff over the coming months. The goal is to ensure no disruption to Greenway's current vehicle business operations and plans for expansion, minimize the uncertainty, and really work with the county to find a shared vision. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Yarko. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker. Next speaker is Hal Cantor to be followed by Cindy Brown and followed by Andy Basu. Good afternoon. My name is Hal Cantor. I'm an attorney at 215 North Eola, Orlando, Florida. I'm not speaking to you today on behalf of a client. I'm speaking to you on behalf of myself as a business owner in, Flor in or Orange County for more than 50 years. Um, I think what your staff has done is excellent. I think they're skilled, they're smart, and they've looked forward. And I think for the most part, this is a great plan. The deficiency that I see is the remo removal of the uh, hamlets and uh, clusters. Uh, I think that when you do that, you've taken out of the mix hundreds, if not thousands, of acres that would be available for development. And this, these, this was not intense development. Uh, this development has 70% 70 per, 70 conservation area required. It was sensitive to the environment. You, in Orange County, you all have been talking about the need for affordable housing. Uh, the ability to provide affordable housing is largely dependent on supply and demand. When you take out the ability to provide supply, the costs go up. So you're fighting with yourself. Not only that, it impacts transportation because if people are not living near their places of employment, they're impacting the transportation system. That ultimately affects mass transit as well. So I understand the political uh, sensitivity of adding those uh, development uh, rights back in, but I would urge you to do so now or at the time of adoption. It would be a smart growth move by, the, uh, by Orange County. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Uh, Cantor. We'll move to the next speaker. Next speaker is Cindy Brown. Hello, I'm Cindy Brown, but I think I would like to pass my time to the next person to speak. Okay. Uh, All right, you. might next not speaker. be necessary. <laughs> A Adi or Addy. All right, next speaker, um, please. Ms. Brown, I'll have to admit, I don't think I'll use your time wisely, uh, but I appreciate it. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good to see you all. My name's Addie. I'm a resident of Orlando, a renter, and um, I want to say that I'm in support of Vision 2050. I am in support of it as a policy amateur and as someone who has uh, looked into uh, what I think would be best for my community, our community. And um, I'll admit, uh, I loathe to be redundant. I wasn't able to hear uh, what all the previous speakers have said since I was actually sitting on the floor out there uh, doing a virtual training for all my jobs. <laughs> and I imagine uh, you've heard a lot about um, affordable housing, about protecting rural character, about all those lovely things we like to talk about. So. Uh, I'll talk about something for a minute that's uh, near and dear to my heart, but maybe not to yours. Okay, so our tax base. I think we sometimes uh, forget that the single-family housing, the more dispersed, less dense housing, is more costly, 
It's uh, more cumbersome on taxpayers. It's uh, literally subsidized by us. Linkage fees helps, uh, of course, but uh, a less dense plan will be people in urban centers that could be expanded uh, would be the poor, subsidizing the middle, upper middle class. And if we have more dense, more mixed use planning, then we'll see the opposite. It will be more profitable through uh, multiple taxes and will truly be a more vibrant and stronger uh, county. I would also say that uh, the concern for uh, misused urban development is very real. But I think one of the main reasons we have this discussion right now is that we're trying to overcome these sort of 20th century ideas and notions that hold us back, and we're trying to envision what a 21st century Orange County would look like. And I really do believe that this is it. I yield my time. All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to move to the next speaker. Next speaker is Kelly Semran. And there's a number of folks who are dedicating their time. So when I call your name, if you could please raise your hand. Beverly Russell. Thank you. James McKnight. All right, thank you. Uh, Jeannie McKnight. Thank you. William Lutz. Uh, Cecil Stone. Oh, R-O-L. I am sorry for that. Uh, and then uh, Ronald uh, Hesbeth. Ronald here. Yeah. So you'll have a total of six minutes. Thank you. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you for moving my card to the end of the pile. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm Kelly Semrad. I reside at 3111 Amalfi Drive, Orlando, Florida, 32820. I'm here today on behalf of Save Orange County as Vice Chair. We are a sustainable growth organization that functions primarily out of East Orange County. However, you've seen us, um, I'm sure, in your districts as well, advocating for people that reach out to try to have a voice in the development of, of their community um, and to share in the vision. I, um, as Vice Chair of Save Orange County, I'll say that this has been one of the more pleasant experiences for us with working with staff and communicating through our district commissioner and attending community halls. And it, Thank you so much for reaching out to the communities and for giving us the opportunity to freely speak and to be able to provide our feedback and our input. Um, I speak now on behalf of um, Save Orange County with our function within District 5, Rural East Orange Market. Um, when we first reviewed the plan, we saw that there were rural villages and rural hamlets, the village being comprised of many um, hamlets that were put together, and it was incredibly scary to our community. The reason being is because we have been fighting for probably about 15 years, maybe even longer, I'm sure that some of the board members can tell you, is um, fighting two developments, Lake Pickett North and Lake Pickett South. Um, those were privately led text amendments that amended our existing comprehensive land use plan and were very controversial in our, in our community. So when we were given the opportunity to review the plan and seeing the hamlets and the villages, and what, it, what it reflected was um, about five more grows is what we were looking at in terms of, when I say grow, it's Lake Pickett South, in terms of the land swaths that were available for development. So we were thrilled to see that those have been removed um, and that we're, we're looking to conserve and push growth towards the urban centers where the job corridors are and the infrastructure exists to support urban-based style populations, which is what the grow um, and sustenance are in the Lake Pickett area. With that being said, I know all of you guys, you have put in so much time. I know it because I, we, I followed all of your community meetings, uh, Save Orange County, that you are reaching out to the public. I know that you as individuals have dedicated, I'm sure, many late nights working through a very long document, reading it. Um, I know staff has worked so hard on it as well. And I come to you today just to ask um, three things. The first being is that if there's an amendment to the plan that we look at doing a supermajority from the BCC to amend our comprehensive land use plan. Um, 
the, the basis of the request is based on the use of the resources that went into developing this plan, the amount of community participation, the amount of your time, the amount of the planning department's time, and to protect a vision that so many of us from whatever side of the wheel that you're from in terms of development, conservation, preservation, we agree that this is a good this is a good foundation for the plan. So we're asking for a supermajority to amend it. Um, second, although we understand, um, well, let me, Lake Picket North, Sustany, is included in a map overlay, um, and it's listed as intended growth. And that is a development that the community has been actively fighting, again, for, for about 15 years. Um, we've done lawsuits, we've, we've, Gosh, we've, we've walked to the end of the earth to preserve this swath of land in the Econ River Basin. It's right on the banks of our Econolakachi River. Um, it doesn't have the infrastructure around it to support it. And it's marked in the, in the future land use map as intended. Um, and I, we've met with staff, and we understand that that was, came through as an amendment, um, the Lake Picket Text Amendment. Um, but there's no development that's approved and that's attached to that swath of land. And I understand that planning has explained why it is there, and, and we understand it, but we, we want it removed. We, wa we do not want that included as intended growth. It sends a message to the community that even though we show up and even though we fundraise and we, wa we do so much to try to protect the area where we live, it's frustrating to see it still listed as intended. Um, so we would like that amended um, in, terms of, in terms of that map overlay. Uh, we understand that there may be a process that that needs to follow in order to have that removed, but um, it is one that, that we're very passionate about and that we have been very active on for a very long time. Um, my, th my third request in terms of um, the future land use map is that Orange County has become incredibly expensive to live in, as you guys all know. And the more expense, that there are added expenses any time that we begin to approve any development that is outside of the urban core. And when we begin to put populations in rural areas that require urban services, we all incur that additional expense. Um, this plan has done a good job in terms of driving the growth towards the center. Uh, we want that commitment that that, that, that is going to happen um, and I know that the, the planning department has removed the rural hamlets and villages from, from the plan. Um, we were grateful to see that that was the case. Uh, however, just a conscious effort in terms of whenever a development is approved is, is just the question, is it being built in the right place? And uh, too often, I think, in the area where we come from, the, the answer was, no, it's not built in the right place. We think that Vision 2050 will help control what we refer to as irresponsible rural development. We're hoping that that's what we actually get out of this plan. Um, so in some Save Orange County, um, we support Vision 2050. We would like some amendments with the privately led uh, text amendments or amendments, large scale amendments, and have it be super majority. Um, and thank you for removing the rural hamlets and villages. Thank you, board. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move to the next speaker. Next speaker is Cecil Stone, to be followed by Ronald Hesbest. Hello, board, mayor. Thank you all for your time and for giving us a chance to speak. My name is Cecil. Most people know me as Trey because in this city there are far too many Cecil Stones. Sorry, it's a family name. Um, I'm just going to share my experience with this kind of planned development because I've been in Florida for a very long time. I currently live at 3041 Herald Drive in Orlando, Florida, District 5. But I grew up at the intersection of Orange and Cayley. Back when the intersection of Orange and Cayley wasn't much to talk about. There was a firehouse. It's still there. It's very cool. I remember when they got the Superman uh, kind of emblem, if you know what I'm talking about. I also remember when that whole area was nothing but a warehouse and a Taco Bell. There was more there than a Taco Bell, but I was 10, and the Taco Bell was very important. Um, <laughs> When I grew up, as I grew up, that place became what we now know as Soto and the Super Target development. And that was awesome because I couldn't afford a car. And so I had to walk to work. And I got my first job at that Target. I would not have been able to get a job without that Target because all of the other jobs in that area were taken by people who grew up before I did. But when that Target opened, they hired me. So this kind of building 
where we are, where we already are. There were houses already there. There were places already there. But those warehouses weren't used. So we built there. We built new things there, things that people like me needed. So focusing on those areas, not urban sprawling out to take over more wetlands that we could save for conservation, that we could keep as green spaces, that we could protect for future environments. I think that's a great idea. I think that's a part of Vision 2050, and that's why I'm here to support it. And I really appreciate that you're pushing it up to Tallahassee. Thank you all so much for the great work that you've done. I hope that we can focus on affordability as we build into these areas, because as much as I love Soto, the apartments are a little pricey. <laughs> but I don't think I'm bursting any bubbles there. <laughs> but it's a great thing we can do when we can see the places we already are go forward into the future. And we have such a great place that we're starting from. But we all see the opportunities when we go down certain streets. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Mr. Stone. Uh, the one and only Cecil Stone, huh? That's what it sounds like. <laughs> All right, next speaker, please. Uh, last speaker card I have is Ronald Hesbest. Uh, Herb. Herbert, sorry. Um, you'll have two minutes. State your name and address for the record, please. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ronald Herbert. I live at 8 South Osceola Avenue. Um, I didn't really prepare much today. I just want to say I grew up here in the sprawl of Orlando, and I hated it. So I moved downtown. And now I live in uh, the South Eola neighborhood, and I wish more people had an opportunity to live in a neighborhood like it. It's very walkable, lots of large trees with good shade, good parks. I just enjoy the, I barely drive. I only have to drive to work every once in a while. It, I wish more of Orlando was like it because I feel like I get to experience, you know, nature and what Orlando has to offer. So 2050, Vision 2050, I feel like moves in the right direction for that. I wish we could see, like, mills and stuff become developed in a similar manner and improve the bus system. <laughs> I want to be able to take the bus to places that actually go, like, where I need to go. Thank you. All right. Uh, is the last name Herbert or Herbert? Uh, it, it, okay. <laughs> all right. So that was the got, last speaker, Mayor. All right. So uh, with that being the, the last speaker during public comment, uh, we are going to close the public hearing portion at this time, and we'll move to questions or comments uh, by members of the board. And as we start uh, the dialogue, I there was a couple of things raised. Uh, one... Uh, the issue, and this is for the county attorney, uh, speak to the supermajority issue that has been raised by a number of people, what it would take and what does it mean uh, in terms of the supermajority vote. How do we get there if we move down that path? Okay. Mayor, the uh, Florida statutes provide that with respect to amendments to the comprehensive plan that you, uh, the local government needs a vote of not less than a majority of those present and voting on the question. Um, the board beyond that does not have any uh, procedures in place uh, which, which provide that a supermajority vote is needed in order to pass a, a comprehensive plan amendment. So uh, we would suggest that we just follow the state law here and, and if we're going to propose uh, transmitting or adopting or, or when we transmit or adopt a proposed comprehensive plan amendment, we just need a majority of those present. And uh, if this board endeavor to take some action to say we would transmit and we would need the supermajority. Uh, what does that mean for the future? Could a future board undo it if it wasn't codified in state statute or uh, by some other means, by a referendum, et cetera? Uh, um, Mayor, I'm not sure I'm, I'm following exactly where you're going, but with your question, I'm sorry if you could just repeat. So, okay. So my question is, even if the board, this board, took, thought it could take some action that would say that in order to change the future land use or comp plan, that it will require 
uh, the supermajority of the board at that time. Uh, uh, could we do that, one? Uh, or could the future board undo, uh, even if we did something along those lines? Could the future board undo it but the, if it's not codified in state law? Yeah, it's, it is not codified in state law, and I think um, we, the board could do that, but I think that's something that we would need to take up by an ordinance or a separate discussion at the very least before, you know, we say that we need a supermajority vote in order to transmit or adopt a comprehensive plan amendment. And, of course, it is something that a future board could change, uh, even if we were to uh, alter the procedure and require a supermajority in the future. Uh, a board of county commissioners or the next board of county commissioners could, could change that. Okay, that's kind of what I wanted the public to kind of understand, uh, that in terms of that recommendation or that input, it's not quite as simple as it is not what it has been kind of inferred through that process. The other thing is, um, uh, I think it was Ms. Yurko, uh, rep as a representative of Greenway Automotive, uh, she brought up a an issue that's a uh, concern, I think, regarding perhaps a future land uh, use issue. And that is not a question for the county attorney. That's a question more for Alberto, if you can <coughs> respond to uh, what she was interjecting into the conversation this afternoon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so we have um, introduced language in all the mixed use districts that um, would allow for a single use to stay in place, um, and it's not expected to change or to introduce any additional uses. Even though you know this particular, in this particular case, it may be a car dealership, uh, it is not expected to evolve into any other mixed use uh, in the near future, um, or you know, for as long as they are in operation. What we have done, though, and this may not be um, a matter of um, just general awareness of uh, Ms. Yorko is that we have uh, changed the future land use designation from uh, neighborhood center, which is what she highlighted today in her comments, to uh, urban center, which uh, would allow for you know even much more intense. We we believe that the location of these particular parcels and the size of the of the tract of land. Uh, would merit uh, that particular designation as well. So p half of what she's requesting today, I guess she presented the fact that she has submitted a plan amend uh, PD amendment to include some additional property. Uh, we, that, must be, have, that must have been done like today or, or yesterday. Um, so if that answers your question, Mayor. Yes, I just in terms of process, I wanted her to kind of understand you know, where we are with it. Mm -hmm. so. okay. yeah. um, I'm sorry to jump in. John. This is John. Um, if I may, um, you know, Alberto and I in the county attorney's office, we've had a number of discussions about where we are today with the transmittal of Vision 2050. And, of course, what's required to come back before you with the adoption uh, is also the orange code. And so we haven't had a significant conversation with the board yet regarding what orange code ultimately will provide for relative to those development standards, to the development processes by which we would take in applications, uh, changes to either future land use or zoning and transects. Um, and again, whether that's the sectors, the place types, or those specific transects itself, how we would handle vested rights, how we would handle pending applications that are in the process at the time of adoption. And then ultimately, and Alberto hinted a little bit to it uh, in, his, in his presentation, how we would handle the the, the implementation, including both staff training and allowing some form of window between an adoption and an effective date. So there's a lot of conversations that still have to take place, both with, the, both with this board and with property owners in the development community, about exactly what that looks like. And those are, of course, um, once we, you know, if we get past transmittal today, those are conversations that will we'll pick up the pace uh, as we head into the fall and, and come back towards an adoption hearing. Okay, uh, excellent. Um, I, I just think in terms of process, uh, those who are uh, in the development business or represent them, I kind of want them to hear and understand the process 
of uh, what happens when we go from here. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, go to the commissioners in the order in which uh, they hit the button. And the first was uh, Commissioner Michael Scott. What? I beat out Commissioner Not Wilson? Commissioner Wilson. How she, did that happen? Uh, she wanted to go last. She waited to the end. Hmm. Uh, I don't really have uh, any significant comments. Uh, I do have a question for Alberto. Um, so uh, given the uh, amount of input we've received uh, in our various community meetings, if you could, you kind of did it with the chart, but if you could answer it in a way that how it impacts the public, um, can you tell us the next one, two, or three steps as it relates to the public's engagement? So ex for example, let's say we transmit to Tallahassee, um, what happens after that, the orange code, so forth and so on, in, in, in the aspect of how they can continue to engage in this process. Because uh, in the conversations I've had leading up to this meeting and even um, in stepping out um, from the, today, um, I think there's a little bit of confusion as to what we're doing today versus what will ultimately happen in the future. So if you could just kind of clarify that for the members um, of the public and everyone here, I would appreciate it. Sure, Commissioner. Um, Thank you for the call. So, uh, for the comment, it's been a it's been a long twelve weeks. I apologize. Um, so, the actual um, next step is once this board transmits to Tallahassee, thirty days. Other state reviewing agencies uh, are able to comment. That gives staff the opportunity to um, to address some of those comments if if they in fact are, are uh, generated. And then during that time. For, frame between transmittal and adoption, which is an approximately three to five months time frame, um, we would en engage again the residents uh, with uh, opportunities to discuss uh, Orange Code, the draft of Orange Code, which is the update to the Land Development Code, um, which implements Vision 2050 in uh, different manners. Uh, you know, we would have in-person meetings uh, with uh, different entities. We would have training sessions, and we will also have a series of specific visual aids, including videos to delineate the actual uh, submittal process, which is a specific article in, in Orange Code, which will be of much interest to the development community. So um, we have had a very in-depth engagement with the residents about what happens when I'm abutting a different type of land use or place type than I'm currently in. And we have been consistently responding to the fact that those two transect zones, um, the, the, the standards that regulate how to implement that expected and already mapped future land use is embedded in that, in that particular um, uh, standard. Of, of transition, so height, relationship, and compatibility is all embedded in in uh, Orange Code, and we are hoping that within the next five months time frame, we would be able to roll up our sleeves again and be able to have as many uh, as necessary um, one-on-ones with the residents, including m most of the comments that we heard today, and over the the twelve over the twenty twenty two uh, town hall meetings regarding open space. Um, there is a, a specific requirement of civic open space with every uh, mixed use submittal that is um, uh, part of, of these place types that is all regulated in Orange Code as well. So there will be, a con there will be several opportunities for continued public engagement even after assuming board votes for transmittal today for the public to continue <laughs> to engage us in this process. Absolutely. Thank you, Alberto. I appreciate you and your team, the many long nights and early mornings, and uh, keep up the good work, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Commissioner Uribe. All right. So I have some handouts, um, the top and the second. Top and the second. Because it was so much to digest, and it was the only way that I could really focus in on, because when we got the updated memo, unfortunately, it didn't include enough from the community meetings we had. And I think you'll appreciate this, Commissioner Bonilla. So first and foremost, I don't want to say it's a no. To me, is it needs more work. And um, I want to make sure you guys have these. There's two pages. Uh, There's yeah, one, uh, two. And I have one for John. OK. Um, you know, we've gotten a lot of emails about 
people wanting less parking. And while I can understand that, here we are making a commitment to density, but no commitment to transit. Um, that is huge. So where's the incentive to the industry who's going to build these 12-story buildings but not help solve the problem? That's number one. Secondly, when you go up, it actually costs more to build, and that, that charge is actually going to go to the buyer. It, does, it is not cheaper to build up. It actually costs more to build up. Um, defining rural services, and I know there's a lot of people in this audience, and the no urban, no urban services line. I mean, even the charter review has been discussing this because they're concerned because if you define a rural service, that means there's no urban services. Commissioner Bonilla is aware of this. Um, I'm also concerned about the board's role of approving new development going forward. And when we talk about density, density calculations need to be net, not gross. And Commissioner uh, Wilson, you should understand this, water bodies and wetlands should not be included when we talk about density. And Commissioner Bonilla, Lake Pickett is a perfect example. When they talk about four per acre, but I looked at that map, no, they use the water bodies as it, so now you've got compacted homes. So I think that if you're really gonna talk about density, it has to be net density, not gross density. Um, bus lines for high density areas within a thousand feet. Right now, Link says if you live within a mile of a bus stop, that is considered. Okay, let's go out in 105 degree weather and walk a mile to get on a city bus to go to work. We have to have a commitment to the corridors that need heavy transit. Um, also, the, when we talk about density, we talk about how many units per acre, but what we don't talk about is how wide. So we're talking about, we're talking about density, you know, six to 12 units an acre, but we're not discussing the width of what that corridor will look like. And like I said, high rises cost more to build, consumers are gonna pay it. And then um, I'm very, very concerned about OCPS accommodating growth. Um, we found the pages in here where it talks about OCPS will approve, but how many times have we sat here when the community's gone and said, and this happens in Horizon West, the schools are full, but then they said, well, we have a, we have a document from OCPS that says we can add another 120 apartments. It's all good. Because what they're doing is they're just rezoning that. They're not actually ready for capacity for those additional students. And I'd like to know what commitment has OCPS been involved in 2050 and why aren't they here to also justify that? Because that is major. How will transit impacts be addressed? Where's the transportation study? We still don't have that or I haven't received it. And we cannot dismiss the hurricane and utility infrastructure. That will require major upgrades for increase in demand when you're looking at density. With all the revisions made to documents and policies, why hasn't LPA reviewed any of this? Why hasn't this gone through LPA to have their notes and responses? How has every other division in the county made their impact and comments on Vision 2050? We have not had LPA just like they would on anything else. LPA has not reviewed Vision 2050 at all. And last, flooding. How will it be addressed? You've got more density, more impervious runoff, and the, our ponds couldn't even sustain it when we had the hurricane last year. Now we're saying with less area to take the water that we're gonna be able to handle that without significant, significant major infrastructure improvement. And even if we had the funding to do that, where would we get enough time and, and get it done in a timely manner? So what I did is I actually wrote down some of my biggest issues with the urban rural. Um, I, I've heard your community has written, your community has been concerned. It's been the big, I mean, every time I've had a Vision 2050 meeting, this is the first thing that comes up. It's the rural issue. Seems too, too much density for rural. If you look at this, it's over 40 pages concerning suburban and rural. Seems too much. It needs to pare back density and it needs more work. Overall, is density gross and net? I've told you we need a focus on gross, the entire parcel, the parcel or net, including wetlands and lakes. I think it should be different if in an urban or rural area, urban is a gross density, rural needs to be a net density. 
and then density is different through. Um, when we, I think we should insert one year as instead of five years for rolling assessment. If our numbers are correct of this population growing as fast as it is, we need to be up to date much more with that. Concerns with or, urban area assessments, it's very inconsistent, confusing, and has major loopholes. Generally, rural and urban is treated inconsistently throughout. Lake Pickett is a perfect one as I looked at it. Is it a vested as urban or rural? Is it allowed to grow and expand? It's unclear, imprecise, and needs more work. As to the urban densities, the core, the center, and the general urban zones and other categories. Overall, too much density without developer commitments for transit and house mix. No incentives required to include or include to industry to help us solve the problems. Gives too much density with requiring additional commitments on housing mix market and non-market and transportation. And this one really, really bothered me because this is related to my community. And we are an urban mix, mostly in District 3. We're a target. And this... I was a little disappointed because out of all five meetings and all these um, updates, District 3's comments weren't at all included. And the word consistency and compatibility as opposed to complement and enhancement. What does complement and enhancement mean? But what we've all done here, whether we've approved or denied projects, is on consistency and compatibility. When you leave complement and enhancement, what does that actually mean? Why can't we define it how we use it now as far as consistent and compatible? And then the other one, more aspiration without action. We need more action, less aspirational. And this is where I get into my urban and, and excuse me, my, um, my housing, which I was very, very HCS 1.1.9 to assist the county in the housing policy. Housing, how, county shall establish, maintain, and update. We need to categorize this. County housing should coordinate with the property appraisers, municipalities, and their building departments to Im Im obtain timely data on housing units. One of the biggest things that really stood out when we had our Vision 2050 meetings, that, that we, the discussion came up of, we need to prepare for the future. We need to prepare for everyone moving here. Well, then we need more accurate data. And like I said, you've got established neighborhoods who have high intensity commercial on the front end, and you've got residential on the back, inconsistent residential, and now you're talking about infill with high density. It is not fair to established communities. It is not fair to the lack of public transit. And lastly, when you look at food desert areas and you look at areas that don't have the needs that are walkable, you're hurting communities. You've had a meeting with my Pine Castle folks, with my TAF folks, the one thing that was very consistent out of those meetings were frustration because it's not feeding to the needs of what's going on in those communities. In particular, TAF, they don't even have enough sidewalks, much less enough bus and transit available to them. So I was very, very concerned, and I had brought some of these up to John when we met, that I didn't see any of these issues addressed. And I'm, I'm not a no because... What you guys have done here, and I have spent a lot of time reading this, there's a lot of good, but I don't feel comfortable moving this forward without a commitment. I thought that I would see from at least my five meetings and my feedback and my constituents' feedback and the meeting you've had with my constituents when I was out of town, something more relatable to those infill areas that are mixed urban uses because they're the ones that are going to feel it. When you have to walk a mile to get to a bus stop in 105-degree weather, and we're talking about filling it in with high density. It's not fair. It's not fair to the people who live in that area. It's not consistent with what's going on. But more so when you've got these areas filled with high commercial usage. And that's not addressed here. So I wanted to kind of put it in writing for some, of, for some of you guys to see. I'm not against this. But I'm not comfortable where we are without seeing better improvement for our community. For really, you can't just say... Less parking, less parking. Okay, well, what's the, what's the, how are we going to solve the less parking? Are you going to give us that increased transit? Do we have a commitment from developers going forward who are not going to be committed to having parking at the level that we're expecting now? So what's their commitment to transit? What's their commitment to bus? We don't have that. So we're going to give the developer less parking requirements, but nothing to help provide the transit that's needed for the individuals that live there. And I still haven't seen the address the issue that we're talking about when you talk about mixed urban, when you've got that high intensity of commercial. And that's where 
I do not feel comfortable with compliment and enhancement. That is not, I can't find who is that? Who is the eye of the beholder? And, and honestly, commissioners, my real concern is what is our role on new development going forward with this? So I would love for you to take a look at that. I did go through these pages and I had to make it bigger because it's too small. It was too much. But, um, but I, I just feel that there's more work to be done and I'd like to see a commitment to that, especially with the high density. And we all know I've talked to a ton of developers and they said, if I have to build up, it's going to cost more. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to carry that. The more I build up, the more the consumer is going to pay. But really, but really guys, when you look at this, why hasn't this gone through LPA? Why hasn't our agencies internally at the county refused it? That has, where, where is it? Where's their feedback? Where is the LPA feedback? The, 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 the commissioner, uh, when we were back before the board um, back in April, that public hearing followed a public hearing for Vision 2050 before the LPA the prior month. Okay, do and we so have that? That, that's, um, that was part of the staff presentation back in April and um, the request today mirrored um, LPA's universal or uh, unanimous recommendation to transmit Vision 2050 to the state in the, pr in the prior form, um, not, w not specifically with the enhancements and refinements that have occurred post all the town hall conversations. And I think um, certainly the feedback um, that we've received uh, from the community and, and more informally from the commissioners has been th that the plan changes have made the plan better and more responsive to, you know, to those community concerns. Okay, understood. But I still don't have a transportation study. We still don't have a commitment to transit when you talk about this density. And, it, and I just got an email today from a constituent, and it regards the development in our district, concerned about the high density and without the infrastructure to handle it. And that's not addressed in here. Uh, Commissioner, if I can speak on the transportation issue, um, Alberto did uh, present an update on where we're at with the transportation study and analysis. And you do have in your package a preliminary 2050 long-range tra transportation map. That analysis, um, again, is attempting to focus and pivot off of the new form and distribution of land use and growth that's predicated by the new land use plan. Um, where that analysis is still being completed, of course, is um, that the, the, ultimately, the transportation needs depend upon and, and rely on a high level of transit service, which is, again, when we talk about transportation funding, that's been a principal topic of conversation for this board and this community over the last several years and is really beyond the scope of what we're able to accomplish or capture within, um, w within the vision plan and long-range plan document right. well, itself. Well, we don't even have accurate transportation public transit now. So we want to move forward with this high density without having it going forward. And when we had our community meetings, what was proposed as a future, future transportation was the penny tax, which we know didn't, which failed and did not get funded. But where's the infrastructure part of this either? Because we all know what the hurricane did to us. Now you want to build more and put more concrete down, but you don't have a way to even get rid of what we had before. So we're just going to add more to it. This needs more work. I'm not saying no. This needs more work. And I don't trust the system to say, and, I, and what really is, is compatible, compatible. That is not in there. It is not in there. And you do have inconsistencies with Lake Pickett and Urban yeah. when you look through this where it's defined separately. But you still aren't addressing even any of the issues that were going on in my district. And those are the ones I shared with you. Those are the ones that have been shared at the public meetings. Right. Those are the ones with my constituents right. sitting right here and not happening. And right. Not seeing it done, but being, being told it'll get done later is not good enough for me. Uh, Commissioner, with respect to our previous conversation, obviously you've shared today a good bit more detail than came up in prior discussions. Um, one of the uh, aspects of, of our conversation, which I had communicated and relayed to staff, and I believe Alberto touched on it today, is that conflict that you are identifying about how this plan attempts to focus development within the infill corridors and centers. And that when you look at the, the established neighborhoods and where those are specifically defined within the plan and how those corridors and centers are targeted within the, sort of these older communities and the, sort of the established commercial corridors, you very often you go one block away from those and you immediately get into established neighborhoods. And so you get these high densities 
and the potential for these uh, significant development you know, proposals to come into those, those um, commercial corridors and centers and spill, have spillover tangential effects on the established neighborhoods. And Alberto, um, I, again, I know we've spoken about this, that's where the transects are very critical to the conversation, ultimately to ensure appropriate transitions, both over space and time, with respect to those, those, uh, those proposals. And so, Alberto, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how, where, are, where obviously, the, the transects and those performance standards are part of Orange Code. And again, we don't have that in front of us for consideration today. That's absolutely critical to an adoption hearing. And again, Vision 2050 cannot be adopted absent um, you know, th th understanding that issue, um, at least as one of the critical issues with respect to Orange Code. Albert, uh, Mr. Vargas. So, Commissioner, in um, reference to the compatibility measures and the standards embedded in, in Orange Code, there are specific transect zones, you know, two different maps, the future land use map, which is part of Vision 2050, the one that is going to be part of uh, Orange Code would be the zoning atlas. The zoning atlas will, will have uh, reference to all the transects uh, within the county, which are the, the, the zoning districts within the county, that correlate to each one of these place types that we're talking about. So, um, when, as it a couple of things. The, the reference to the corridors, um, the corridors have been mapped within a certain distance. You mentioned that we don't know exactly what that distance is. We're, we're looking at approximately two to 300 feet from the center of that particular uh, right of way. That's what you see colored right now along the suburban corridors, along the urban corridors. Whenever those particular um, future land uses now uh, represent that particular color. In reference to Orange Code and the, trans, the transition, there is a specific um, uh, reference to the standard that identifies the fact that you having two different transect zones abutting each other and you have a lesser uh, um, transect zone than an abutting one, you cannot, if you have the, uh, the, the requirement or the standard of a building height of five stories on one side, and two stories on the abutting side, and that's the maximum of the abutting side, you cannot have a one story above the actual uh, maximum of two stories on the abutting side. That's the transition in terms of having much more compatible types of urban form so that you're not gonna end up, we heard the comment today, we don't want 12 story buildings uh, in the middle of uh, a surrounding established neighborhood. That is not going to happen. It's not in the framework of Vision 2050. Different story if Vision 2050 is not adopted and Live Local Act uh, becomes, or it is a reality now, under current conditions. But that's a different conversation that we will have here soon. Well, I just, I don't feel comfortable with compliment and enhancement. I think it should be consistent and compatible. We have that right now and it is what we use a lot when we have proposals and where we get to actually um, deny cases that aren't compatible with our community or consistent, but to say complement or enhancement does not give us, what do we say, we want to deny it because it doesn't complement the neighborhood as opposed to being compatible and consistent. I think those are very much more aggressive words that have been able to, we've been able to use. Uh, Commissioner, um, to, let, let's give staff the opportunity to respond to the questions. If, Commissioner if I, Uribe is asking first. Uh, if, if, she, if she's, I'm just trying to get through Elementary her issues and their responses, and then, then we can bring in something else. <laughs> you know, but, okay. Commissioner Uribe, uh, have you gotten your responses to the questions or concerns at this point? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't get all my responses, but I got to so may, may say Mary, if, if I may, just, just right. one, one regarding compatibility, because I think it's important. Uh, on part two, uh, chapter 10 of the vision plan, vision 2050, on page 328, there is objective um, IMP 1.2, which is compatibility. Um, compatibility will continue to be the fundamental consideration of all land use and zoning decisions and shall be guided by the, follow, by the policies that are following that. So it will continue to be the same reference that we use today in terms of compatible measures. There is not going to be any complaint amendment moving forward that will not 
be supported, that will be supported by staff um, if it is not consistent with the comprehensive plan or, com or compatible with its surrounding context. This is a policy that allows us to do that. The second point before I, s I sit down again, Commissioner, that you mentioned regarding uh, density calculation. I just want to clarify the fact that Orange County measures density using net developable density, and it always has, and with Vision 2050, will continue to do so. Gross density calculation is not used uh, as part of the, the development program allowable for a specific application. To yeah, how did Lake Pickett happen if that's the case? Because it is by gross, it's not net. Anybody who is in Lake Pickett, you can see what the density is for that area, and when you look at the map and the water bodies, it is not net, it is gross, so because that's why the lots are closer. The, the only, the only um, uh, application that has been approved by the Board of County Commissioners in the Lake Pickett study area is the Grove, and all of the density calculations which, within each one of those transect zones um, that they're allowed to, to, to meet, which is from, from T1, T2, T3, and T4, the only one of the two communities that can and is able to implement the T4, they were all calculated, they're all based on net developable densities within those particular transect zones. I know, but when, you, when you've established something, we've talked about that here a lot of times, once you establish them, just like the infamous McDonald's that's sitting on septic and the Publix that came into our area, it started it. It started that process already. And so now the door has been opened and that's why we're dealing with all these things that are coming forward now. Okay. Okay, uh, so I think he did respond to your questions. No. Commissioner Moore. All right, thank you. Um, just going a little different direction. Um, I was really happy, Alberto, a few in your team, 25 pages on WCAB and, and WCAB study area. And so I'm going to be really very interested to see how that works out in the land development code. And you said one thing, because I know this document is aspirational, and now we're going to have to come back and put the meat on the bones. And so um, it said work with municipalities, so I'll be watching that very carefully because we we, we, had, we approved one this afternoon that was in the Wakaiva study area, and we had 40% passive. It took the, the, the water from the neighboring communities, had its own pond, and did so many great things. No one came today because it was really... We did it first. We had 40 people who were very concerned and upset, and so we worked through it. So I think what you have in here will uh, set a tone for all of the projects to be as good as that and, and give the, the community a sense of assurance that, you know, that their environment will be preserved. Um, what I saw in District 2 was, you know, we have such diversity. We dedicated a... Uh, uh, a, a top a ring on top of the Horseman's Park the other day, and I have it. This is, thank you so much to the staff. Um, substantial amount of uh, open space, which is so important with the city, um, putting the Kelly Park um, KPI up there, which is quite dense. And yet, what they're doing is, in essence, another Lake Nona, and and just north of that, where we are preserving open space. So I know the people in my rural settlements were very happy that you maintained that. We're going to do the very best we can to, to keep from my two cities, which I won't name, annexing all of our rural settlements. Um, that, you know, that's really the best, biggest thing they have to fear because your document really protected them. The place where, um, and I'm going to get to Pine Hills in a minute, uh, where we saw the greatest change was in the Lockhart community. We had this conversation three years ago with my folks, and it was you don't have a walkable, bikeable, you don't even have a downtown. You did, you know, 40, 50 years ago, and they'd like to have it again. And we've been working diligently with all of our uh, corridors, and thanks to Public Works for being such a good partner. Um, we're waiting on grants and all those kinds of things. But we had the conversation, folks, if you want to have a downtown with mixed use, we're going to have to talk about where you don't mind having some apartments, where you don't mind going up a little bit. You know, where can we have open space? And I think because we had that conversation three and four years ago, and we were all very open-minded. You know, we started off with, we want a downtown. I mean, we want to be like Winter Garden. You know, we want to, we're on the Coast to Coast Trail. How do we get there? And um, I'm hoping that we could still maybe do a master plan when this is done and really help them. Because it's tough in unincorporated co corporated areas to, to really revitalize these older downtowns. The one thing that came up today that, that, that I just want to ask a question about would be my Pine Hills folks, and they're absolutely right about the lack of open space. But I was curious, and 
um, because it's already mostly established. I mean, it's hard to go put a park when it's already all built out. But would there be a nexus um, to this $212 million that we have coming in for disaster mitigation um, to potentially, because I am sure in some of those legacy neighborhoods, our drainage is not quite right. So if we, and now this sounds harsh, but if we want open space, we've got some tough choices here where we could potentially buy a few homes and have a, uh, expanded uh, water retention <coughs> ponds. But we also have problems with public works. I'm glad Joe's sitting here. I mean, I can't even get a picnic table and a tree in a retention pond. And I'm willing to give them more money for put a second man on the team to, to mow and weed whack if that's what the issue is. But when you keep asking my lower income areas to sign a contract for these things, they can't. They don't have HOAs. And they're being left behind. They just want some. So some of these spaces in Pine Hills that could be redone would be, be these stormwater ponds. So maybe you could talk to, I don't know how much you're familiar with it, it's Mitchell Glasser's shop to deal with it, but did you see anything within this when we get into the detail that we could address that lack of, of pocket parks and open space for that existing uh, residential suburban mix? Yeah, Commissioner, um I um, cannot emphasize enough how Vision 2050 in these infill areas as well as uh, other undeveloped areas, context, very context assertive and very context sensitive, in a very context sensitive way, address the need and the requirement post Vision 2050 transmittal of open space. Um, the, when, you, when you read uh, each one of these specific uh, cut sheets that describe the intent of of the place types or the future land uses. You're going to see at the bottom of that particular um, cut sheets the, the civic space requirement. So just, you know, and, and it, is, it addresses a specific percentage of a, a civic space, which is common space, a discernible center. Every time that we talk about complete communities, a complete um, infill, it, it, it requires now via the comprehensive plan and Orange Code a specific introduction of a qualifying open space. No more um, back of house residual open space that they can count as part of an application. It would have to meet a specific type of open space that is open to the public and it's civic in nature. Um, the, the, the com and, and the comment regarding funding for those um, particular opportunities within uh, built out neighborhoods and infill, that, that is a a great observation and a great opportunity for us to look at. Maybe Mitchell can, or somebody from housing, Jana, can you can you make reference Alberto, to let, as Alberto, well availability me, or John? Let me attempt to respond. Um, Commissioner, you had made reference. I think you used the number 212, but it's $219 million. Oh, sorry. Of, <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, of uh, CDBG DR disaster recovery That's funding. That's correct. Um, and, and largely that, you know, it's being um, implemented directly to Orange County through the CDBG program. And so it's got all the limitations um, that traditional CDBG would have with respect to not just the eligible scope of infrastructure, but also the communities that they serve. And so those are things that we would have to take a look at first. Um, we are working with HUD to get through a very quick process here um, this month and, and next regarding the initial application. Um, but then we have a series of, we have a little bit of time through, I believe it's January, we've received an extension regarding the actual action plan itself on how that $219 million is going to be allocated. And so that's, we've got to go through uh, a public comment period and, uh, you know, a series of internal conversations with stakeholders about how those funds ultimately will be identified and prioritized towards that eligible list of infrastructure. So we're not there yet. You mentioned, you know, get, of course, getting creative between open space and stormwater. Of, you know, of course, we know, and, you know, we've had some conversations with the board over the last several months as well about our approach to stormwater, master plan updates and studies. Some of that may be eligible, um, but again, it's, it's, um, it, it also has all the same restrictions as CDBG. And so that's the part that's going to be a little trickier where we ultimately look to balance um, how we're addressing the, 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 the long-term eligibility of disaster recovery and, you know, sustainability matters, um, and then g getting creative with open space opportunities and, 
you know, not just having stormwater ponds behind fences and, and everything else. So there, I think there's opportunities. We're just not there yet at this point. No, I, I agree, but certainly we have the income requirements probably in that area, and um, and we certainly had some flooding in the Pine Hills area, so so there may be a nexus to, to that being somewhat helpful. All right, well, thank you. I actually, my, my folks came and were mostly happy, so um, I'm going to vote to transmit today. Thank you. Commissioner Gomez Cadero. I voted you last. And then Commissioner Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mayor. My question is just for clarification, um, Alberto. Uh, did you, you said that in um, Chapter 1, uh, for the um, revisions and so, the student housing density calculation does not require an analysis anymore? That's mm -hmm. what you said? Correct. Because, because it is the, the UCF Regional Center. The UCF uh -huh. Regional Center Future Land Use carries... Uh -huh a very high uh, level of density that in current conditions, Commissioner, um, there is a density calculation for those applications that are uh, bound to be um, student housing because of the surrounding context. Now you have a delineated area that is a, a regional center, so the level of predictability for higher density to take place within that regional center is there. So there is not the need for density calculation anymore. Okay. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you. Commissioner Wilson and then Commissioner Bonilla. Oh, I wasn't last. Okay, so I was thinking that was going to be... Oh, Commissioner be Bonilla just pressed Just chimed in. Okay, I was just going <laughs> to say, um, I, I really want to thank, first of all, everybody in our community that participated in this, and I mean everybody. I feel like I saw everyone I've known in Orange County for the last 30 years at at least one of these meetings. Some of them, to several of them, I was thinking about... Uh, Commissioner Rivas coming about the LPA, like our, my appointee came to all, I think all three of mine um, in D1. But I, even more importantly, for especially the communities in my district that have felt really very nervous because there's been an unpredictability to our, to our development, um, to really address each of those questions one at a time and then back together again in a group got us to a place and now we can see this baked in. And I mean, at 1.45 today, I had one of my residents speaking to you all about some observations and, you know, I immediately heard from them, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. I got heard. We worked it out. I understand this. So I would say that, of course, it's not perfect, but, you know, my analogy to residents throughout this time was that this is, you know, our orange code, we have a comprehensive plan right now that is a patchwork and it's not working for us. It did not, does not include a lot of the things that we know about sustainability and about preservation and about you know, transition, which is why every two weeks we're in like a knockdown drag out fight in here. And so for me, the idea of having something very predictable that when development you know, comes forward and it's something that is not consistent or compatible with our comprehensive plan, that we do have a way to say, look, actually, we've decided on this. Vision 2050 says that this is, and then we can address that applicant. And I think the important part about orange code versus Vision 2050, and I've said this before, I had tried to find analogies where I was like, it's like a blueprint, but really, it's almost like a car. The body of the car is the orange, the, the Vision 2050, right? It looks pretty. We get some pictures. We're getting a vision. We can see in the future what this should look like. Orange code's that engine. We've got to put the engine in, and it will give us the opportunities. And I wish Commissioner Moore was here, because I had this thought about the open space and the use of these open space. Open spaces can be anything from a, a dry pond to a utility easement. It's been very nondescript in the past. But looking forward into Orange Code, there are opportunities for us to actually really describe what that could or should be. And, you know, even though it was something that just now came up, even in my head, I'm thinking we're in the process of updating our tree ordinance. And, and as part of the code, can we look at as the fines and fees that we take that now are just going to IFAS and it sits at a tree giveaway, which doesn't make it back into the impacted community, a way to make sure it goes back into those heat islands, into the open space that's now part of the requirement in Vision 2050. So, you know, Pulling all of those pieces and parts together, it is complex. And I know it's hard for people to conceptualize a Vision 2050 plan in isolation like we've tried to do. But it's only one piece, right? So the blueprint has to go with, or the outside of the car has to go with the engine, which has to go with the wheels, which has to go with the driver, which is us. 
It's a good analogy. What, do you think it's a decent analogy? <laughs> We've had a lot of time together. We've spent a lot of time together. It has been a very intensive, I think, study, and I, I, I couldn't be any more proud of the engagement and grateful. I, I joke about the fact that I want to get a concert T-shirt made for that crew and put their tour dates on the back, and, you know, it's going to be an easier one to get into than any of the concerts that we have in the area. So I, I just think it's really important that right, you know, in this moment, understanding that we're going to continue to face challenges in protecting our rural spaces and we're going to continue to face challenges in development pressure, that we keep in mind all of those transit and transportation needs because now we'll have something more predictable to tell the developer, to tell the agencies that we have to coordinate with this is what our plan looks like. This is what we visualize for this area. So, um, you know, that being said, I would absolutely advocate for Transmittal today. And then we'll, you know, regroup and get back out there to get that code, um, you know, and the machinery working the way it needs to work. All right. Commissioner Bonilla. Thank you. Um, so, I, oh my gosh, I want to say thank you so much, but I'll get there in a second. Um, <laughs> I think it's very important that we understand where we were, to where we are, to where we hopefully can go. Um, so a lot of um, the residents here, they were with me back in 2010, 2013, 2016, all the battles that we had, you know, fighting these, the, the lake picket nor north and south. And so when that had happened, it had so much controversy. Um, I could talk about the late night here in the BCC at 2 in the morning, 10,000 petition signatures across the whole county. So it was only District 5 that was in favor of smart growth at that time. It was the whole county. And so, you know, un unfortunately what happened was that the majority of the board went ahead and approved the GROW. Um, they denied Lake Pickett North. And after that, though, the whole controversy and everything, you know, the mayor was like, we need, you know, she directed staff to do something so that we had more coordination between the community and the developers and the county so that we're not having these late nights at 2 in the morning with this huge, you know, battles between the people and developers in the county. So, you know, moving forward, you know, we had um, the, well, L it did come before LPA. Um, there was some comments there, but it moved forward. It came to us, and there was a lot of concerns with the development in the rural east market. Um, I had a lot of other concerns in other areas, too, and one of them was that we were looking to do more of the grow um, with hamlets and villages and stuff, and, you know, Alberta, I told you. <laughs> it's like when you hear the people, they're going to tell you this is a bad idea. Um, and so I'm really happy that as a board we decided to go back out to the community because, you know, when this first came to the community, we had a pandemic. Um, it was a way of virtual meetings. Um, it, it really wasn't conducive to really good back and forth feedback from the community. Um, and so then we had this, you know, this whole um, process and how we did the town halls, which was very interesting. It was different. Um, so the plan was to go ahead and have everyone get the presentation, then go to these stations. And that was actually going to be it. And I was like, no, no, no. We have to come back to the center, do a summary of what everyone heard you know, from all the stations so that the people could hear each other's comments. I think that's very important. They, they always want to hear each other. Because like I always say, um, more brains is better than one. Like I want to hear what these, when I'm here on the board, I want to hear what you all have to say and all of your ideas because you have good ideas. I mean, I know I'm not the only one with good ideas. You do too, and I want to hear it. <laughs> no, I said you have good ideas. Like I want to hear your ideas too. Yeah, so I said I'm not the only one. <laughs> so, you know, so the, the people, they want to hear each other's ideas too. Um, they want to learn from each other. So it's very important that we had that additional element to those meetings where they came together. And then on top of that, I wanted to ask, you know, I, I would ask everyone who was there, did you have any questions that were not answered? Um, and so they'd only be like one or two, which was great. Um, so that was, I feel, really successful that that really did help get a lot of their questions answered. Um, I'll say my very first meeting, um, I, not to say anything bad about communications, but I did depend on the county to promote <coughs> the town hall. We only had seven people. And oh my gosh, was I freaking out because I was like, how am I supposed to do this? How am I, I already scheduled like 
four town halls, how am I supposed to get the feedback with only like a handful of people showing up, um, which are people who I knew. There was like two people I didn't. And it's like only my friends are going to show up. <laughs> you know? So, you know, finally, um, so I got to, with my staff. We promoted the heck out of it, got flyers sent out, email blasts, everything. The next one, we had 70 people show up. That was just amazing, and you know, I, I really learned a lot from that process, actually, on how to get people to a town hall, because we also had raffle giveaways. <laughs> it sounds like really trying to entice people to come, it, and people were like saying how fun the meetings were, because you know, we, we joked around at the end with the raffles and everything. It was, it was a good time. So we had four town hall meetings like that, um, and that was the end of it. We also had another, um, we had another community meeting, which I had them come out and speak again, and we did the same stations. Um, that was me hijacking the Sustany community meeting. <laughs> and then we had, um, I, I wanted to, t and I, I told staff, I was like, okay, I want all of these comments, and I can't believe they spent the night putting this together for me. Um, they had put together, Actually, no, they put all, right, all these presentations at the Sustany meeting, they, they, put, they spent all night. And then that same night, I had Olin at what I called a workshop. So I asked for them to put together a list of all the comments, and we're going to have a workshop with the people. So everyone who came to the town hall meetings, we invited to the workshop, only the ones who came. So then he had that, and he also asked for a strike through thing, which he brought to, which I have to say I was surprised that they they actually were able to pull it together. So I just want to thank you so much for, for doing all of that. And then I, I was stressing out again because I was like, there's 62 comments. How am I going to get, at that time I had like six people, finally ended up with about 10 or 11 people there. But I was like, how are we going to divide up 62 comments? This is like, this is going to take all night. And we only had two hours <laughs> in the location. So Ola was like, can I help you out? I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> and so he went up. And he's like, I'm going to just summarize all the stuff. So I gave the floor to him, and he went ahead. He summarized all of the, the edits um, from all the feedback that people had put in. And then we had the, the people who were there asking questions just to make sure that everything had been implemented. I believe everything that the community had asked for was implemented, except for one thing, and we'll get to that in a second. So I feel it was so successful. I want to thank staff so much for, like, I, I mean, every night they were working. I mean, I don't know how many hours they put in, but they really including, went above and beyond. Including the individual meetings that they had with all of us every other week. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was just tremendous. You all really came out. You put your time in. You were dedicated. You heard the people. You heard about those Hamlets of Legends, <laughs> like we told you, um, but you heard it and you respected it. You respected the comments of, and feedback from the people. And I have to say that was the most commendable is that you respected what they had to say and you implemented it and you listened. And that really shows the people that, you know, we can work together. We can make this happen, but you have to show up. I can't do it with seven people showing up. It has to be 70 consistently more people showing up. And I think we had a couple of people here comment that they hadn't gotten involved before, but now they were involved and they saw how things worked. And we need to keep doing that. So please, people, keep showing up. Stay on our email list so that you know when these things are happening, because when we call on you, you need to take action. Um, so, let me see. So one of the things that were not included which we have to address is the Lake Pickett study area. And I'll say um, the reason why people are asking for a supermajority is because they saw what happened. One of the questions was at our town halls, which is, it was a really hard time. You guys really have to watch the video if you, if you can. It's all on my Facebook. But they were like, how are we supposed to trust that if this happens, that it's, it's going to stay? How do we know future boards aren't just going to undo everything that we did? And it's, it's reasonable, that concern. So that's why they're asking for a supermajority. But I understand, too, what was said about that. You know, we could do a supermajority, and then the next board with just a majority could undo the supermajority. Is that correct? Yeah, so, I mean, I understand why do it then if it's going to be undoable. But what I will say is that 
we went through this whole process. Um, hopefully, future boards see everything that we did. I feel that this board saw what the previous board had gone through, that there were a couple of people who were not reelected because of decisions that they were making, and this board's making better decisions, learning from their mistakes. So I'm hoping that future boards see all the work that we put into this, and they don't easily go and try to undo what we did. Um, you know, because the one of the things I believe that they're afraid of is that with the comp plan that we have now, the way they were able to do Lake Picket North and Lake Picket South, that whole study area, was through an exception. They wrote in, for the exception of, Lake Picket study area. That's how they got around it. So, but staff had assured me that that's not what can happen here um, with the way it's written. So, I mean, you can address that even more clearly if you can. But um, one of the other things is that we, that was a mistake, the Lake Pickett study area. And one of the things that I, I'm really confused about because we had an application by the GROW with four property owners, I believe it was. And somehow, not only was just the GROW included that study area, Lake Picket North was included, which I saw coming, but there were other properties around the GROW, which were not part of that application, who got pulled into the study area too, which did not make any sense. Um, and some of the reasoning I got was maybe they were just trying to even out the lines. But, I mean, I don't even think with the Lake Picket study area regulations that those properties would even be able to build in the way they're supposed to according to Lake Picket regulations. So it doesn't make any sense that they're included in that study area. Um, so one of the, the motions I hope that you all support, because I did talk to staff about removing um, anything from the Lake Pickett study area that hasn't been approved for any development be removed from this Vision 2050. Um, they did let me know, though, that there is an application in currently for Sustany. So that complicates stuff. So instead of asking for all of that to be taken out now, a compromise would be to ask them, because they need directions from the board to even review it. So asking the, you know, with the, um, the, the motion here, adding with direction to the staff to review prior to any Vision 2050 adoption public hearings, whether to reduce the intended sector and Lake Pickett study area boundary by excluding any properties that have not been transmitted to the state for a future land use map flum amendment. So before we take action, I'm going to have, ask staff to kind of respond to what you just heard. Um, probably a portion of uh, county attorneys in terms of can we do it? And uh, then from the planning staff as well. So. Uh, Mayor, if I, if I could start. Yes. Um, I just want to remind the board and, and Alberto, I may ultimately look to you for some clarification from a policy framework. So. Um, the policies that you see in the um, Vision 2050 draft document largely mirror the adopted policies of this board and the current comprehensive plan for the Lake Pickett overlay. Um, so back in 2015, 2016, Commissioner Benigni, you made reference uh, to those hearings. Uh, the board approved, um, the, again, a, 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 a boundary, an area, and an associated set of policies by which an application and an amendment to the future land use map may be considered. So within the Lake Pickett study area, what you have today um, basically consists of rural lands with ag zoning. And um, the, the, the Lake Pickett study area um, and, and associated policies provide a framework by which an application may be um, considered by the Board of County Commissioners to change the future land use. Um, it is rural. Um, in the current comprehensive plan, uh, but as um, I think there was some, some note of, um, you know, in the, in the conversation, it is identified as an intended growth area, and again, that's consistent with this board's currently adopted policies. Now, again, dating back 2015, 2016, you know, several of you weren't on the board at that time. Um, you know, realizing that those are adopted policies, um, you know, and, and, and a map for that matter, um, there are implications to amending those policies. Or the, and the associated map. Um, landowners have purchased property within the study area, 
and as Commissioner Bonilla made reference, there actually is a pending application that is under staff review. We've had a se for several community meetings. That application is likely going to the local planning agency for consideration in August and ultimately coming to this Board of County Commissioners in either October or November for a, a transmittal public hearing. So, um, Commissioner Benny, I know you made reference to, you know, kind of let that play out first, and then when this comes back for adoption, i.e. Vision 2050, then the board may feel free to reevaluate those policies um, at the time. Um, so, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll look to, to, to Joel in, in a minute, um, but just again, with respect to, one, we have a pending application for property within the Lake Pickett study area, and, um, you know, again, landowners have made purchases of property within that uh, presumption, again, not that they have entitlements, but they have a path to entitlements, that future land use, or at least the framework, said nothing about what type of land use ultimately would be approved or when something might be approved by this board. So, um, it, it, but it did set a process. All right, Joel. Uh, Joel just a, a real quick, quick answer, uh, Mayor. Um, just to add on to what John uh, describe for the board and explain to the board um, it can be done but we don't recommend that it be done in terms of that uh, motion that uh, Commissioner Bonilla ha has has laid out uh, there's there's an application that's that's in midstream that's been filed pursuant to the, uh, the policies that are in effect today so they're basically following the rules that um, that transmittal hearing as John indicated is probably going to be held later this year and and I think we need to keep uh, keep that separate from from what we're doing here tonight in terms of deciding whether to transmit or not transmit Vision 2050. Okay, so uh, given that we do have recommended action, okay, I'm going to well, make a motion to approve the requested action as it is presented. Is there a second? I will second, but I just want to. Um, do that separately then? Um, I just, I, we're following yeah, I just want to come here. back okay. to is, this. Is there a question. second? I seconded it already. Okay. All right. We have a motion for the requested action and a second. Further question or comment uh, because we still have another item <laughs> that we have to take up to this evening as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I want to move us along. We're kind of getting caught up here. Uh, so, so further yes so further comment commissioner bonilla and then i'm going to go to commissioner wilson and then we're going to call the question okay so we do have the application in but if that application is denied then i would like the board to review taking those place you know, those um changing the boundary to only what's been entitled there's a process. We do have a process. But the that. staff kept telling me that they needed board so. direction. So I don't know. I guess I don't understand what that means then at this point. It, Commissioner Benia, it sounds like what, what you are asking is to propose an amendment to the, to the motion no. that's on the screen here that basically would provide... Uh, or basically have an amendment to the motion that's before the board now that would say that um, when we have our adoption hearing on Vision 2050, that we at that point in time, the staff will come forward with a recommendation on whether to redraw the, the boundary and shrink the boundary for the Lake Pickett study area. Well, so that's what I recommended before. This was what you wrote, and but well, then you said that we shouldn't do it. Well, Commissioner Bonilla, what you had asked for was a, a proposed motion, okay, relating to the Lake Pickett study area, which would couple that in with what's in, uh, on the screen here. So we prepared a motion for you, which you've read into the record, but that should not be confused with that we support that motion, that, 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 you're, that you're suggesting that we add in to what's on the screen here something to the effect that the staff will be directed to review prior to the adoption hearing on Vision 2050 whether to shrink the size of the lake study, lake, I'm sorry, the Lake Pickett study area. So okay. we're not, we just, we're, we're in support of the requested action on the screen, and I think John can, can vouch for that, 
and, and, and Alberto as well. So we're not in favor of what you're proposing. What we're saying is the board can do it, but we're not in favor of that because, again, okay. we have an application in midstream that, that, oh. that complies with all the policies mm -hmm. that are in effect today, and I think we need to keep those two segregate, uh, segregated. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we we're on the same separate. page. Yeah, we're on we're, the same page. We have a motion. We have a second. Yeah, that's... I'm yeah. going to call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. no. Okay. The motion passes uh, and now, six to one. Thank okay. you. And now they right. need direction on reviewing later on before the adoption if that's denied. Okay. I, think that's, I think that's understood. Oh, that is that understood? Before adoption, yes. Done? That we'll, if there are any modifications that need to be made, made at, at adoption, then we'll work with staff. We'll work with staff to make sure that we're all prepared. Okay. So, uh, I, Mayor, if I may, I just want to have clarification. So, um, I think, John, so that I'm clear, um, based on what Mayor has shared, what the commissioners have shared, we are moving forward with the transmittal. But aside from that, you and your team with Alberto and whoever, county attorney's office, you guys are going to make diligent and reasonable efforts to be able to address the concerns uh, brought up by Commissioner Uribe and Uribe and Commissioner Bernilla at a later date. Am I correct? She, or? she says it's you, Rebe. <laughs> it's not you, Rebe. Rebe. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, okay, all right. So, uh, <laughs> John, quickly respond to that so we can move to the next. Uh, all right. I don't want us to be here for another hour debating that. Uh, Commissioner Scott, um, you know, we've, we've, uh, we're certainly we're committing to continue to work with Commissioner Uribe, Commissioner Bonilla, and, and all of you with respect to um, the plan and uh, ultimately Orange Code that comes back before the board and any amendments that may be requested at an adoption hearing. Understood. Thank you. I think Wilson's right. been waiting patiently. All right. That's so hard for me. <laughs> Commissioner Wilson. Thank you so much, Mayor. Actually, um, so I, I just wanted to make sure because I think that board direction piece, there's been a lot needs to be clarified for the public record, for the public, that despite, you know, we, we transmittal is happening, right? So we're moving, we're moving that forward. But in addition to that, we're looking for some additional information about the study area. I actually believed that that Lake Pickett study area was like Horizon West, that there was future underlying land use already in place. You're saying they don't have entitlements. There's no future underlying land use map that requires us to look at it in that same way, but we can't address it yet because of an application in progress. In, in, in terms of addressing it today, um, again, I think it's the advice of staff not to mix the two issues. Okay. Um, you know, and, and, and Alberto, I mean, or Olin, if you want to clarify anything um, regarding, um, you know, the entitlement question and, and stuff. I, I think I d described it accurately previously. Okay. So it is not like Horizon West from that perspective, that Commissioner. Is, that is, your statement is correct, Commissioner. Okay. okay. As, as no, I think, that, and that's really helpful because I do think it gives, I think the board now is showing direction and trying to find a way to make sure that we do figure this out for the residents who okay. may not. You know, right. We don't want to be I back here. Okay, wait. So the second part, wait, I don't really want quick. To go back over no, something. No, I know, no, no. I just think we're we're getting board direction, right? So everyone's got that clear. The board direction is to look into the potential for that before adoption. The second part of this question is because I think this is going to be really important for the Charter Review Committee because I believe they're watching closely about the supermajority question. I know it has been utilized in other municipalities, and and you know there is definitely other places where they're using that. I understand, based on this conversation and how sensitive these decisions are, we've put in all this work. I agree that it should be more than, you know, just a whim to be able to come and amend, right? So is there board consensus for, for us to study the possibility of updating our procedure for a supermajority when it comes to amending Vision 2050 in the future, or should that happen? I think that should be done with the charter. Uh, yeah, I, right, because okay. that, <laughs> yeah. But, well, we I don't, just got bound I don't hear consensus, board. but let <laughs> the understand. charter process work, it, work itself out. Okay. Uh, right. With that, uh, we're going to move forward uh, then to the next and the final item on the agenda for today. Uh, you all are certainly welcome to stay uh, if you so choose to. The, and we move this item from this morning's uh, agenda. 
We ask that if you are leaving, quietly do so. All right, uh, the final item is regarding the commissioners and uh, mayor market compensation analysis. Some work that has been done by our, our HR team and uh, Lisa Sneed is going to come forward and lead us off in a presentation. I believe all of you uh, received uh, copies of the presentation in advance. Uh, and this is just kind of, I think, follow up and close out on a prior conversation uh, that uh, the board undertook. Uh, it's a pursuant to, yeah, there needs to be a decision to go one way or the other. Uh, so. Yes. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Yes, the only change to the presentation is the date that, that um, if a, an action is taken, that it would be effective. Um, and then also I listed action steps at the end of the presentation in the updated presentation. So thank you. Um, and let me get to my presentation. Um, so we're here tonight to discuss with you um, the, the method by which your salaries are set. Um, this hasn't been looked at, or the ordinance has not been changed for 25 years. Um, and so this is a follow-up discussion to last summer's budget work session, so summer of 2022, um, when staff um, was asked to kind of conduct an analysis to look at the market um, study of the commissioner and mayor's pay structure. So ordinance number 9640 adopted on December 17th of 96 provided the st salary and formulas for increases in an annual basis for commissioners and mayor salary. Um, this slide is market data and just I want to draw, I know there's a lot of numbers here, but I want to draw your attention to um, the first column, which is these are the 15 largest, most populous counties in Florida listed in rank order from high to low. Um, and you can see that Orange County, in terms of population, is the fifth largest county. However, if you look at the, the wages of the commissioners, um, we are at the bottom of that. Um, Orange County is also one of three counties out of 67 counties that has a strong mayor form of government. Um, so on those three counties, which are Miami-Dade, Orange, and Duval, I've listed the commissioner's salaries and the mayor's salary. You'll also see that the number of commissioners in the various counties varies. So for example, Miami-Dade has 13 commissioners. Um, Duval County, which doesn't have cities, has just you know city, county, all wrapped in one, has 19 commissioners. So sometimes it's kind of hard to do an apples to apples comparison, but we've done our best here to demonstrate based on population size, kind of what the, the, the wages look like in the most 15 most populous. All right. Um, so the following chart um, gives us some options that we were presenting for how the salaries could potentially be, could potentially be better aligned to the market. And I'm sorry, I failed to mention something on the previous slide, so I'm going to go back if I can get there. Um, so the median of all of those salaries would be 102, 900. And now moving forward, um, so we've come up with three kind of alignment options. One would be to adjust the salaries to those at the same level of the non-bargaining employees. And as you know, um, they were given up to a 7% increase mid-year this year. Another option is to adjust the salaries to the state formula. And then the third option is to adjust to match the market median salary. So this chart here shows basically what it would look like if we were to adjust the salaries to the, to up to the 7% that the non-bargaining employees got. So you can see that the current commissioner salary is 91,158, and that would be adjusted up to 97,539. And then applying that same percentage increase to the mayor's salary would take the mayor from 182,860 to 195,660. The following chart shows what it would look like if we applied the state formula. And the state formula is based on population and two other components. The other components are an annual factor and a con cumulative annual factor. Um, this, the, the practice of determining the compensation for constitutional officers 
was in the Constitution, and it dates back to 1885. Um, it was maintained since 1968. And in 73, the legislature set a formula to determine those rates. So looking at this for um, the current salary of what our county commissioners are, based on state formula, that 91,158 is back at 2007 level. So to increase it to the current state formula level is 113,608. Um, which equates to, if you did an average of the number of years over the past 16 years to bring it up to current times, it would be approximately a 1.5% annual increase. And then applying that same um, rationale to the mayor's salary would go from 182,860 to 227,812. And the, the next slide is um, mapping it to the market median. So again, looking at the commissioner's salaries, um, you get the 102,900, which is the number that I pointed out on the slide where we had 15 comparable cities, counties, I'm sorry. Um, and then applying that same escalation factor to the mayor's salary would, would bring him up to 206,412. Um, the next slide is basically a, a cost recap of what this would, the impact would be on the county. So you've got on the left option one, two, and three. And the total cost impact is over to the far right. So 51,000 for option one, 179 for option two, and $94,004 for option three. So once we make a decision on how we align the current salaries, we need to look at how we align salaries in the future. So below are options for annual salary increase methodology. And they're pretty much um, the same as what we kind of went through with the first one being, which we didn't mention, we could just leave it as is, and which would be to, to go with the lower of the consumer price index or the non-bargaining employees. But as, as we can see from a market perspective, this has kind of put us behind. Um, the second option would be to revise the ordinance to align it to the consumer price index. The third option, revise it to align us with the non-bargaining employee increases. And the fourth option would be revise it to align it with the state formula based on population. So with that, um, this is just a real quick timeline. And I'm sorry this has changed a little bit over the past few days as I've been working on this. But what we would need to do is um, get, and I've got actions on my next slide, but we need to get um, a motion for how to align the current salary, how to select future increases, and then we're going to come back for a public hearing, um, if you desire, on the 12th of September. And once that is approved um, and advertised, we would, um, it would become effective in the first pay period in September, September 17th of 2023. Whoops, so sorry, I'm kind of rushing through. Did I skip a slide? This. Yes, yes, sorry. All right, so the next steps are this, that we need first to select an immediate market adjustment option. So that would either be option one, non-bargaining, option two, state formula, or option three, or ABC, median um, amount of the top 15 most populous counties. Or, and then we need to select a method for future annual increases, which again are the four options that I just spoke of. So with that, I will entertain any questions. There are questions, uh, Commissioner Moore. Um, I, I'm just a little confused because I know when I was on the school board, we didn't compare ourselves to some of those smaller counties. We always just compared ourselves um, to the, the population. So it would have been a you know a Miami Day to a, a Broward to a Palm Beach to Hillsborough and and of course Duval. We didn't even Duval because it, it, it wasn't tied up in in that county city. Uh, conundrum that they have so I appreciate that you gave us um, all of these options um, I'm just used to I'm, I'm used to you know on school board we followed the state guidelines and we um, had an option if people didn't want to take it at the beginning of the year you could sign and give the money back as many did during those downturns and and so we just followed the state guidelines and it sort of took the politics out of everything so thank you for doing such a thorough uh, a, a thorough look at this. I didn't really have any idea how much it, it was held back by that, whichever is lower clause. And so thank you for your work on this. You're welcome. Commissioner Uribe. Um, Lisa, thank you for all your due diligence. I actually was following up because Osceola County was not included in that. 
And that, and yeah, and that was because this is based on the 2020 census, and they just fell right below the 15 mark. Because um, they're at the state formula level. Okay. Yeah, because I, I mean, I asked one of their commissioners. You know. Yeah, they're at the, right, but they're I at think, the state level. I, I think they are, but I think their level, when I looked at it, I don't have it right in front of me, but it was actually, and I'll double check it, but I think it was lower than than the, the, the one right above it. I'll double check that, though. Yeah, because we were just all at FAC, and the commissioner was explaining that they, that they were. So okay. just okay. Point, of, point, of, point of change there. Osceola makes 98000 for a commissioner by the That's state. They don't know what they mean. <laughs> All right, uh, Com Com Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Lisa, for your work. Um, I, I was confused with the, the state formula because I've, I've read the charts. Um, you said that the state formula, the, the, the future increases are, are 1% or? No, no, I was, just, I was just simply doing the math. Right now, based on state formula, if you went back and looked at where Orange County would be based on state formula, it would be back. The 91,000 that the commissioners currently make would be back at the 2007 levels. So I was just simply saying, really, when you take the, the increase over from 2007 to bring it up to state formula level of 2023, if you divide that by the 16 years in between, it's an average 1.5%. But no. For the purposes of projecting state formula at this point for next year, it, those numbers come out in late September. Right now, for the purposes of our projections, we would project a 5% increase over whatever the current state formula is. So 113 right now is the current state, and then we would project a 5% increase, and then that would be trued up after the actual numbers come out in September. And, and then with the state formula, um, if I remember correctly, I don't have it here, but it's like it's it signs counties to population categories, right? So each county falls in with a specific number, and based on that, you're in category, I think category one, two, three, four, five, or something like that, and Correct. then they assign a, a, a salary to the category, yes, more so than the population, right? Well, it's got the it has the three factors. It's got the the population, and then it's got the annual. Sorry, I'm trying to find my notes here. But it's got the annual alignment factor and the cumulative annual factor. So there's kind of three components that go into it. Okay. Thank you for answering my question. I appreciate it. I'm good, Mayor. And uh, Lisa, do you know, uh, in terms of the Orange County constitutionals, uh, are they all following the, the state uh, formula? Um, I believe that yes, they are. Yes, they okay. are following state formula. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> okay. All right. So I think that's good to know that, uh, you. you know, the constitutionals are all following the state formula. Okay. All right. Uh, Commissioner Bonilla, did you have your question answered? Yes. Um, when looking at these numbers, I mean, the option for the, the state formulas, um, for Orange County, I went across, it's 113,608, which you had there. Um, I'm just curious of why, for the mayor's salary, the Constitution officer's amount wasn't used. If they're at 193419 That's not all of them. The sheriff is at 229 <laughs> Yeah, the, no, the sheriff's at 229 uh, but as you've said many times, the sheriff gets shot at. Uh, well, so, the reason, I mean, he, the reason uh, why that he's putting his life uh, you know, not, a little bit on the line, so I mean, that. he should get a little bit more compensation. I, you for never that. heard me say the sheriff gets shot at. Uh, well, you you say at no, least now you're not, not getting true. shot at, or you something. I have been in something shootings. like that. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason that we went with the way we did with this is because our our county has a strong mayor form of government, which means that our mayor is the CEO. He's one of the only three CEOs in the state of Florida out of 67 counties, so he bears more responsibility than than an average commissioner might bear in that regard because he's elected you know, for the entire county, and again, is the CEO. And so if, in, in accordance kind of with how historically the ordinance has been written, that's why we projected it based on this methodology. Okay, so, you know, I, well, our priority is to the residents, you know, and our office budgets directly benefit the residents of Orange County. 
I was denied $33,000 from my office budget. That was based on looking at the dollar amount rather than percentages. Um, and now we're looking at raising our, our salaries, which doesn't benefit our residents, it benefits ourselves. Is this money going to come out of the reserves? The money, the money basically is not going to impact our reserve levels. I mean, the percentage of money that this impacts the budget is very insignificant in the grand scheme of a $6.8 billion budget. Oh, wow. So I guess when it comes to an office budget, that was, which benefits directly the community. Commissioner, let it's it go. <laughs> That's big, not it, a you know, good coming argument. out of the <laughs> reserves is a big impact, but no, the it salary is. It, it is. We, the, the budget that was presented during the budget work session was set. It was a balanced budget. The point was any adjustments to that budget, we, the only place we can go is from the reserve number that was so presented. So where is this coming so from? So we have two positions. In this case, the first step, based upon the, com the conversations with the commissioners about can we do something when this conversation started, is to do something this fiscal year. So as we look at dollars remaining, for this, if the board so chooses to do make some adjustments mm -hmm. in accordance with what's being presented, the, the intent would be to do something this fiscal year. Now, just because of the public hearing time frame. But that's what I asked too. Just because of the public hearing time frame, by the time you get through this, because if the board decides to do something, it has to go to public hearing. The public hearing is on September 12th. You will actually have one pay period that would affect this budget year. So the first part would be for this budget year. The second part, you are correct. Yes, you are correct. We would have to make an adjustment between now well, between the budget that was approved on the budget work session, the tentative budget, we would make that adjustment when we come back in September. Whatever the board approves here, we would make that adjustment. And the only place it could come, it would be a slight adjustment. I think what Lisa was saying is it would be a, it, well, it would be an adjustment. I guess you was saying it wouldn't be a monumental, depending upon what option you choose. But yes, it would need to come from what we would, um, what is, what is the reserve? It would come from the reserve. I just flat out, yes, you are correct. It would come from the reserve. Yeah, but I was asking for the same thing. I was asking for an amendment for this year's budget so that, because you were showing like a 10% increase in the next year because you didn't adjust this year's budget for my office yeah, budget. Yeah, but that was a different conversation. That conversation ended with no support to make that adjustment. This was simply saying if you want to make this adjustment in this fiscal year, if you go with one of those adjustments under option A, under the time frame, you could be in a position to have that increase go into effect by the last pay period in this fiscal year. I mean, I'll say actively engaging with the community, attending events, fostering economic development, promoting crime reduction. Yes, we're not the sheriff's office, but we're still asked to do that. Um, handle communications, and we don't have a whole communications office to do that with. We just have us and our own staff. Event planning and ensure the availability of social support resources, we manage office staff, address public records requests, submit financial and ethics reports, advocate for the residents at both state and federal levels. Further, we consistently hold town halls and listening sessions, and raise funds to provide essential services given the limited nature of our office budgets without discretionary funds. We manage land use cases, mediate between staff and constituent issues, and engage in extensive research on legislative matters. It's up to you all. I mean, just saying, we, we definitely mean, we aren't, aren't do really a necessary. lot. <laughs> and we don't have a whole county of office staff to help us do that. Um, we just have three people. Um, so and it's, is you know, this, this about is, the salary conversation? Okay, we, yeah. we, we passed that issue. The issue that is agenda today all right. is regarding I mean, this the salary. Is my time it's to not talk, about, it's but not you about the office. Talk. You don't want me to add my comments in? I'm being uh, the, shut up. Could, I mean, Commissioner, being told to just the agenda item speak. is okay. about the salaries. That's the, that's the this conversation. It's not about office budgets at this point. Hey, when that's I was asking for 33000 to serve my community, Listen, I was told no. Commissioner, you didn't As, get any support for, for that. the same process here. You didn't get any support for that, Commissioner. Yeah, but now we're, <laughs> this, asked, but now stay, we're being asked stay, to raise our stay, salaries stay to benefit focused. our own pockets. Well, this was a request from the commissioners. This staff was responding to the request from the commissioner, Commissioner Benilla. And I believe you were the one yeah, that actually presented this and brought it up. Yeah, so, but then I saw how, I mean, how selfish this is when we couldn't even get money for a third person to be, 
you know, because everyone else got the full funding for third person. I didn't. And, you know, it's just, it's really okay. not fair. All right. To, to, uh, it's not fair. Commissioner Scott, did you have another question? I, I did have a question. This is for the county attorney, um, uh, either one of you all. It's not terribly difficult. So uh, what we have proposed for us is, uh, you know, uh, two options, as I understand it, from Ms. Sneed. The first option is what we do for the immediate market adjustment. The second is for the future increases. My question to you is, do we have to consider these for whatever motion that gets put on the floor? Does it have to be done? Can we present two? Can we do it in one vote, or do we have to do two separate votes? The point of this is there, there are actually two separate issues. Your ordinance now, your current ordinance, says that um, the board only gets the lesser of the CPI or what non bargain employees get. That's still an order. If you don't change that, if you don't make a decision, that's part two. If you don't make a decision, it stays that way. So, yes, you do need to make a decision. Two separate. Yeah, on that second portion, too. The first is simply what do you want to do now about your salary? And then the second is going forward, uh, how do you want to go prospectively? Uh, but that has, when the ordinance comes back, that is a separate part of the, the ordinance. That's why it's separated in that manner. Mayor, I'd like to enter a motion to, for the immediate market adjustment for option two to align our salaries with the state formula. Okay, we, we want to pay attention to <laughs> <laughs> So I was asking for clarification. Motion, his his so, motion is for option two to align with the state formula, which uh, right now would be consistent with the constitutionals. That's his motion. Okay. And he's, uh, okay. So we have a motion and a second. Um, Second was by who? The second is by Commissioner Moore, and uh, Commissioner Wilson was kind of like in the amen corner. All right. Uh, so there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Okay. I'm going to vote no. All right, the motion passes five to two. The next uh, issue is going right. forward prospectively. Uh, uh, there's four options on the table. So it's option one, uh, to stick with the way that you currently do, which is the lower <laughs> of non-bargaining raises or CPI, um, or adjust it to the CPI or adjust it to the level of the non-bargaining, or adjust it to the state formula. Right, is there a motion? My, I enter a motion to align our salaries to, our, our future salaries to what uh, non-bargaining county employees get. Okay, is there a second? All right, second. Okay, there's a second, Commissioner Moore. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. All right. A motion passes. Uh, I'm going to vote no on it. Also, five to two. And I think, in terms of today's agenda, we've had a full agenda today uh, with a lot of items before us. If there's nothing else uh, before this body today, Mayor, we just want to remind the commissioners that this will come back. The ordinance uh, will come back on September 12th for a public hearing. All right. All right. All, all right. If nothing else, we stand adjourned.